Hi everyone, and welcome to the 5th Anger Games. Uh, this is a player run tournament brought to you by Sof and Dirk with the assistance of CCP. I am your host, Zurok, commonly called Zoo, and for the next three weekends, we're going to have the privilege of watching teams duke it out in the arena. I'm starting off with me today here in the studio uh, is the illustrious Ithaca Hawk and Batikos Radikos the Dadikos. <laughs> so, <laughs> while we're warming up for the action ahead, uh, feel free to make use of the chatbots that we have. We will be running predictions throughout the day for the teams to get those channel points going. Um, you are also able to use the commands exclamation uh, mark point uh, rules and exclamation point brackets to get yourself a copy of what's going to be happening throughout the day and to see what rules these players are using. Uh, the brackets do also have the times on them, so uh, use that to plan out your day to see your most favorite team. Uh, I'd also like to remind everyone that this tournament is being run on Thunderdome servers, so please bear with us should any uh, we should we experience any difficulties or delays. And then again, thank you for the great people at CCP, such as CCP Zealous, for assisting us with this tournament. So to jump into things, Radicos, you're actually taking part in the tournament yourself currently, right? That is correct. So how did your team and how would other teams actually have secured a spot in this tournament that we're having now? Um, you would have gotten in the AG5 Discord and you would have uh, read the pings in the announcements and you uh, just get signed up that way, get your team formed, get into with Soth and uh, all those and Dirk, and uh, that's how you get going. But uh, I think last week, or no, sorry, about a month ago, we had the feeders. Did your team have to go through that? Uh, no, we did not. Uh, we decided, uh, that's a good point, uh, Zoo. Uh, we decided to uh, pay the entrance fee and skip the feeders um, because we have practice to do other than uh, having to go through a bunch of other teams that are going to be uh, throwing who knows what out there. So... So now that was, uh, it wasn't actually a bidding process, right? It was just a flat entry fee, but a first come, first serve. Um, yeah, you had to be in the Discord at a certain time with the entry fee and like post. And this year it was filled up. Like I was right there, right when it opened and went to hit enter. And it was like the number sixth one. And uh, it filled up within a couple minutes, right? Wasn't it a couple minutes? If I, call? I, I think so. Pretty, pretty soon. I think Gen 10 also. It was like, amazing. It was awesome. Yeah, I, I thought minutes. that was great to see uh, in the Eve, uh, Eve competitive uh, scene that we have here. So. Yeah, that was the return of AT. And speaking of AT as well, Ithaca. Um, so with the feeders as well, last year was with the AT Wills had a feed around, so we see that being more predominant here now. Um, but how is the Anger Games different to the Alliance tournament? Uh, so how is it different from the Alliance tournament? There's a couple of things that are different. First off, as you've mentioned, this is taking place on Thunderdome. So all the pilots have maximum skills uh, and the ships don't count. They are made up. Um, so basically everyone's on equal footing no one has any better skills than anybody else and you don't have to worry about uh, the cost of losing ships so it's great uh, for people who have maybe not done tournaments before to get some experience like dip your toes in uh, but there are a couple of other uh, rules which sort of differentiate the Anger 5 games from the Alliance tournament first and foremost uh, it's only 7 on 7 uh, so we take 3 of the pilots toss them in the bin uh, Radikos then scoops them up, puts them in his team um, but the rest of the teams have that 7 on 7 format which is actually quite different uh for example if you maybe have one battleship instead of two battleships in the alliance tournament format that could be the main line like main pinch uh sort of important ship in your comp and losing that is one seventh of your comp to one tenth of your comp there's also a couple of other interesting rules that the guys have added in this year for example if you take uh, the same ship multiple times the point cost actually increases for each additional one so if a ship costs 20 points and you bring two of them well they're not 20 points it's 20 and 21 points so you have to think hey do we actually want to bring three healers is it worth it uh, spoiler probably yes um but it's a couple of little things it really changes up the the theory crafting and the comp building compared to alliance tournament in some ways it makes it a bit more forgiving but in some ways it makes it more uh, important to fly your ship well because you are just one of seven rather than one of ten all right, thank you very much. That's a wonderful explanation you get there. Um, and Radikos, being as a pilot who's actually uh, familiar with the, twin, uh, the arena itself, um, what do teams actually go through? So let's say, how do teams choose where they end up in the arena and what do teams see in this arena? What is actually present inside this little bubble? Well, you, uh, each team gets bookmarks, a uh, set of bookmarks, and it brings them to an arena. Um, and they... Uh 
Warp to the Arena at range, um, and there'll be NJD units um, all around the arena that uh, players can use to... So, uh, uh, do the teams just randomly appear at a certain location, or...? So, what you're doing is you're sitting in uh, Thunderdome, and uh, you get teleported from uh, a station um, out to the uh, system that you'll be fighting in. And then um, you wait and for CCP to give you the, or the referees to get you uh, ready, unlocked and ready to go uh, warp to your ranges. And you know, those ranges are predefined. And, uh, you know, you better not mess it up or uh, you might be starting at zero when you don't want to start at zero. So, so what ranges do the teams have open to them then? Um, from uh, center, which is zero to 50. So 50. teams can be right. 100, 100 kilometers away from each other. Um, Possibly. And I believe uh, also before it teleports, the captains are able to choose between four options, um, vaguely named A, B, C, D. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, but uh, that's the only uh, choice they really have of where they end up. And then you see where your opponent is across from you in the arena. Um, hopefully we'll be getting into the matches soon in the next five-ish minutes. But uh, Ithaca, you actually were speaking about the Gila just now. But going over the bands that we see actually for the first match was going to be Templus Kalsif. Versus job code mining division, we're not seeing any Gila ban right now. What do you think about that, Ithaca? So the fact that we've not seen um, any Gila bans thus far in this first match is really exciting because in the feeders and in the open practices, the Gila was pretty much pick or ban. You either banned it because you didn't want to face it or you didn't ban it because that meant you were picking it. So if you've left it open, either you think that um, you can bring it and beat their Gila comp or you have a counter to a Gila comp. Templus, of course, very experienced tournament team. Uh, they've been um, in Alliance tournament for a couple of years. They've done really well, getting very high into it, famously knocking Hydra out one year, uh, or rather knocking them into the loser's bracket early on, which was a big upset at the time. Uh, they've since shown that they are one of the best teams in, in the game, uh, winning the Alliance Open. So I'm very excited to see if they've actually come up with a counter, which has been kind of maybe hidden away uh, until we're here in the actual tournament itself, uh, instead of just the, the feeders. But the Gila is incredibly powerful in this format. Um, and as I mentioned, pick or ban. And since it's open, you would maybe expect both teams to bring it. So if we don't see any Gilas here, then I'm very excited. Uh, I have also, especially uh, you mentioned Tempest Kelsev doing one of the really, over the last few years, really dominating and consistently at that. Not just getting another fluke run or something. They've been consistently showing their dominance. So I'd be excited also to see what they're going to be showing up in this matchup. But with that being said, the teams actually are taking the arena right now. So we will be handing it over to our first commentator pair for the evening, which will be Dujek and Fear, and we'll be handing it over to them now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first match of the Anger Games 5 proper. My name is Fear, joined by Dujek. And we have Templus Kalsif on the red side with Jovko Mining Division on the blue side. Templus Kalsif bringing Oniros, Harbinger Navy, Harbinger, Brudex, ANI, ONI, and Heretic. I'm pretty excited about this matchup, not only because I have enjoyed Flying Widows so far this uh, tournament practice season, but we did some practice. Uh, casting before today and we casted the exact team of Javco with the Widow, Aneros, Double Bed Mac, Og Navy, Draugr, and Kitsune. And the match has started. Dive coming in, believe, from, yes, the Draugr of Blue Dagger. He's trying to dive, but the Kitsune is already dead. Just not getting enough speed off the start, getting sniped by these Harb Navies and the Brudex. Yeah, medium long-range weapons with extremely good tracking are a great way to win the low-end battle. As they go on to the Draugr of Blue Dagger, who is in half armor and falling. Yeah, no way out. The Aeneros just nowhere near them. They're not getting the jams off this Widow as much as they want to. I'd have to imagine they just don't have the right colors loaded or something like that. They're getting a little bit of a rep in this Aeneros, but Blue Dagger should go down. You'd have to assume that um, there is some ECCM and some um, electronic hardening links going up on the other team. The Widow is not managing to jam out the damage, which is integral to save his less tanked teammates. 
Well, the Draugr lives, though, very low uh, structure, only about 6%, as some of those gems did, in fact, come off, and he's able to hard through the Oniris reps. Meanwhile, uh, Stellance and the Heretic getting damage from these Vedmax, but uh, unfortunately hasn't been able to spool up on that quite yet. And uh, he is staying alive for the time being for Templus Kalsav. Meanwhile, first recon, without the Kitsune to help jam out, all the DPS from Templus is going on to him now. And he's only got an Eros rep, so gonna try to trade back on one of these Omen navies, but I don't know if it's gonna be enough. Now that he's going into Hull, this is starting to look very shaky, and I can't imagine... There the window oh. goes down. Yeah, just not enough reps on the table. Going for the Aeneros instead of what we've seen a lot of in those Triglavian reps. And now the Draugr is free to fall. This might be 100 to 0 for Templus. As one of the absolute favorites of this tournament is not an upset as such, but we have not seen a lot of um, battle cruiser focused uh, comps so far in. Uh, in the opens and in the feeders. So it's uh, interesting to see uh, medium guns doing this kind of damage. Yeah, harkens back to some old BC core days. I mean, it might just be Templus trying to hide what they actually are thinking about going with, thinking, okay, we beat you on skill alone. We're going to take one of our less common comps as the Aeneros goes down and uh, just beat you on raw pilot skill alone. Uh, the Widow comp is something that we've discussed as tournament captains ourselves, something that you typically take if you think you're going to get outmatched and you just want to believe in the jams, maybe getting you an edge in these types of matchups. It's definitely hard to see the edge going against the good teams with ECM. ECM has been almost ubiquitous. This is like the 10th time we've seen a Widow comp, and they have lost, but they have won a lot too. So no self-respecting team is going to not ban the Widow and then not come prepared to face a Widow. Like, it's a definite possibility, and Templus Calcif was not surprised when they saw Widow on field, despite some ECM bans in this match. Uh, no, they weren't. Probably brought those ECCM scripts, as you were mentioning before, uh, alongside some of those electronic hardening links. They're onto Lucas now, and there's just not enough DPS on the field from Jovko, so this will be 100 to 0 for Templus Calcif. Not unexpected, considering Templus Calcif are AT winners. Uh, or Alliance Open winners, I should say. That was not an AT. But still, a uh, very strong team, one of the favorites going into this tournament, and they're showing why uh, they're favorites going into the tournament. It's very hard to, to tech against something that is middle of the line. Their comp is not slow, nor particularly fast, but they can track well enough to kill small things and do enough damage as we saw to kill big things like the widow that they just blew off the field after they tracked the kitsune if your team can kill a kitsune and a widow with almost equal ease you're gonna be comfortable facing almost anything and with that 100-0 victory for Templus Calcif, once again, not unexpected considering they're one of the tournament favorites, but still, uh, always a pleasure to watch a great team in action. We're going to throw it back to the desk, and then they're going to take us through that match and bring us into the next one. And we're back. Tempus showing a really strong uh, performance there in that match. Um, Radikos, any uh, opening remarks before we get into the meaty details? Uh, you're, you're muted, Radikos. <laughs> all right. Sorry uh, about that. In the very beginning right. of that match, so th when you take a Kitsune down that quick, uh, uh, you know, and then be able to put pressure on a Draugr and uh, almost kill it, um, it did survive, but it is you, you can't come back from that when your jams aren't landing um especially against templus um who executed very well in that match right away they you know they got they all got moving they all got their drones out uh right onto you know their rep bots right onto uh whatever was taking dps primary and um really just uh just out executed uh jovko um who did the best they could but uh it is templus calcif 
as you mentioned. Yeah, that's probably also why we saw that Widow also being able to take a pounding, because normally with the ECM mechanic, especially when you have two ships, they're able to almost um, work together to kind of limit who's being able to shot, because while you're right, jamming right. someone, you are still able to be shot by them, but then you kind of juggle them back and forth. But with the Widow being the only ECM on field, it meant it was the sitting uh, target there pretty much for everyone else. Um, yeah, Ithaca, I'm going to ask you now about the Gillas. Do you think the comp that Templars brought would have been able to deal with the Gillas with that massive beam span they had? Yeah, I think so. I think Templars are a good enough team that um, they wouldn't leave a ship like the Gila unbanned in this format if they weren't confident that that setup that they just brought could deal with it. Um, I would also probably expect that uh, Jovko may be expected to face Gilas, and I would maybe guess that they stacked their jams against uh, Gila comps, basically. So you probably find that that Widow was struggling to get any jams off against the uh, the Amar and the Galenti ships there uh, brought by Templars. So I think that's a, that's a very interesting comp. I wonder how many team captains have either looked at that and been like, crap, we didn't think of this, or alternatively, crap, Templars have already shown off one of the Gila counters that we've also got in our back pocket. Oh, like you said as well there, there can be some kind of mind games going into here, you know, because Templars does also have that experience behind them, and I think they, they scrum cry a lot and uh, with a lot of teams to get that experience, so they, they could have, you know, maybe maybe that comp wasn't good against Gillis, but they knew who they were playing against and they knew what to bring as well. Uh, but you do also raise another good point, and I think it's maybe this would have been a comp that other would have been suboptimal, but uh, Templars having the execution to actually work such a comp. Um, Radicos, uh, dicta uh, dictors, interdictors are something we don't really think about in tournaments because, you know, they're more meant to be like PvP, bubble, stop warping. You can't warp in an arena. Why did we see a heretic show on the field there on the Tempest side? Well, um, uh, we can now use, uh, wobbles with a, uh, the interdictor, uh, the sphere launcher there. Uh, and, uh, and what, you know, what's a wobble? So it is like an area effect of uh, a bubble that comes up around, you know, zero from you and out, um, uh, depending, uh, 20 kilometers. And uh, basically in that area, if some, a pit, uh, ship passes through it, it is not going to, it is going to slow down and not be able to get to the, you know, target that it needs to get to. So it's a good screening tool um, to have uh, on a comp. Okay. That's also, so also why would they have chosen a heretic over one of the other interdictors? Do you have any idea on that? Um, probably because of the range of the, uh, the light missile launchers and, uh, the tank on it is, uh, that its bonuses, uh, make it, a, you know, a little brick and makes the Punisher kind of, you know, not what it, uh, you know, everyone expects it to be and makes a Punisher, uh, kind of, you know, second tier to that. Um, it is one point more in this meta, um, cause a uh, Punisher is four, um, which is two points more than a regular, uh, frigate, like a Tristan or, or, uh, a, a, a Tormentor. Um, so really you're just, uh, get it, you're upgrading one point and you're getting something that can slow everything around it, uh, down and, um, project, you know, get some utility, some webs in there and have a really huge tank, um, to help your team out, do some screening. No, uh, no, I, I think I was almost, I was almost going to get troll myself. I think I was about to read some troll updates that I saw on Reddit. Never a bad idea. Check your facts before you believe Reddit, folks. Same goes with Twitch chat, but Twitch chat is always right. Remember that. Um, Ithaca, I'm not too sure if you have comment on the weapon system we saw. So I, I mentioned before that uh, they were spamming the heavy beams. Um, and as I was checking out, I pretty much saw all their ships were using beams. Is there a reason you'll be using beams over the more high damage or also scorch being OP for pulse lasers? Range projection, my friend. It's all about being able to be far away from the enemy and still dunk on them. Uh, you don't want to be close. If you come up against um, a brawl comp um, and you're a brawl comp, then maybe that works out for you. But if you come up against a kiting comp and you cannot project out to where they are, then you're going to have a bad day. Beams are very versatile. They allow you to hit out pretty far. Um, those ships could probably easily uh, get ultimate ranges up to 70 or 80 kilometers, depending on the ammo that they load. So if they come across a, a very much kiting comp, a shield kiting comp especially, uh, then the beams will do uh, good, good work. Way more um, versatile, basically, than the pulse lasers. Even though Scorch is OP, uh, you really suffer with a, a lack of range projection. But now, talking about the lasers, Ithaca, um, a lot of times folks talk about being kinetic locked, especially when it comes to the Kaldari ships, which have the kinetic bonus. Now, while it's not there in black and white on Amar ships, technically they are still damage locked, aren't they? Yeah, the crystals obviously do um, EM damage, basically, EM therm. And it's, yeah, if you know you're coming up against uh, an Amar based comp, 
for example, if you were in a Marship only tournament, such as the Mar Championship, you could specifically tank against it. Um, but it depends on this. This goes into this concept of winning the match in the draft or in the in the bands. Like if you can know the other team and you know that hey they have this comp that they like if we ban this ship and this ship take away these other comps they're probably going to bring this one and then bring something specifically to counter it uh you can maybe fill that hole if you think they're going to bring um amar ships basically and really stack up against it and cause them to have uh, a really really bad afternoon as their lasers just do almost no damage to you Great input there. Um, well, the teams are getting ready for the next match so long. Um, we're going to be seeing Chapog <laughs> versus Once to Buy Cat Ears 500 Plex. Um, Radicos, I'm not sure if you have the bands in front of you, if you can go over what the teams have banned so far. Um, so Chapog has banned Gila, Eos, Zarmazad, um, and a Hyena because they because the Cat Ears banned Hyperion, Gila, which was expected, uh, Belgorn, and Orthrus for their dupe ban. So. Okay, so do you have any comments on those bans so far? I see, luckily, we've seen the... Well, luckily, you're like, even though we didn't have a Gila unbanned, we still saw no Gila before, but now the Gila is <laughs> once again banned. Uh, any other comments there, Radicos? Um, Well, with the Gila bans, um, you know, that comes as expected. Um, and, uh, you know, having uh, both teams banned, uh, uh, you know, Chapog banned Hyena, so they don't want to see webs or TPs, and Cat Ears banned Belgrim, so they don't want to see newts and webs, so... Uh, you know, kind of projecting a little what you'd see. But what's interesting is with uh, the Cat Ears uh, team is they ban the Orthrus as their dupe ban. So they're going full heavy on some uh, some uh, uh, small tackle stuff to ban it out. So I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to see any, uh, if we're going to see any Frig Logi um, from the other team. And if they do, they're going to, uh, they're going to get, you know, they're not going to, they're going to stay alive instead of getting ripped up when you have a Orthrus and a Gila out there. Some good points. Um, Orthrus being part of one of the comps, I think, known as Fly Killer, where it's a rapid, uh, uh, excuse me, a skirmish kind of kiting comp flying around the arena, just pretty much swatting all the flies one by one until nothing can catch you. Um, so might be avoiding something like that, but then hopefully some Frig Lodge as well. Uh, we do have the teams actually in the arena now, so we will once again head over to our commentator pair of Jujik and Fear as we head to the arena to witness Chapog versus Want to Buy Cat Ears 500 Pecs, please. Let's go! Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the arena. I'm Fear, joined by Dujek, and we have on the red side Chapog, who have brought an ABBA, a Scorpion, a Rediva, Vedmac, ANI, Pontifex, and Arbitrator. And you have to assume that the cat heirs are not entirely unfamiliar with how that comp works, having brought their own Abaddon, the Neros Heretic, Draugr Drekovac, and two Blackbirds for an ECM armor control mirror match. And we're off. It'll be interesting to see how these range bonus, but not uh, uh, not jam strength bonus ships will do in this format. Uh, the dual blackbird, I would say, is a little bit nicer as the DPS starts going on to this Draugr. Grant you they have an Oneros, which is going to do better at keeping these smaller ships alive compared to the Rediva uh, from Chapog. Also, in an ECM battle, having your Rodeva spool interrupted by ECM is going to set you back, at least temporarily, on the rep power. But neither of these teams are particularly hard hitting. They need to get something locked down for the Abaddon to actually apply their damage. And the Chapog team have locked down Celia Pryor in the Drekovac and are applying to them. Meanwhile, uh, DPS going on to the Scorpion from Cat Ears. We'll see if they're going to be able to get these jams off onto the Rediva of Stanley. Because that could be huge. If this Dracovac goes down, there's a significant chunk of DPS. In fact, I would say uh, probably about 30-40% of the DPS off the field uh, if they can get this Drac down before the Scorpion falls. One of the things that I do like about the Blackbirds in this matchup is you have more jams spread between two Blackbirds, but they can jam each other and off. If they can jam the DPS off each other, they can also hang back a little bit further, being nimble. Whereas you will see that uh, the Cat Ears team. If they get jammed, they're going to have to go on the Scorpion. If the Chapog team are jammed out, they might not be able to 
apply to these blackbirds. Yeah, and it's really nice to have the Aeneros with that as well, being able to swap blurps between uh, the two Blackbirds at the moment. Though, not a whole lot of DPS being spread either way, I would have to assume. Uh, actually, hold on, Stanley, getting a chunk of DPS. He's got the Heretic and the Draugr on him. This could be a huge mistake from Chapog. He is tackled now on the Rodiva. A Draugr that hard tackles a large ship is just going to chunk away at it. Eventually, it will spool up. It does like 900 DPS fully spooled, and you just have to get that off. You can't like you can't let a Rodiva be tackled by a Draugr forever. And this is something that we have kind of realized as tournament captains is the Draugr is a very effective ship DPS for points. Yes, it doesn't have the greatest of bonuses for uh, the uh, particular links on it, but still 800, 900 DPS on an eight point ship is absolutely insane, especially one that can go after Lodgy so well. That said, Stanley's still holding as Stella is starting to dip lower and lower into the arm air. Perhaps these Blackbird jams aren't working out quite so well at the moment. There's a huge cloud of drones hanging out on the Drekovec of Celia, some damage and uh, some armor maintenance bugs. Whereas the Rodiva is in half armor now and is going to get a large drone cloud of its own trying to keep it alive, combined with its own local rep, which is its only method of survival. I mean... If uh, 3AX is able to jam out this Draugr, though, Stanley should be able to rep back up to full. We'll see if he's going to be able to do that. Estello dies past half armor at the moment. There's going to be some DPS on this Arbitrator as well. Uh, let's see. Is he tackled? No, this is just the Abaddon getting a drive-by as he tries to burn in towards this Rodiva, who's now down to about a quarter armor. It's going to be a close trade between this Drek and the Rodiva, but I'd rather get the Rodiva off the uh, field if I were either of these teams. Yeah, it's not a good trade losing your Rodiva for a Drekovac, and uh, the Rodiva is down, and the Drekovac is probably going to follow along soon, having gone into, well, it's dead. Yeah, with the Lodgy down, they only have rep bots. Grant you, Abba and Scorpion both have decent amounts of rep bots in their drone base, so it's not the end of the world uh, for Chapog, but still, they have to figure out a DPS window, take these people down from cat ears, and got to make sure these Blackbirds are unaffected. But at the moment, the Scorpion starting to fall with no Rodiva reps. He's pretty paper. The Arbitrator has probably been uh, annoying uh, a little Elvis uh, in the Abaddon to no end. Abaddons are notoriously bad at tracking, having no tracking bonus and large lasers, but it seems like there's a bit of um, payback going on here as uh, Kananir T in the Arbitrary is probably going to die imminently. Yeah, probably grappled down, I'd have to imagine. Don't actually have the fancy UI at the moment. But meanwhile, Sin dipping into about a quarter armor. If this is an arbitrator for a Draugr, then uh, Chapog is actually ahead on points if they can take him down. The Draugr also has the links for the Blackbirds, increasing probably both their uh, jam strength and resistance to jams. They're on this Vedmac now. Remember, the only DPS they have left is this Abaddon, so if they're able to take that off the field or the Oneros, uh, this could actually swing back in the way of Chapog. Meanwhile, this Oneros, not currently tackled by anything, currently born, uh, burning in towards the rest of his team as he's a little bit far out. Got some damage onto him, but not a whole lot. I believe it's just the Scorpion onto him at the moment as this Vedmac is held down by the Heretic. Yeah, these uh, Blackbirds are suddenly taking a little bit of damage themselves, having up until this point just hung out in the background of this um, fight, getting their chance to jam as much as they want. But spreading your damage against the Neros is not going to be very effective, and while Chipog are trying to somewhat limit the damage they're taking on their team, they're eventually going to bleed out against low damage, but if they kill this Oneros, all bets are off again. Yeah, this Oneros melting pretty quickly. He's actually got an A on I on top of him at the moment. Can't rep through it. Now down to very low structure, and he's dead. And Chapog have suddenly turned the fight back around into their favor with no Logi available and the only DPS on the field being the Abaddon. This could have swung their way after losing out on the initial trade. 
The um, Vedmak is uh, going down for Kirillico, and well, that will probably be uh, another big blow. I'm excited to see such a back and forth battle here in uh, only our second match of this tournament. The rule set is good if it isn't determined by the first ship dying in the start of a match. That Max pulling away from the Heretic right now. I don't exactly know how this is even possible because the ANI has the Heretic tackled and the Vedmac off of the tackle won't be able to be tracked by this Abaddon. Yeah, like with only the Heretic ready to actually tackle someone, it's going to be difficult to hold people down, whereas the He's Pontifex and the Og Navy are going to keep stuff... Uh, pinned down somewhat. The Vedmak is in half structure, more or less, and the opposing Abaddon is in half armor. If the Vedmak yep. dies first, it will take a bit of time to kill the Abaddon, but an Abaddon on Abaddon matchup is going to favor the person with the Scorpion on their side, probably. Indeed it is, and Krilliko staying alive for so long, able to get out of the tracking range of this Abaddon. He has to swap ammo now, can't get him in with that close range ammo. Meanwhile, he's almost down to structure as well. If this Vedmac lives, it is all over for Cat Ears. Yeah, the Abaddon is the only ship capable of actually killing stuff. The Heretic will have a rack of rockets, and any Rep drones will be enough. I am going to call it for Chapog now, even though we yeah. have a little bit of time left. Yeah, losing out on that initial trade, losing your Rodiva, able to take a Dragovac off the field. We thought that wasn't necessarily the best of trades, but when you have two Blackbirds, you have a whole lot less DPS than a comp that has one Scorpion. And we saw here, just in the raw DPS, they weren't able to get enough jams off in the right places. And just like that, Cat Ears are getting knocked down to the lower bracket. The Blackbirds probably have some small amount of smart bombs, but they are actually incapable of doing anything but slightly defend themselves against light drones in this format. Yeah. And GFs are being called in local as well. Yeah, well played by Chapog on that one. Uh, let's talk about Cat Ears, though. We were uh, kind of on the double Blackbird, maybe the uh, DPS trading, maybe something like that. What do you think went wrong after that initial trade for Cat Ears? I think it was apparent that uh, tackle and the DPS is a useful thing to have, and I think that the Pontifex and the Og Navy, who were barely scratched in this match, held down the targets that needed to be held down so that uh, Kirilko could uh, run away and also prevent people from killing their scorpion too early despite the amount of pressure that was put on him. And just like that, Chapog moving on. Cat ears down to the lower bracket. We're going to send it back to the desk to break down that matchup and bring us into game three. And we're back. Uh, unfortunately, the Cat Ears did not get their victory, but you are still able to vote on whether you support Cat Ears or not. Cat Ears, not the team, in the Twitch chat. Um, so, Radicos, um, I'm not too sure what your comment was on the turning point, because we saw quite a bit of back and forth. It was actually really tight at a point, but eventually uh, Chapog managed to just uh, get that uh, that edge they needed to just completely dominate. Uh, do you think there was a turning, a specific turning point, Radicos? Um, I mean, when they got down to five each and, you know, Diva had gone down, um, Dracovac, uh, it was, the point there was the Scorpion having to have less charge to jam, as well as a the blackbirds but i'm guessing that the scorpion landed some jams on the much needed uh on the blackbirds to you know get that uh get that logi uh uh down as fast as they can so they can win that match because uh, if that logi stays up i think it can keep everything else up but i think there are some jams happening there and uh, that old thunderdome uh, rng is that'll get you yeah, speaking about jams, I mean, the one comment I have is um, the heretic of Jintan, the captain there, and I think he's the captain, uh, and um, the joke did a fantastic job of getting a Rediva, but um, see, from my point of view, the heretic uh, should have immediately, 
Heretic doesn't actually do a lot of damage, but its application of the rockets is actually perfect for just smashing that rep cloud which was around the Rediva. Um, and while he did eventually deal with that rep cloud, he maybe should have done it sooner. But then again, he could have been being jammed, meaning he was unable to deal with it. Um, Ithaca, do, do you, did you see a specific turning point yourself there? Um, I, I think it was a couple. It was, like you said, kind of back and forward, back and forward. Um, it's hard to know exactly what happened with the jams, um, but you saw uh, on the fancy UI at the bottom of the screen that the Scorpion was spreading jams and the Blackbirds were trying to focus jams on the Scorpion. So I think the Scorpion was... Um, doing some business uh, in that particular match against those Blackbirds, and the Blackbirds were really struggling to, to slow him down. I think if they dealt with that Repcloud maybe a little bit quicker and killed that Rediva quicker, then they maybe would have traded a bit more favorably. Um, a Rediva for a Drekovic is a reasonable trade, but then you remember a Rediva is only 14 points, Drekovic is 22 points, and quite a lot of your damage because you brought two Blackbirds. So that was where it started to go wrong. Although they got rid of the Logi, they just lacked the DPS, so it was kind of still somewhat even in that race. Yeah, not having that direct there really hurt it, I thought. Yeah. It's worth worth mentioning as well that um, any good anime, the hero has to lose first to then ha you know, charge through the, the lower bracket and have a comeback. So I think that might be what's happening here. I'm, I'm sure Jim's going to love that analogy. Uh, but also speaking about damage, now Radicus, we saw the Hyperion got banned, a, a lovely T1 battleship. And it's uh, the major thing of it, obviously, Blosh is not fantastic. It has a fantastic self-tank bonus, but it also has a utility high. Um, do you think that affected the matches that these teams ended up, I, I would almost say, subbing in Abaddon, which has to use all of its high slots for damage? Yeah, generally, you don't want to lack your battleship uh, out of that uh, opportunity um, with, with the hull that you bring. Um, having that utility high with a smart bomb um, is really good for rep bots, um, but uh, but also um, it can be used as, a, as you can use a newt, and that helps shut down, you know, a logi or shut down MWD or something like that. And uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's, you know, it's a big deal. So, yeah. Yeah, like I, having utility stuff um, is definitely one of the big things. Um, so, uh, Ithaca, just quickly, like, uh, what are utility slots and what might players use them for? Utility slot is um, basically any high slot that you wouldn't normally fit a weapon system to. So you might fit things like uh, engine neutralizers, um, Nosferatus, smart bombs, uh, things like that into those high slots. Uh, people call them utility highs because they're not providing damage necessarily, but they're providing utility to the fleet, whether or not it's uh, muting the enemies um, or uh, smart bombing off clouds of drones. Quite a useful thing to have as well, giving the players more tools. But we do actually have the teams for the next match taking the arena, which will be Volta versus aggressively mid-tier. And with that, we'll be handing off to the arena with our commentators of DTM and Murray. I don't know about you, DTM, but I'm hyped for this. This is a revenge grudge match. Volta managed to knock out uh, Root Capel in the last AT and take out their flagship, and I can guarantee you that Root Capel is looking for some sweet revenge here. I have no doubt Root Capel is looking to come out of this with a W as well. I'm really, really excited. Why don't you talk to me a little bit about Root? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm more curious looking at the Volta team. What do you think about the Volta team right now, what they're, uh, they're coming to the grid with? It looks like a kite on kite. We've got Nighthawks and Jackdaws versus a very much like Battlecruiser com, much like we saw Temple Spring before. And I'm very curious to see whether one of these teams will just try and stick to that kiting or whether one team is going to try and dive in at the start of the match and mix it up a little. Yep, and here we go. The start of the match right here. Those Nighthawks just a little bit further out towards the center of the arena. We are seeing Volta burn back as uh, mid-tier actually takes the the aggressive play and moving into them a little bit, though we are seeing the Malediction want to burn back a little bit as it does take a lot of damage as those missile volleys start heading towards it. Not really yeah, but the Malediction... Armor. The Malediction is insanely fast. The second he saw that damage come in, he dips back out, and he's over 100 kilometers away from them now. So he's just going to circle back in as soon as the damage is back off of him. Yep, that's one of those nasty things about Jack Dawes is he's got to be careful about exactly how close he is and how long he stays in the sort of range bubble of these Jack Dawes because they're going to do a lot of damage and apply really, and really Navy, well. The Og Navy of Vorian looks like it's managed to catch one of the Nighthawks. The Nighthawks have not made very many moves to get away. 
And so it looks like Volta want that damage on the Nighthawks. They think that's their best chance of tanking as this match goes. But with the Nighthawk down, Rode's going to be able to stick a lot of damage into it, and lasers into a Nighthawk is a good deal. Yeah, and we are going to see the Vigil go boom kapow as he goes down. The Zarm is taking damage, but he does look like he's tanking like surprisingly effectively um, considering all of the damage on grid that's trying to remove reps, uh, specifically the Zarm yeah. from the grid. He's doing all right, but he actually managed to kind of turn into where Volta was going. And so he ended up being in range, which is why he ate so much damage there. On the other side, though, it looks like the Osprey is now taking a fair bit of damage as they realize they can't break this Nighthawk. They need to look for smaller targets first. Mm -hmm. That Nighthawk was burning up towards the Zarm. It looks like it's going to miss it. If they did have any webs, they're not quite in range to apply to it. The Osprey still taking damage. We are seeing a Jackdaw go into low shields. Urge, you're in trouble, man. You got to figure out something or you're going to end up going down. Yeah, and meanwhile, the Osprey is going to get deleted first because Ospreys don't have a whole lot of tank. And without Logi, this matchup's looking extremely rough for Volta. Volta's in a bad situation right now. Rima in the Zarm, though, taking a lot of damage all of a sudden, going into Bleeding Structure, but it might be too little too late as the Nighthawks and Jackdaws have no Logi and no support to help them through the rest of this match. It might just become a shooting range for Rote Capel. Yeah, I mean, they've taken down that Zarm, but they've got five DPS ships, three of which are Battlecruisers, and on the other side, they've got two Nighthawks and a couple of Jackdaws. So as they work through this damage pool, it's going to be really hard for Volta to bring it back, especially since one of their Nighthawks is already down to like a quarter shields. Yep, and Absolutely. as that Nighthawk drops, it's going into armor. It'll be dead very soon. Stiggy also looking to drop as he gets run down by the, Aug or by the Vedmac of Cyclo. And with the, both of those ships down, it's going to be very difficult for them to pull anything out here. Even the Malediction of Rotan came in, baited that damage again, and dove back out. So he's in hull, but he's managed to waste so much of Volta's time shooting a ship that doesn't actually do any damage. It's one of those situations where if you're a good pilot, you can pull out little bitty wins that can add up very quickly. Rotan, we saw, like you mentioned earlier at the very beginning of the match, recognized that the missile volleys were heading for him and was able to turn around and get out of range before he sustained too much damage. Absolutely fantastic job. We are seeing the Vedmac go into lull. Uh, low armor right now. Meanwhile, this Nighthawk also in low shield. It's looking like they might be a little bit of a trade here, but really, do you end up ahead when there's still so many ships on Rote Capel's side? Yep, and with the Vedmac able to clean up this Jackdaw here, that is going to be a pretty commanding win for Rote Capel aggressively mid-tier as they take down the team that came in second place in the last tournament, Volta. Absolutely a solid win. I believe we're going to go back here to the desk in a moment. We'll see you guys back here in a little while. And welcome back, everyone. Uh, Grace to the mid Taylor Royal Capel team having a strong performance there. Apologies to everyone that got baited on those channel points. Um, speaking of which, just remember, we are running channel points and polls uh, on the Twitch chat here. So feel free to see if you can rake up some great predictions there. Um, probably be able to redeem some skins later in the year when the actual AT happens. But Radicos, getting back to the game. Um... It looked a bit scary there with that application happening right off the bat on that malediction, but he managed to save himself uh, for a while. But then the first target we see going down was actually the vigil. Is there a reason they would take that off of en before anything else? Oh uh, yeah, it's bonus for paints. You don't you don't want uh, those paints uh, uh, sparking up your uh, your uh, sig and uh, getting that deleted off the field is uh, a, a huge thing, a huge huge thing uh, to help out. Uh, uh, the Ro the Ro Capel team. Yeah, I think that's something people also need to understand. It's like it doesn't matter what you fly in these tournaments. Every ship has its use. Even if you're a little one frigate, every second you can buy yourself. Like Malediction on the Ro Capel team was a good example. Like maybe he didn't do much, but he at the beginning, but he bought his team so much time trying to just living to win. Uh, pretty much living to win is a valid strategy. Uh, Ithaca, uh, what do you feel about the uh, weapons choice we had shown there on the Nighthawks uh, using heavy missile launchers and the Jackdaws using light missiles? 
Um, I mean, obviously, going with no logistics, you basically don't want to just brawl in and, and eat shit, <laughs> to put it in uh, as many words. Uh, so you want to try and kite around and basically mitigate damage, not by receiving reps, but by just not taking it in the first place. Um, that's the logical choice. Um, you can go full DPS, balls to the wall rush, and just you know careen in and hope you can kill them faster than they can possibly kill you or keep themselves alive. Uh, and that's a bit more of a risky tactic. Uh, I think Volta trying to rely on maybe a bit higher piloting skill to uh, avoid taking too much damage. Of, of course, it didn't work out in this case. Um, if they drop another match, at least they don't have to count to three matches, which is a nice benefit for them. Yeah, and they don't have to count up to three Command Destroyers. Always a benefit to not have mass involved here. Um, but the, the Nighthawk and the Jackdaws, we actually saw, right, because I think last year in the AT, the rush comps being quite a predominant thing, especially the assault missiles, the, the rockets. Um, but I think we're seeing teams for now sticking to more long-range comps. I'm not sure if you have any opinion on why teams might prefer a more long-range approach right now without giving too much away of your own team. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of projection, damage, and Ewar. You know, you don't you, that's stuff you don't want to have to deal with. You know, no one wants to deal with newts. It's not giving anything away. No one wants to deal with webs. Like that's that's pretty basic. Um, a lot of teams in the past in any platform um dominate when they have that uh, uh, uh on their side, especially if it's like newts, webs, and ECM. Um, you see a lot of Vyger Hydra teams that have done that and it's very effective that control is very effective they don't have to move in right away like you said with the frigate the all he had to do rotan just had to wait for that right time to just go in there and then he went in there and he shot his shot and he did his job got on that uh, osprey um and which basically helped them um you know bring them on down they were pushing through uh you know push through that vigil that was huge and uh those jackdaws and the nighthawks you know they they're good in a rush, but in this setting, I just don't see it as a very strong comp in my in my uh, in my opinion. I know the Jackdaw has uh, been quite notorious as well for being able to have a ridiculous amount of mid slots to apply utility e war, um, you know, tracking disruptors, guidance disruptors, target paints, all the jams. So always a useful ship. Um, but Ithaca, let's speak a bit about the bands we have coming up for the next game, which is going to be Nanofiber Tokens versus Odin's Make a Wish. So we see Nano banning the Loki, Zarm, Vedmak, and Odin's banning the Semi Gila Abaddon. And I think that's the first time, no, it's the second time we've seen a Semi ban. Why are people banning that when we've actually just been seeing the Zarm and the Oneros mainly been showing around? The Scimitar is probably the best shield uh, logistics ship uh, in the tournament format, at least this particular tournament format. The um, Basilisk is maybe got slightly higher rep power, but it really sacrifices its own local tank uh, or mobility. It can't really do uh, both. Whereas the Scimitar is very mobile, it can rep a lot. Uh, and this goes back to what I said previously about the best way to not die is just not to be shot. And if you can be out of range and move around really quickly, then you can, you can do that a lot more effectively. By banning out the Scimitar, you're saying, hey, either bring armor, or bring um, like a scythe or uh, bring a basilisk. And we think that that is a, a worse version. And sometimes if you have a ship banned out in your comp, you either think, hey, do we substitute it or do we bring something different? So that's that's what that ban says to me. Mm. And uh, Radicos, on the Abaddon now, um, the Hyperion, in my opinion, is a bit more of like a threat, being having a ridiculous amount of damage, ridiculous amount of tank, and having an utility slot, and having a drone bay, it's quite a threat, but we see also in the previous match, um, and now this match as well, the team's opting to ban the a Abaddon instead of the Hyperion. Um, what is the trade-off between these two ships? Why would they be maybe more scared of an Abaddon? Uh, Scorch, um, Conflag. Uh, the tank is, you know, you can fit an AR or just fit full buffer um, on the Abaddon, but on the Hyperion, you know, it, it's, its tank is a huge part of it, right? Um, but... Uh, you know, it's you can project from range with the Abaddon. The Hyperion, you just can't, and then you can get screened real easy. If you get screened in Abaddon, at least you can, you know, use Scorch and you know hit something. Um, I, 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 Hyperions aren't my favorite. Uh, aren't my favorite call in, in this uh, in this format. It's just I just don't I just don't feel them. I love them on TQ, but yeah, I'd rather have an Abaddon uh, out there. I'll tell you that much. That's and that's well, pretty much uh, what no, other people about would it, probably agree with. So if you're getting stuck, uh, Radicos, let's say. What uh, Vindicator is pretty similar to Hyperion, but there's some key differences. Do you think the Vindicator would suffer the same issues then as Hyperion when it gets uh, tackled and screened? 
Um, no, be, mostly because of the uh, the webs. Uh, you know, their strength. You can get it 98, 99%, whatever. And it's it's very, very effective. Um, slows target down. And, you know, blasters, they only have you know, void. They only have so much range. And uh, you, once you, you know, can stall a pilot, then, you know, you're, you're going to be able to kill a, uh, a tackle pilot with that. With Hyperion, you're going to need a newt and uh, your own scram and web just to pull out just enough range. And you hope that this pilot doesn't, you know, you know, orbit you uh, and then f1 around you know hopefully it doesn't f1 around you but it you know you know pilots itself you know so you know to, you know to stop your tracking right but like you're not i, I just don't see I, I i don't see the hyperion you know being like something you want to use there yeah not effective fantastic input there um if you can now the vetmax also being banned we've seen the two glavian ships featuring quite a much the rediva the zarm uh the jorger was making some good plays earlier um i think our commentators alluded to it before but what is the unique bonus that these two ships are actually offering with their presence on the field uh, they can spill up their damage they do more damage the longer they're on the field so when you start shooting with your uh uh, entropic disintegrator um it starts doing a couple hundred dps and then it gets a little bit more and then a little bit more and a little bit more and the vedmax pulls up quite quickly uh so it's able to put out an awful lot of damage for a cruiser and it's quite a cheap cruiser as well it only has tech one resists because uh, it's only a tech one cruiser but it can really really punish um a, a large ship especially if it gets on top of a logistics cruiser um, it can do a lot of damage if it gets on top of a battleship uh, you probably want to uh, remove it very quickly because of that spooling effect yeah. And I do believe the Trigalavians also have the unique bonus, even though they're not allowed to fit it, they do have uh, able to uh, some bonuses to remote reps. Remote reps are only allowed to fit to logistic ships. This excludes T3s, cruisers. So only the logistics T1 cruiser and T2 cruisers and the frigologies, T1 and T2, are allowed to fit them. But they also have a wonderful bonus towards newts and smart bomb capacitor usage, which makes them an absolute nightmare to deal with. Um, ju just quickly, Radicos, uh, out of interest, I do, yeah. What do you guys name your comps for your teams? Anything weird and funny? What do you call your comps? How do you keep track of stuff? Um. Well, you know, if it warrants, you know, you know, if it warrants an actual name, um, we uh we pick whatever it is that the person wants to pick, you know, name it as, and it's up to them. You know, that's I think that's fun to do for anyone. You got some so, examples you know? for us? Um. Oh man, hold on here. I I did not have do any offhand. It's okay. We'll, we'll we'll get back to that quickly soon. Uh, we okay. do actually have the teams uh, taking their in soon, um, right now. So the next match, game four, we're going to be seeing Nanofiber Tokens versus Odin's Make-A-Wish. And with that, we're actually going to be heading to the arena, back to our commentator pair of DTM and Murray. Yeah, we've got another shield versus armor battle for you here today. Oh, wait, no. I take that back. I look at Bargas and I see shield, but it is in fact an armor Bargas, as we're looking at an armor matchup here. DTM, what do you like to see on this grid? Oh man, I've seen what is arguably the best ship in the entire tournament, despite what the analyst desk may have you think, and they are objectively oh. wrong. The Hyperion is on grid, and oh man, am I excited. I cannot wait to see how the Hyperion versus Bargists play out. We also are seeing a little bit of an interesting um, comp come here. I believe OMA is uh, is Odin's in this team. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how these jams actually do play out. Uh, a little bit of a, a stronger rep here with the T2 Logi from Odin's as well. I'm, I'm very curious to see how this match plays out overall. What are you thinking about the team so far? I'm looking at those newts, man. The Armageddon and the Curse, that is a lot of suck. And especially with the Armageddon newt range, it's going to be pretty difficult for Odin's to maneuver around this grid as these ranged newts kind of hammer them down turn off their props, turn off their tank, turn off their reps, turn off their guns, and do all sorts of other very mean things to them. Newts are very dangerous, the curse as well. You know, the Armageddon not newting as much as the Balgorn, but definitely with the range bonus allowed to stay inside optimal longer, which is very important. I believe the countdown has already finished. We are starting, and we're seeing the curse dive back towards his team a little bit. Meanwhile, that Hyperion Heretic and the Drek are burning into the team. I'm just waiting to see who gets newts on them first. Yeah, the battleships are smacking each other as they both burn in there. And we're starting to see some newts land initially on the Hyperion of Pesh, Lepesh Peshi. 
as the Armageddon moves forward. Yes, that Hyperion is being grappled or webbed right now by the Bargus. There's also a bit of a tackle Vexor Navy issue, which is taking quite a little bit of damage right now. If those Frigs are able to keep up with the... Whoa! Big damage onto these Blackbirds just a bit. I do imagine their armor tanked, though. So we're going to see if the Reps are able to hold them. Yeah, it's... This Vexor Navy is definitely going to be the primary target. They're focusing everything in on it. Meanwhile, damage on the other team looks like they're trying to fish for a better target. They've switched over to the Heretic, but they've also put damage into those Blackbirds. So they're trying to see if there's a weakness they can poke and prod out to kind of break apart the enemy team comp. Absolutely. Lots of damage going on to the Vexor Navy issue, but it is receiving reps, so it's not doing too badly. We are seeing that Hyperion burn a little bit closer. The closer he gets to Optimal, the more this Vexor Navy issue has to worry. It's a race against time, though, because those newts are going to shut off his guns if they don't start eliminating them off the grid. Yeah, and it's so difficult for the red side, because with... The Lodgy that they've brought, these T1 Lodgy Fricks, they have to be so careful about getting too close to the enemy because they'll get instantly deleted. And so they're working in rep falloff range. They're staying kind of far away from this Vexor. And so they're not giving in as many reps as they necessarily could, but it's more important that they're staying alive. Yeah, we are seeing these Blackbirds take a little bit of damage. One of the things that's worth mentioning right now is there actually aren't any Newts on the Hyperion. This Blackbird now, though, dropping down below half armor in a dangerous situation. This Vexor, though, just won't stop. He won't quit. He is the space potato that will. Absolutely. I've seen Ten play in real life on TQ. I'm seeing him play here with the support of his team, and I absolutely love it. I can confirm that that old man has hands. Meanwhile, the bar guest has decided he's had enough of that. He's going to go find some blackbirds. As he sits right at zero on the blackbird of Thor. Now, it's going to be interesting to see how well these blackbirds can juggle jams. They can help each other out, but it's going to be on Ollie to try and get his teammate out of what is a pretty bad pickle here as the bar guest just sits on him at zero. And he's got to do that while taking a fair bit of damage himself. Absolutely. This is one of those matches right now where no team has broken just quite yet. The question is, will the Blackbirds break? Will they no longer be able to reduce that incoming DPS? And we are seeing DPS on Ollie right now. The Blackbird that's actually further away, dropping below half armor. Meanwhile, the Sonero's trying to get reps on him so he doesn't quite go down, but we're seeing it bounce back and forth. Oh man, you could cut the tension with a knife. Yeah, and it you see that Bargus, he's rapid heavy fit as per usual. And so it's a matter of whether he can get him down before that clip runs out. And it looks like he should be able to as that Blackbird is down. This is a huge loss for the blue side. With only a single Blackbird left, it's going to be extremely difficult for them to manage all this E-War, all this tackle, all this damage from the other team. They're definitely going to have to be looking for ways to pull out of play right here. They did switch on to the logistics frigate of Lawrence, but... Do they actually have enough tackle and DPS to keep him? Another thing that's worth mentioning is even though the Hyperion does have a very large drone bay, he has to pull those in and put them back out. It also looks like the Vexor Navy issue has just held him at the center of the reason, pulling a Gandalf saying, stop, you shall not pass. Meanwhile, Thor taking more and more damage. He is going to drop into a hole right now. He's in a dangerous situation. It looks like Boom might go the dynamite. Yeah, with that Blackbird down, the Drekovac's trying to move towards these Lodgy Frigates, but they, just don't, they don't have either of them tackled. So they don't have a way to get the damage onto them consistently, and they seem to have just given up, and now they're trying to shoot a Pontifex, which is going to be extremely difficult if they weren't able to break some T1 resistances. Those pseudo-T2s on the Pawnee are not going to make their life any easier. For all the damage, all the tank and spank that Hyperions and Drex bring to the grid, they have to be able to apply. If you cannot slow down the frigate, you cannot kill the frigate. And we're going to see Thor dipping below so close into armor. He just won't die, though. What is this man made of? Uh, pure hopium, we can assume. But you can only hop so much from the tank before you explode. And that is what just happened to him. He did go down at the end of the day, looking for the next primary. I am seeing the Armageddon take a little bit of damage, but it looks like that Drek might be in trouble now. Lots of damage onto him. 
Props to this lodging pilot from blue side, able to stay alive and navigate outside the bubble of damage, able to keep repping his teammates no matter what happens. We are seeing 10 take a little bit of damage, but we've already seen this same story, different day. 10's gonna get reps and he's gonna be okay. They have to figure out a way to eliminate these two logistics frigates that are absolutely just tearing up the grid and delivering those juicy juicy reps wherever they need to yeah and that nairos may not be tackled but he certainly doesn't have a whole lot of cap as the curse is sitting on him at zero the armageddon's here as well and so while it may not look like he is necessarily taking a lot of pressure i can promise you that he is not giving a whole lot of reps to that drakovac right now Definitely under pressure. Dun, 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 dun. We are seeing the Drek drop below half armor right now. Val, you are in a dangerous situation. This is just one of those things where if you pilot well and you stay away from the enemy, it becomes immensely more important as soon as you realize that you cannot hold with the reps on grid. The Drek right now being uh, sat on by the Bargast is taking a lot of damage directly to his face. Yeah. It's a dangerous situation. We are seeing the Vargas take a little bit of damage. Meanwhile, I'd like to mention the Hyperion is still in the middle of the grid, absolutely being screened by 10. Yeah, they never really made an effort to get the Hyperion free. Meanwhile, the Heretic is, to his credit, finally realizing that he should be on top of those Lodgy Frigates, webbing them down, pressuring them with his damage. But at this point, I suspect that that is going to be way too little, way too late as they seem to be cleaning up this grid as the Drekovac looks to go down. Drekovac is looking like it's going to go down. Props to the Logi pilot for managing to keep repping under so much cap pressure. It's just one of those situations where at the beginning of the match, the primaries you call are so important. And I understand what Blue Side was thinking. Odin was thinking, we can go into this. We have a Hyperion. We have a Drek. We have a Magus. We have a lot of damage. We can just get on to the VNI will take it down, but that's just not the story. The VNI turning out to be way more than they bargained for. This is why you don't go to the dollar store looking for good fights, man. It's one of those situations. They're just in trouble now. They have to search for a way out if there is one. Yeah, and with so much, their ship's so pressured by this capacitor nuding, right? The Aniros, he can't do anything anymore. The Hyperion, he can't do much either. They're really just giving reps when their cap booster cycles hit as the heretic looks to be the next target as they ensure that their logi is going to be safe. Absolutely. It's, man, I just look at it and I've seen time and time again T1 logi frigates being brought to the, situ to, the, to the grid and getting absolutely wiped over and over again because you have less HP, so you have less time to react and figure out what you're going to do. Lawrence and Nicholas came into a situation. They've clearly practiced. They know what's up. They got ahead of the curb, and they were able to stay ahead of the curb for pretty much the entire match, doing a fantastic job. It also doesn't help that it seems like you brought up, Murray, that this uh, heretic just did not go for them soon enough. Yeah, I mean... It really is a credit to those Logi pilots because a super common tactic you'll see, right, against Logi frigates is you go for a target you know you can't kill. But because the rep range on Logi frigates is so short, in order to keep that target alive, the Logi frigates have to burn in. And so what you'll do is you'll bait them in, get tackle on them, switch to them, and take them out. And the Logi frigates here, they had the confidence to know that they could just barely keep 10 alive even if they stayed at range. And so they kept themselves out there, managed their reps as best they could, and when they never went in, it became harder and harder for them to be an easy target of opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're seeing the Magus of Meat Shield take damage, and he is definitely a Meat Shield as he instantly drops down. Almost it felt like a one-shot. That man was not meant for this grid today. He is gone. And with five seconds remaining on the match, it looks like it's going to be a pretty clean victory for NFT as they look to move on to the next round Absolutely. with no losses whatsoever. They might not be on the blockchain, but you're going to be able to keep watching them at this tournament.
I'm excited to see what they do next. That was a really interesting comp, Bargus Armageddon. I do believe we're about to go back to the commentary desk. Murray, do you have any last words, man? Uh, that was a great match, man. 10, some damn good tanking. I love it. And we're back. Another fabulous match there. I always love it when a match goes to time. Um, <laughs> but uh, there, actually, Radicos, to start right off the bat, we saw that the curse on uh, Nano's side was actually at zero kilometers a, right off. It's uh, Fear and Mizir, not Radicos and... Uh... Are they back? Oh, well, no. It's... Anyway, uh, but whoever hears with me then... <laughs> Well, no, okay. Well, then you're, you're stuck with us now, so just have yeah. to move on. <laughs> it's okay. Apologies then. Um, I got my schedule mixed up and was looking at it. But then, welcome to Mazir and Fear back right here on the panel. Um, so uh, then, Fear, uh, what do you have to say about the curse showing up there at zero right at the start? Uh, I mean, Newt's very strong. Uh, I mean, I, I think someone else pointed out there were no guns on the VNI, so there are probably Newt's on that as well. Uh, as well as you know, full Newt yet in, not even. Uh, a single gun on that ship um i mean really what it boils down to is they were like all right and we we figured out that these guys are going to bring something cap reliant like a hyperion like an abaddon obviously this a nearest so ended up being a, a huge target for them and they just were they knew what to bring in that situation they also brought it i think there were some ecm boats in that comp as well just like shuts down everything else uh on the entire comp and uh, it's news armor control okay uh yeah that's fantastic there uh mazir i know you have a lot of thoughts to share with everyone so please i'd love to hear what you have to say yeah like i'm just looking through my notes because i had so much uh but yeah to answer your very first question like the curse at zero might as well be like a mess up uh, doing something wrong with the warping in but it might also be like a, a five hit uh uh chess move because baiting people into shooting or whatever but i did notice one thing like as the hyperion that the heretic was charging in after the curse the heretic did put down a wobble and while everyone was hyped about someone actually using a wobble it just turned out to slow down itself and uh and the hyperion so that's already yeah, one mistake they could have been faster on going off, like spammed in there pretty much in the melee just that wobble just kept going off yeah uh, i'm not really sure what they wanted to achieve with that uh but yeah, they went on, and then they got screened by that uh, VNI, and the, the VNI is a Tech 1 uh, resist uh, cruiser, so it's fairly squishy. And it was getting pummeled by the Hyperion and the Dracarac, and it's still tanked, and that really showed the power of these uh, Tech 1 Logi frigates that seem to be undisturbed uh, throughout uh, most of the match. Like, they should have jammed those off, they could kill the VNI, but the VNI survived, and these Logi frigate pilots did a real good job for two uh, so, giga chats right there yeah, sorry, i'm just gonna also um i do love the input but uh, it seems we will be starting soon but uh, before we head over to the arena fear do you have any comments of the previous match just before we head over to the next one I mean, it just boils down to, you know, new power is always going to be strong in any given tournament format. It just boils down to you're trading your needs for DPS. In that particular instance, uh, the Bargus was enough, uh, but you still have to be very careful when you go for something like a full new get in plus a, a curse, uh, plus a full new VNI. You don't have a whole lot of DPS. So if you see something like that later on in the tournament, be wary of it going up against comps that don't get their DPS turned off by those newts. Fantastic. And in fact, we will actually be going to the arena with our next game of I Only Need Two Comps versus Scarf Experts. And we will be joined by our commentators of Ithaca Hawk and Chair in the Arena. Good afternoon, space friends. I am Ithaca Hawk here with the man who does not need any help finding sources of hydration in the wilderness. It is Chair Grills, and we are here to watch Only Needs Two Comps co-op against Scarf Experts. Chair, take me through uh, the Only Need Two Comps comp. All right, so we got a Balgorn, a Drekvac, a Rediva, and then some Augur Navy issues. Now, I'm pretty sure Ten is famous for bringing these Augurs in his comps always. 
It matches about to actually start, so we're ready to go. And it looks like Scarf bringing Vindicator, Guardian, Rook, Draugr, Pontifex, Blackbird, and a Malediction. So immediately, teams starting to position themselves and get into, into place. What is happening here? It looks like the Vindicator is actually running away. I mean, it should just be straight diving, on it, unless they brought some kind of weird rail Vindicator. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I mean, they might just be trying to position themselves, get ready to uh, get optimal moment and dive in. But as I said, that Chab Hammer, Chad Hammercock in that Draugr just got giga chunked into armor. The Rook as well, taking a huge amount of damage coming probably from that Drekovac and that two Augur and Avia issues. Of course, they do a lot of DPS and can project really super well. But at the moment, uh, the Guardian keeping them both alive. He will have to split reps, though, to try and save that Malediction. It is a good thing they brought a Guardian in this case, though, if they're splitting DPS like this, because, you know, if you bring his armor or Rediva, you're not able to do that. And Celo's taking so much damage, I don't know if he's going to be able to survive. I think he's being yeah, wiped by the Belgorn. That Guardian's going to have to drop reps off someone else to try and keep that Malediction alive. They kind of need that fast tackle to help that Vindicator. Uh, he will be able to catch up with that Balgorn, maybe a Drekovic if it positions itself wrongly, but almost nothing else on that uh, that enemy team can be caught by a Vindicator with a piloting mistake. At the moment, though, uh, Aird Gera in that Guardian doing a really good job keeping that Malediction alive. The DPS has been swapped back to the Rook, though. Um, bit of a stalemate going on right now. I'm not really sure who's who's winning. It seems to be a positioning game. Like the uh, positioning game as well as just jams right now. They're really focusing on the Blackbird and the Rook because they're the ones that are being jammed. But the Chad and, uh, and the Draugr is taking so much damage too. Uh, oh yeah, really he is getting chunked to... right now. If he don't sit... There he's he goes, he is here. down. So that's the Lynx off the field. It's a lot of DPS off the field as well. And another one of those ships that could potentially help that Vindicator get on top of things. The Vindicator kind of burning around at the minute, staying not too close to the enemies. Uh, I think he maybe needs to start committing, but there you go. Kit Kat and the Draugr are about to go down as well. So trade Draugr for Draugr, boom, done. Those 60% webs coming into play right there. And then I, I think it's just going to be a slugfest between the Balgorn and the Vindicator at the end. And I think I think Scars I think, has I think that. A Vindicator, yeah, I think a Vindicator wins against a Balgorn, depending on if it has an injector and how much the how many newts are fit to that Bal. That will be an interesting one to see. But Aird, Garrett in that Guardian, though, taking a bunch of damage. Uh, it looks like, has he been tackled, perhaps, by the Tyrannus? Uh, it looks like he has, so that is not good for them. They need to try and free up that uh, that Guardian, get him away. The two Augur Navy issues now are on top. The Tyrannus peeling off to safety uh, and let the heavy tackle take over. And, and the Guardian's Guardian dead already. been absolutely shat on. I think it's okay, so all just going to kind of fall to pieces here. Exactly. So without the Guardian now and the DPS coming from only need two comps is going to be really hard for um, Scarf to deal with. They, we see the Pontifex come down. So now that's all the links off the field. They will still have them from the last burst, but I really don't think uh, two Blackbirds uh, are going to survive very long against the uh, Og Navy and the Drek. It's almost like the the ECM just didn't land how they needed it to, or the beams of the Augur Navy and just everything was able to kind of land damage everywhere because it is a gun battle. So it probably has at least Scorch, which can reach out to at least about 60. So they're pretty much able to apply everywhere in the arena. So what could Scarf have done differently here? Because this match is just in cleanup now uh, as they get, they're going to chew through the Malediction, the Rook, and then the Vindicator. Could think, they have done anything different, you think? I think their target selection was off. Like They were burning around when the Vindicator trying to catch a Drek when they could have just grabbed and protected their Guardian from the Augurs. Or anything because it does so much dps and they can easily out dps what the rediva brings or jam it out um i think it was just target selection target selection and uh positioning yeah i think positioning clearly um it looked like that vindicator just was too far away from anything they didn't really commit early i think they wanted to be a bit more cautious um, but then the longer a match goes on, especially against newts, the the, the more effective those newts can be. Uh, he is still killing things. Uh, he did manage to kill that auger navy there. But I mean, unless he is an absolute giga chad and solos everybody, um, I want. I think happen. those auger navies are polarized. With how fast they're dying, even with reps, I think that's why the that guardian went down so fast. That's a good point, actually. Uh, and that vindicator is now chewed through another ship, the Tyrannus. Uh, I mean, vindicators are, you know, famously very powerful ships, but. I still don't think he's going to be able to uh, chew through enough here to, to pull out a win. Maybe if it's a flagship Vindicator, but sadly those do not exist in this tournament. 
Yeah, and uh, the Ogre and Navy trying to just pull away to safety the Rediva repping them. Uh, at this point, they just need to just not feed, essentially, not boundary, um, which is not that <laughs> difficult um, for some teams. Other teams find it a lot harder to stay within the, the 125. Is this a personal arena. attack, Ithaca? No, if you took it as that, uh, I'm not held responsible for it. <laughs> but uh, the Vindicator currently not living to win, in fact, dying to lose, uh, and that will be the Scarf Experts losing that match 67-0. to zero. What, a, what a slugfest. That was a great great match. Yeah, it was a great match, but let's hand it back to the desk. I'm sure they'll have a lot to, uh, to break down. And welcome back. Uh, joined here again with Mazir and Fear. I got it right this time, folks. Um, uh, seen a lovely match. I do love seeing a Vindicator on the grid there, but uh, unfortunately, a bit too uh, little, I'd say. Uh, Fear, no. To the folks at home who might be confused, we saw that Vindicator, when it was getting on top of targets, its velocity coming down to zero. So he was pretty much hitting controlled space to stop each ship. Now, why would he be, have been doing that? Uh, cause blaster tracking is, uh, it's something, shall we say. I mean, he's got gigantic webs, but just being able to bring that transversal down to basically zero, uh, stop your ship, don't out-track yourself, that's why he's doing that on that Vindicator, uh, having flown these types of battleships i do want to make the comment though i wonder what their second comp is uh for only need two comps because that first comp was definitely something uh mazir before we get into the other details of the match um our commentators touched a bit on the prospect of polarized orgs i don't actually think that was really the case but uh what do they mean when they're referring to polarized org and why might it actually be a good option I mean, polarized guns, they do a lot more damage than normal Tech 2 guns, but in return, they also reduce your assist to zero. So they make you into a literal glass cannon. And normally, an organ Navy issue is known to be an extremely tanky ship, so people don't uh, primary it. So you can kind of play this little game of uh, chicken and see if you dare to put uh, polarized guns on your organ Navy issues uh, or... To bait them into like shooting something else and then you just murder them with these uh, DPS machines. Uh, but I think in this situation it was not a polarized uh, Augur Navy issue. It was just... Uh, I agree. Uh, it was just uh, someone not uh, doing transversal because I was looking at him just burning slowly away from the Vindicator without any transversal at all and then just getting blasted to pieces as a Void L um, kind of hurts. Uh, unfortunately, in the past, you could actually see if a weapon was polarized just by looking at the model. Um, especially with polarized lasers, they had a kind of unique almost where the crystal would be, you could say, like at the end of the turret, the barrel. Um, but unfortunately, these days, skins can actually influence how hard points look on ships, and it can be a bit deceiving. So you don't really have that black and white crystal way of telling until you actually shoot it. But like you mentioned, Ms., it's uh, really a tanky ship. Um Fear, any other general comments you might have had on that match? I mean, it just boils down to, you know, armor control doing what armor control does best, uh, keeping people down. It's also my general thoughts on the Vindy this tournament are that it's kind of overpointed. I think the Hyperion, uh, even though it doesn't have the web amount bonus, is just a tankier ship that does nearly the same amount of DPS for a significantly lower chunk of points. Um, perhaps if they added something like a Hyperion in there, they could have, uh, instead of the Vindicator, they could have had uh, a little bit more control in, in their comp, maybe a little bit more DPS, could have done something a little bit different there. Uh, but that's also just a personal take on the Vindicator. I know some people really like the ship, uh, but I just don't think in this format it's any better than a Hyperion for its point cost. It's true. We are allowed to have favorites, but then it does actually come down to what is the most cost-effective options that these teams have. Uh, Mazera, what are your general comments on that match we just watched then? I mean, I was like scrambling to look up uh, the EVA turret chart because I was questioning what the Vindicator was doing. And he was burning back and the people were starting to ask if he was using rays. It was in fact a blaster Vindicator, but it was just in a really poor position. So it did allow the uh, only need two comes team to, to move in and get stuff done before the Vindicator actually became a real threat. So that was a bit of a problem there. And since, like, uh, as Fia was mentioning, the, the Vindicator has a lot of points, so you need to utilize those points. 
And uh, I just don't think they got enough out of that Vindicator. We were also discussing whether he was whipping someone or not. Uh, maybe the game was sparked, or maybe he just didn't whip people that much as we expected the Vindicator to do, because why else would you bring a Vindicator? So there's a little bit these few details that uh, like, uh, I'd like to know from the team, like uh, what happened, because just seems like things went wrong. The Vindicator didn't do what the Vindicator was supposed to do, and that cost them heavily. Well, I'm not too sure if it was some sort of bug because, you know, when we saw the, the Vindicator was on top of the Orc, um, it was at five meters a second, so it was completely slowed down. But uh, in the general play as well, I do agree with you. Um, but and again, uh, it's easy for us to sit back here and just judge the teams, not too sure what goes through their heads. But then again, hindsight is twenty twenty as well. Yeah, the, the, uh, the Orc Navy was definitely slow as moving like five meters per second. But I didn't see any web animations. Like I was looking at yeah. it neither in space or on the uh, interface. So it's really a big mystery here. And one thing we should also keep in mind is that the uh, only need two comps for the team are extremely good execution. So whether this indicator worked or not, oh, uh, um, I still have to oh. uh, still have to remember that uh, these guys are up against a tough team. The two comp team know what they're doing. I think my connection might be getting a bit weak, but hopefully I can power through it. Um, I do just want to touch a bit on the bands fear that we'll be seeing now for game six coming up, which is going to be Novak versus Unchained. Um, we've seen like kind of usual bands appearing here, the anti-drones watching, getting rid of the battleships. But an interesting band we're actually seeing from Unchained Alliance is the Paladin. Um, any comments on that band? Why it would be showing up there? So I'm not super hot on the Paladin or any Marauder in this format. I mean, obviously Bastion module is broken on TQ, but you can't fit it in a tournament because it would actually just break the entire thing. Um, so n knowing that, I think what it boils down to is they just don't want to see projection. Uh, they banned out uh, Abaddon and Paladin, and then they banned out Hyperion, so they don't want to see the Brawl. Uh, either. Um, so really just taking kind of these laser battleships that are decently good at projection, uh, other than the uh, APOC Navy, which kind of no one flies, uh, and the Hyperion, which is really good at brawling, out of the table, it really leaves your battleship options really to only RHML platforms, which is something that I expect, if there are battleships from Unchained, they're going to have to move towards that uh, against Novak. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, um, unfortunately, I did miss most of what I was saying because my internet connection was dropping there, but hopefully the audience took some wonderful insight into what you uh, have been saying there. Uh, Mazir, um, I think this is the first time we're actually seeing that Ishtar ban. Normally people are going for the Gila, but the Gila is banned as well. Uh, we saw a VNI, i it's little brother, well, not really brother, I think they're actually quite different ships, but another reason, why would people be banning the Ishtar as well, Mazir? Well, it is like one of the strongest uh, armor drone ships in uh, the format. It is a uh, heavy assault cruiser. I have the Tech Two resist. It has the uh, ADC, and it has a big drone bay to to get some really strong drones. And I believe like a uh, faction uh, uh, damage drones. They are allowed, not sentries, but the, the normal heavy drones are allowed. So it can project a lot of damage and still have like uh, some mid slots for utility. Uh, as well as high slots that can be nudes, uh, like we saw earlier. If you put them into a new setup, they can be really strong, but any drone setup or control armor setups can shine with the uh, ish time. And actually, speaking about the nudes, like you were mentioning, Amazir, uh, we did see in the previous game, um, where I think it was the previous game with the curse, I, um, if you're wrong, where it's just absolute nude dominance occurring with uh, Geddon, um, the curse, uh, you might be using those high slots of V and I just absolutely being a nuisance to everyone that needs capacitor there. Um, and it's just showing the power of nuisance in general and making use of those utility highs. So uh, let's see what the teams can do to combat these situations when they get into melee brawls. But with that being said, we do have the teams taking the arena now. So we'll be seeing game six coming up here with no vacancies versus unchained alliance. Um, and with that, we'll actually be heading to the arena back with our commentating pair of if it hook and chair. How's it going everyone? Uh, we have Novak and Unchained here and Unchained is, is bringing a double Widow comp, Shield Widows at that, 
and also bringing a stork, Vassy, Merlin, Slasher, and Condor. Now, CSM, Elect, Ithaca, uh, uh, Ithaca Hawk, can you please tell me what Novak is bringing? Novak, are br uh, they're wormholes, so they're bringing a Lishak, of course, uh, with an Aeneas. Three Blackbirds, Pontifex and Heretic. They are going full in on the jams here, as is um, the Unchained Alliance side. This could be a very slow match, depending how these jams go. It uh, looks like those Blackbirds immediately choosing to jam the Widows, which is a quick choice. They can lock quicker, and they can slap those jams straight on them and potentially remove them from uh, being any use at all whatsoever. And the fact that we're seeing no jams landing from the other side implies that both those widows got jammed first time. Uh, Catalia missed a uh, captain of the Unchained Alliance team. Also known as Sea Speed Aurora, by the way. Those are also shield widows, which is not very common. And I believe they're also torts. Yeah, I mean, this this whole comp uh, on both sides is really rather special, uh, to be honest. Um, I mean, the fact that there's three blackbirds when the points go up uh, one by one by one <laughs> is very interesting. Also, if you jam, if everybody <laughs> jams from the blackbirds, then every, every blackbird can still be shot because you can still shoot the ships that's locking you. So um, it's not entirely sure what's going on here, but one of those blackbirds, Razor, uh, taking a lot of damage. Colin also taking damage. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate if you jam a widow, the widow can still shoot you. Indeed, man. I, I honestly, the blackbirds here probably should just focus on the bassy. Put all your gems on the bassies and hope you can just shoot the widows. It's yeah, kind of... I mean, this is this is the potential to be one of those matches where someone's about to die and then a jam lands in the lodgy and then everyone's fine again. Uh, at the moment, though, uh, unchained the lines. Uh, they're not concerned. They have um, had a tiny little bit of damage tickled uh, into their shields uh, of one of their widows. Um, and I mean, these are armor blackbirds as well. So the fact they've lost their shields isn't really much of a concern. Uh, bed the boss uh, in that Oneros there, keeping them very much alive. Um, I suspect, and this is just a theory, but we might be in for another eight minutes, seven seconds of not very much. This is also, this is just like a cold war of ECM jams. It's who gets bored of uh, jamming everybody uh, first. Condor there of Halp House Spaceship taking a little bit of damage. Uh, he's going to have to be careful. He is a ship that can be alphaed off uh, by that Lashak uh, if he gets into the wrong position. Uh, in terms of positioning, uh, it looks like no vacancy is still sort of keeping themselves a little bit far away from uh, Unchained. The Heretic is the one that's sort of extending the most, trying to get tackle on that Condor, um, but uh, still not a huge amount going on. Uh, who oh, the Lashak's puck is this? Taking a bit of damage from the Lashak, but uh, I don't think he should be worried just yet. He's, the Lashak's just spooling on him. They need to switch gems on him soon. I don't know if they really can with him. Blackbirds, it's probably stopping them from switching their gems much. Yeah, I mean, that Basilisk in theory could just be uh, permachammed by having three Blackbirds slapping a jam on him. If you've never flown jams in a tournament format, you basically put one on, see if it lands, put two on, see if it lands, put three on, see if it lands. If any of them land, then you put your extra jams onto other ships. So you have a jam primary, probably the Basilisk. If he's jammed, then you've got three or four other jams to slap onto other ships, and potentially you can jam everybody. But you always make sure you get that primary first. Uh, so it's a little bit of juggling them and making sure that you get them landing. Uh, as it happens, it looks like one has not landed on the Basilisk, and he's able to rep who the puck is this straight back up to half, half shields. Um, wow, what an exciting match. <laughs> it's, uh, it's exciting. Nail-biting even. Um, the heretic's taking very small amount of damage, and yeah, well, this out. is the first time we've seen triple blackbird this tournament, though. And yep. it's I, I don't it's know how well it would one. do in other comps, but I mean, in this comp, it's doing well. I mean, the Lashak is super expensive as well. It's twenty uh, thirty five points, and then the blackbirds because they've taken three, um, are up pointed every time they take another one. So there's a lot of points into one. One DPS ship, really, and three ECM ships. Um, I mean, CCP Aurora slash Catalia Mist, uh, obviously uh, one of the people responsible for bringing back the Alliance tournament. The Slash is to make sure everyone Slash's has a good show. So he is. Uh, oh, but, maybe. Uh, oh, is he going to go down? No. So I see some reps landing. Oh, he still might go down. It depends if uh, the Widows get a jam off on whatever is killing that Slasher or if the Basilisk can get reps onto him. It depends how extended he is as well. They're quite close together. I suspect the fact that he's not repping him though means that he cannot get it onto him right now Ooh, it's going to be close they are really far off the beacon as well actually almost 100 kilometers so they need to be careful they don't start boundarying uh oh the slasher into hull the windows the, the widow's going in the hole 
Oh my no, God, some jams good. have failed somewhere. Who the puck is this getting chunked into Hull? They're going to have to let that slasher die and try and save that Widow. If they lose the Widow, that is a huge chunk of points. It's 32 points off the field. Oh, into low Hull. This could be it. The Lashak of Pinky Line doing damage. Like 5% Hull left in this Widow. Can he do it? Oh, it's all stopped. Where's the damage? Where's the damage? Oh no, the reps are landing. Who the puck is this? Saved in 2%. 2% hull. And we are back to where we started yet again. Uh, someone kill a ship, please. I think the Lashak got jammed. Uh, at the very the end. The oh Lashak got jammed. Uh, the Slasher. The Slasher's what? down. This game will have an end. This game will finish. It will not be a tie. It could be 2-0, but at least there is a ship that has died. We always guarantee explosions here. Uh, on the Anger 5 games. But who the puck is this? Has started taking damage yet again. The Lashak is back on him. He is unjammed. This is an unsurmountable lead of two points right now for uh, the Unchained Alliance. It is, it is who quite the puck is this? Needs to stop trying to jam the Lashak, by the way. If he's jamming that Lashak, then he is a dumbo. Because if he jams the Lashak, he can be shot by the Lashak. He needs to just ignore that Lashak, pretend it doesn't exist, and jam things like the Neros and uh, other ships on the field. If he makes a single jam on that Lashak, he's going to die. It looks like right now he's just jamming the Blackbirds, thankfully, but so the Lashak's back on him, and it's just going to be a, you know, until the Lashak spools, which it's doing right now, and he's oh, going the down. Spools, yeah, the spool is up right now into low hull yet again. Uh, 8% shield, even 2% shield. This could be it for who the puck is this. There you go. Widow down. And that's probably going to be the start of a snowball effect uh, now because the jams have just been cut in half for the Unchained Alliance. Uh, the Merlin of Davak uh, now taking chunks as well as just not enough uh, jams left to jam that. The Shack, the Aeneros, the Pontifex, and the Heretic. So some DPS will still be trickling through. Uh, Orion could probably keep that Merlin alive if he doesn't get jammed, but I don't think that Widow will be able to, to jam break all three. 34 points. Yeah, That's... These were two such very unique comps brought to the field. I'm honestly, it was boring at first, but now it's just getting exciting to be able to see these two different play styles clash. I mean, because you bring in the armor control and into, I guess, cruise. Were they cruise? Did we ever confirm if they're a cruise or were. Yeah, they're cruise. I'm not sure if they're a cruise or not. They must be, depending on where they're sitting. They're sitting quite far away. Uh, but, I mean, you called these comps unique. Uh, that is certainly our word to describe them. They are certainly comps, and we definitely did just witness a match. Um, but it is cleanup now, uh, as Jed Stark and the Widow is dropping into low shield. Uh, Orion uh, in that basilisk probably now has all of the jams just pointed straight at him um, to try and keep him from being able to rep uh, that Widow whatsoever. He is burning still out. He's burning out to 100 kilometers. He might be going for the Edge of Glory. Uh, Catalia missed uh, in the stork is taking some damage as well. Yeah, clean up. If only had a local M MJD. Could chaos burn if, very uh, if we allowed them in these tournaments. Absolute chaos. Uh, could be fun though. Uh, Jed Stark going to go down. Going to join his fellow. Um, who the puck is this? Widow pilot in the graveyard. Uh, along with the rest of his team, it's going to be a clean sweep, 100 points to zero for no vacancies um, in this particular matchup. Was quite something. I mean, oh, look, Orion's trying to stay alive. He's trying to pro prolong this as much as possible. Uh, he wants you to see him be the only person left on his team. Uh, do you think this was just all RNG and that's how Novak won? Or do you think their comp is just better than the Double Widows? I mean, it's a bit of both. I don't particularly like either of these comps, I'm not going to lie. Um, but I think three sets of jams versus two sets of jams, especially when those jams are also your DPS, is a slightly uh, less risky tactic. That the shack, once it gets on, it doesn't need a huge amount of time to break things. It does a huge amount of DPS. And plus the newts and everything too. It's such good utility for what it is. Exactly. He probably has utility smart bombs in there to clear off any rep bots, um, which makes, of course, things a little bit harder for uh, any, any team that's surviving on rep bots alone, which is a good way to survive through jams, of course. Man, Ryan really just not wanting to go down. He, if he survives another 26 seconds, he will actually survive the match, and it won't be 100-0. to zero. Um, However, might have just 
casters cursed this because uh, he started to go down really quick now. Oh, yep, there he and there he goes. 15 seconds, and he would have survived to the end of the match, but he could not do it. It was 15 seconds too long. Uh, so that is at 100 to 0, no vacancies, taking the dub Unchained Alliance uh, back to the drawing board to find out how many more ECM ships they can bring in one comp. Uh, and we will hand that over to the studio. Welcome back, everyone. Well done to No Vacancies taking uh, that win, even though it was a bit of a grind. Uh, unfortunately, that's what we see when we have uh, two rather well-spread-out ECM teams match up against each other. Uh, fear to start off, I think one of the big things that I noticed right at the start of the bat was the weapon systems that those widows were using were actually cruises, cruise missiles. Do you have any comments on that? Well, first of all, I want to say this with all love. Never change, Kat. Uh, forever remember the Brave Tournament team in our hearts. Uh, if, for those who don't know, Katal, you missed. Now captain of Unchained Alliance was at one point the Brave Tournament team captain. Uh, and she did a whole lot as CCP Aurora when she moved on to do that to bring the tournaments back. So never change. Uh, bring in the ECM comps as you are known to do. Um, I, You know, cruise missiles, I think, in this format aren't necessarily the greatest weapon system. I think if you're going to go for a Widow, something like an RHML, or if you want to meme on people, do something like Torps, probably a little bit better, because the Widow doesn't have a whole lot of DPS. It only has, I think, four or five low slots, something like that. Um, so if you're going for a Shield Widow, you don't have a whole lot in the tank in terms of the actual damage mods. Um, still, uh, and on top of that, kind of cruise application without paint is not particularly good. So... You know, I think situationally up against something that's like a BC core, like a shield BC core comp, it could work. But unfortunately, that's just not where the meta is of the tournament right now. And you're also spending 50 points on two ships in your tournament. They better be bringing something uh, special, but you don't have a whole lot of gems because they are shield widows. You don't have a whole lot of DPS because they are widows and not something like an SNI. Uh, and so when you're bringing this kind of combination of things back in, and then all of a sudden you see triple blackbird well it's like yeah you ban them and force them to pick a lashak but now they have more jams on the table not just because they're triple blackbird but because they're armor blackbirds then you're going to bring in your two widows had some great insights there um mazir actually speaking now about that do you think pretty much unchained just put themselves in a defensive where there wasn't really a way for them to win that match they were just trying to stall and see how much time they could buy almost uh, they're definitely fighting an uphill battle. They are having two DPS ships only, like yeah, the two uh, cruise uh, widows, and they were up against a team with three uh, blackbirds. So normally, I would not like someone to bring three blackbirds. In this situation, they have like three ships they could split uh, these uh, cruise widows between. So it's hard for them to really kill anything. They could just keep jamming the widows, like one uh, widow can jam by one blackbird, one by the other, and then the third blackbird just ready to take over when one of the blackbirds were going down. So they could not do anything offensively. Uh, they were just uh, locked in the defense. And we saw that they couldn't do any real play. And it was just a matter of time for, for the uh, Leshek to burn down something. And uh, and that's what we saw. Like they were just waiting for the jams to land so they could uh, kill uh, the widows. And once the first one went down, uh, it was just game over for no way. Um, unfortunately, it's there, but uh, the Shaq's showing how, how dominant it can be, even as the only really DPS side still absolutely owning there um but fear no i'm not sure if this is some brave uh tendencies throw uh, being shown here but <laughs> slasher condor murden uh what use were they giving there uh what it boils down to is you spend 50 points on battleships you have to fill out with a really cheap low end um you it's just a matter of points. It's just a matter of points. You don't have the points to spare on that comp, especially because you're taking T2 uh, Cruiser Logi with you to actually make anything uh, else happen um, it, with your low end. So you just take the T1 uh, Cruiser, sorry, T1 Frigates in there and hope you tackle something. Um, I would have liked to see a Vigil uh, at some point in that comp. I think if you're going Cruises, you should at least have a Paint uh, on your team, but uh that just is what it is and uh obviously the better comp one 
Definitely. So um, I, I do still love seeing a bit of a variety being played in there, but uh, quite a drastic difference in comps there now. Um, Bazir, speaking back now to Novak's team with the the Shack, do you think it's still a risky play having pretty much all your DPS eggs in one basket with the Shack with that kind of comp? Uh, yeah, I would be extremely hesitant with doing it. Uh, and I find like having a third Blackbird is really pushing it a bit. Uh, uh, because like they have this uh, point system, so when you bring two of the same type, it, they're going to cost more, and then adding in the third one is going to be even more. So these black bursts are super expensive on top of the expensive uh, Le Shack. So I think for that comp, I would like drop out one uh, black bird and then bring something else, like either um, I, either I can't really remember the points, but if you could get a hack for those points or like. Uh, uh, or a bit mag or something, just so I have a little bit more damage to, to be able to handle something, something more mobile damage. Like alternatively, could bring another uh, e warship. Uh, could maybe bring in this uh, situation uh, Celestis as it uh, at uh, sensor damage they reduce the uh, or rather increase the amount of time it takes for someone to lock back. So it can be a way to amplify the effect I of your jams. I do have to cut you off here, unfortunately, because we do have the teams already uh, ready to take place. So we'll be going to game seven, Ultramarines versus Kiting Onichan, and we'll be having Murray and Wingnut commentate for us in the arena. G'day there, mates. Welcome, we got Ultramarines versus Kiting Onichan. And we have two very interesting comps here. I'm, of course, joined by Murray. Murray, mate, start us through. Look, look what we've got here, tell us. The kiting team has delivered us fake news as they have all worked in at zero with Scorpion Navy issue, Raven Navy issue, Raven as their battleship core and a couple of small ships to round it out. No logistics on their side as well. Meanwhile, on the other side, we've got a much more traditional comp on this day with the double Blackbird and the battleship and the Vindicator. And the interesting thing as well is that while they did warp in at zero with this, uh, this comp for kiting only chant, they're all crews. So they warped to zero and decide, you know what, we're just not going to move for the entire rest of the match. We're just going to sit here. Of course, their frigates don't agree. The frigates are absolutely screaming in. I wish to see MJDs from two of the three battleships. Though those MJDs, one's going towards the target, one's going off in a random direction. Okay. And a Blackbird of Melinda being primary first. Yeah, I'm not sure what the strategy is with how the battleships are getting set up, but they've now managed to spread themselves all over the place as they're well, putting damage in on the Blackbird. They have no logi, so their defense is distance. And since they're all crews, they can be wherever they want on the grid. So this could be a plan to just stay far away from that Vindicator. And speaking of, where is the Vindicator going today? Uh, who's he going to pick? Actually, he's currently... Yeah, he just nuked, uh... <laughs> he nuked the Flycatcher. <laughs> yeah, the Flycatcher's gone, and so far it doesn't seem like they've managed to actually take out this Blackbird. Now, That's usually when you see these kind of propless comps, there's some kind of, like, tinker involved with cap transfers and big reps or something. But because they've MJD'd away from each other, it doesn't seem to be the case, unless the Raven of Takuya just had a very unfortunate bump on the MJD. Nope, it looks like it was intended because they're all scattered in different directions. We've got two of them to get kind of together. The third one's a mile away. I suspect their plan is to play for distance and try and use crews to apply. But at the moment, that Guardian is very much keeping the Blackbird of Melinda alive. That being said, I just finished saying that, and Melinda is now taking some pretty hefty damage. Yeah, it might have been some unlucky jam cycles uh, as Melinda and Stoish need to try and s juggle jams to make sure that they both stay alive. And it looks like Stoish did manage to piss them all off because the damage is now all swapped yep. onto him. I, I don't like to say it, but well done uh, ECM piloting there. But now Stoish is being primed, and also the Lodge Joints are still on Melinda at the moment. You see some of the Lodge Joints finally, uh, finally coming off, but Stoish is sitting rather low. No, nope, never mind. Uh, Tiger caught him. He's safe. Meanwhile, yeah. the support wing for kiting is just getting obliterated. This this Vindicator is having such a fun day with this. Well, the, the Raptor has bailed. The Navy Hookbill is sitting in a duel with another uh, ship over there, but the Vindicator is now getting on top of the Raven of Takuya. He sees it out of position and figures this is where he can put his heavy damage. Oh yeah, and the fact that the Takuya's now being caught by this Vindicator is not good news. That Vindicator is about to apply an unbelievable amount of damage, and they don't forget, these battleships of, Scorp of Scorpion Raven and Raven Navy have no logis, so it's all going to be self-tank and prey. 
They still can't yeah. kill things. They're still Dude. bouncing between these two blackbirds. They've switched back over to Melinda. And they're both sitting at about half armor, but they're really not getting a whole lot done with it. Meanwhile, the Tormentor wins his duel with the Caldari Navy hook build, probably with a bit of help from his friends, as he takes him out, and that leaves only the Raptor left as support for these battleships. Just here, hook build versus Tormentor. I, th I thought we were faction warfare for a second there. But looking at Takuya at the moment, he's starting to go through his shield. I think these guys are like max buffer fit, but he might have an XLS. We'll have to wait and see. They still can't break the ECM. Yeah, they're really struggling to get anything done here. The none, Neither of the Blackbirds has even really dipped particularly low. They've gotten them to maybe half, maybe a little bit more. But always the Garden is able to keep them up because with three cruise ships, you really just don't have that much damage. I wonder how it feels to be the, uh, the frigate pilots for kiting Oni Chan. Like, here's our plan, guys. We're going to jump our battleships to the other side of the arena, and you're all just going to die. <laughs> because there's not much more they can do. I think they've been getting chased around. And getting, they actually got caught by an org, Navy, and Tormentor. So, not having a good day. And Takuya now starting to go into low shields. Not looking good. Yeah, the Vindicator's doing what he's supposed to do. Although, even with the rest of his team now coming over, it's not really going to speed up the process a whole much more. They've got an AUG Navy issue for a bit of extra damage, but that's really about it. Sorry, I'm just On effects isn't doing much, Tormentor's not doing much, so this will be a slow grind to finish off these three battleships. I'm enjoying the little things in life, like the Tormentor that came screaming over to the Raven. Instead of trying to orbit him, he just bumped him as hard as he could. Whoa, Raven Navy, did he just boundary? Yes, he did. Oh, yeah, they're boundaring, they're MJDing off. They've they decided said, that they've had enough of this. They've had enough of trying to break this Blackbird and Rook and have uh, decided that they're going to live nice and far away outside the boundary, retire to the farm, and think about bringing a comp that maybe has some logistics. And funny enough, Taku is the last one alive. He wants to MJT, but the Vindicator's not letting him, so Vindicator's going to get this kill. Bravo to uh, Ultramarines. They didn't come in their traditional blue, but I guess they'll have to do Bravo, and we'll send it back to the studio to see what they think. And welcome back, everyone. We see Ultramarines taking the match there. Uh, unfortunately, kiting Onichan during the kiting part, but not really um, delivering much punch for a logiless comp. Um, Dujak, now that you're joining us here, what do you kind of feel about these logiless comps? I think we've seen before, um, I'm not too sure who it was, but we saw another logiless comp with the uh, Nighthawks and Jackdaws also kind of falling apart here with the missiles. What do these logiless comps actually need to win a match? I think they need to care about having high damage per point and also high projection. They're definitely going to lose ships. And that's why the last time we saw effective logiless comps, they were backed up by a core of um, assault battle cruisers with um, oracles doing a lot of the heavy lifting when they were both two points cheaper than they are now and not suffering from the points stacking penalty. I think that if you're taking three pretty heavily tanked shield cruise ships, you are really hoping that you're going up against something like um, a reasonably low-tanked kiting um, shield missile setup, uh, like Orthrus's, uh, and uh, maybe even that Nighthawk comp, with or without Largy. Very good. Um, uh, Mazir, now, also, do you think the no Largy is suffering because there's a reduced pilot uh, count in the Angry Games versus something like the AT, as in there's not enough actual ships to make it work? Or is it just that this meta has changed? Uh, I think it's the latter that the meta has changed. And I think what they were trying to achieve with this setup was doing a Sudo Tinker setup. We saw them in the last uh, Alliance tournament that the uh, Hydro team, I believe, actually did successfully use uh, the Sudo Tinkers. But in this situation, like being up against a setup with the ECM that just forced them to target chains so that they couldn't really bring something down and that in the end it just doesn't work out for this setup. You need to you had like this throwaway tackle wing that you need to trade for something and they didn't get anything out of it. So they lost and once the windy got a top of the ship and they got stranded, there's nothing they could do. 
Yeah. Uh, at this point, I do also just want to remind Twitch chat that we do have the channel points running. And if you would like to get a copy of the rules that these players are actually using, uh, use the command exclamation point rules. And you're welcome to see the brackets and the times by using the command exclamation mark brackets. All one word. Um, Zhujek, we've been making some comments about cruisers and cruise winners in particular. Um, when it comes to these heavy missile setups, is it really just rapids or nothing? We had some cruise ship uh, comps that we liked in the Alliance tournament where there is more support to go with it. You can you can have your cruises and you can have your large and you can have some paints, especially bonus paints, to help apply them. And what we liked was in a in a meta of somewhat rock, paper, scissors where uh, some uh, teams will go away from you, some teams will come towards you. The cruise teams had a lot of projection, almost infinite range, and good tank, so that they'd win out against kiting cops. And to um, to reply to Masir's comment, in the previous rules of some of the previous tournaments, you were allowed to have pseudo-tinkers because uh, remote cap transfers were something that you could take on your ships. In the Anger Games 5, you cannot take it except for on your logistics, so you can actually give people a cap like that. In the in the Alliance tournament, we actually tried uh, Triple Golem, uh, and that was really hard to break. And somebody actually did play it in that tournament, but here, with the MJDs and stuff, I, I think that they were just hoping to lead people on a goose chase for 100 kilometers and kill something before their opponents arrived. Uh, Mazir, uh, so before we see the teams taking the arena in a while here, uh, what other general comments do you then have about the uh, previous match? Uh, like I think like uh, Dujek mentioned, like uh, having the paints, uh, bonus the target painters for a uh, crew setups is uh, like a crucial thing. And they had like these figured wings, so they could maybe have traded one of these ships for a uh, for a big kill, so they had these stronger paints, but I don't think it would been enough in this situation as as these uh, ECM ships kind of had countered the, the setup there. And then also quickly, Mazer, you have touched on it with Dujek elaborating a tiny bit more, but for the audience, what actually is a tanker setup? So back in the old days, you could fit the remote um, capacitor transfer on the, all your ships, and you could also bring it a lot of your uh, take free cruisers, and they were extremely tanky, and especially when you had entire setup feeding them capacitor. So I had like this strong setup with really tanky ships, and they're just extremely hard to break because they kept feeding uh, capacitor to the uh, take free uh, cruiser, and uh, they they could in return repair your ships. Uh, but they are also extremely immobile, so you had like this little shell, this little ball of ships just sitting at some point and then uh, tanking everything thrown at them and then throwing out some damage and there was like, extremely slow matches to watch because they could just tank so much and then slowly kill something and eventually they got uh, kind of banned out in the meta like uh, the have transfers restrictions the restrictions of the, the tech freak uh, lots of cruisers and uh, things like that Fantastic explanation. One of the most scary things, and I think one of the reasons we don't see the cruise uh, logistics module being allowed on T3 cruisers these days as well. Uh, with that, we do have the teams ready for game eight. We're going to be seeing Esports Petopia versus Polaris Mercenary Alliance. And with that, we'll be heading back to the arena with a commentary pair of Wingnut and Murray. Hey again, mates. How you boys doing? We got Esports Topi versus Polaris Mercenary Alliance, and uh, we're seeing more ECM. And I'm not a fan. I don't like ECM. But uh, hey, Murray, you still here, buddy? Yeah, I'm here. And it's there's a couple of weird ships sitting on the other side too. You've got the Apocalypse, which we haven't seen yet today. You've got the Stratios, which we haven't seen yet today. So while they've got this kind of armor comp set up with a couple of different ships, it's hard to see what their strategy is overall. And they've chosen some unusual ships to get to it. Yeah, both teams playing their entirely own meta here right now. So we've got, uh, for Polaris Mercenary Alliance, we've got Widow, Guardian, Oracle, Navy Org, Druga, Pontifex, Blackbird. Then for Esports Potopo, we have the APOC, as you said. Navy Brudix, Rodiva, Stratios, Bedmac, Navy Orc, and Draugr. So 
both going armor, but that's pretty much the only thing that's the same. That is, this is a crazy idea. Yeah, and I'm looking at the ships now. It looks like we've got some rails on the Brudix, at least. The Brudix Navy issue. So I think this team of Esports Potopia may actually be looking to play this a little more mid-range, trying to keep their distance, get some good picks on certain ships before they can go in. This potentially can be very useful for them as there's some squishy targets on the other side in terms of the Blackbird, in terms of the Oracle, that they might be able to snipe at range and give themselves an early advantage. Yep, and uh, just waiting for one of the guys, unfortunately, had to, uh, one of the characters to drop out, so he's just getting back in. But this is an interesting setup of stuff for sure. So the Blackbird Widow is going to be definitely just more ECM, which is just disgusting. I'm sorry. But Dr Drone Stratios in that, what looks to be a full gun comp. Why is that Stratios there? Does, he, does Stratios even have guns? Hold on, have a look. Yeah, he's got guns fitted. At least one of them. Yeah, okay. This this guy's playing a different meta to me. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> he's got like a one gun Stratios. No, he he has uh looks like a full set of guns, maybe bar one. Um I'm not actually sure what model that is. I don't know, that's where the guns are. I'm an idiot. I was looking I was looking at the wrong thing. I thought there was turret mounts back to, uh, oh my god. Okay, I think those that. are dual light beat or dual oh gosh, I don't even know what they're called because nobody uses them. But the Quad smallest version of beams, which actually don't have a great Quad deal of beam. range, but do have decent tracking. Yeah, and they Quad cost very beam. little fitting room. See, those, those, like I said, those are quad light beam lasers. I've used them before on a, on a Navy Harbinger. They're very interesting to use. Yeah, well, that'll be the first time in a long time that somebody's brought those guns out, but... Given the rest of the ships that they've brought, I'm not surprised that they're mixing it up a little bit as they look to get into this match here with five seconds before start. Yep, yep. Quality beams are such a fun weapon system because they, they're cool beams, but they're more like blasters. <laughs> and the match is underway. Now we see Esports Utopia at the very least feinting a bit of an aggressive move as they move forward a little bit to put damage in on the Draugr. Oh yeah, Draco getting pounded immediately, and the, it looks like the Widow and the Blackbird getting their rightly deserved damage. Yeah, they they've moved in to try and get this Blackbird. The Draugr is having to be very careful. He's sitting actually much farther back than the rest of his team, trying to keep as much damage off of himself as possible. And the Widow is actually taking some big chunks as well as they move in towards them. I'm surprised. I guess they're just shooting the Widow because they're jammed by it. Uh, Pretty much. Otherwise, they'd be just keeping the damage on the Blackbird. Pretty much just the same for both of them. You have, you have to kill them to kill anything else, because if you could, you'd go for the Oracle. Get rid of the DPS as fast as humanly possible. But Or even the Guardian. They have no choice in the matter. They have to shoot two ECM ships that are being repped by one of the best Logi ships in the game. So, But that Widow is actually he's taking an appreciable amount of damage. Yeah, and there hasn't really been much screen of anything, so Esports Potopia has been able to get in uh, to put in as close range damage as they can on these ECM ships, try and burn them down. The Vedmax taking some damage, but unless they are consistently able to break the Rediva spool, there's not a ton of damage bar the Oracle on the other side. So they're going to need to make sure that they can knock that Rediva offline with jams, which is very difficult when the Blackbird's about to die. Yep, and there goes the Blackbird. And absolutely nothing tried to screen this APOC, and so the APOC is now sitting with Conflag directly on the Widow. So that Widow is also on a short time span. Meanwhile, it looks like the Vedmac on the other side is actually starting to get hit. I believe that's a Navy Org and a few other ships chasing him down. Yep, Navy Org and... Nope, just Navy Org, never mind. <laughs> just This Navy Org is just going to solo him, I guess. Yeah, he's doing... So far, it's been pretty clean from Esports Potopia. Nothing too big in terms of mistakes, as the rest of their DPS looks to get on zero on this Widow, and it is dropping fast. That's what happens when you let a an Amarian battleship with uh, with uh, what's the word? Conflag sit right on your face. Meanwhile, the Brutix Navy is also there, joining in some blast damage. And now even the even the even the Shreyas wants part of this. Widow goes down, and that there is the last of their ECM. So all we've got left now for DPS is the Oracle, an Org Navy, and Draugr. The Pontage is there for the boost, and the Guardian is there crying. Yeah, this Oracle is just getting deleted as they start to look to move through the Oracle and towards the Guardian, which is making a break for that MJD beacon. 
Yep, and that's the unfortunate circumstances with oracles. They are great DPS, but really terrible at everything else. So if you haven't killed things, it's like bringing a bomb. If you haven't killed something with it before it dies, you've kind of wasted the points. You've done something wrong. Now, the Guardian is tackled. Damage is going on. And with that, it looks like this match is going to be a pretty clean victory for Esports Potopia. There's not a lot of damage left on the other side in order to really generate any plays that can get them back in the match. Last slide! And I agree with the uh, residents of War in chat. So tired of seeing ECM. Well, don't worry, mate. ECM lost this round. Wait, never mind. They got ECM drones. I ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> I will say one thing to note is I think Polaris were struggling a little bit with where their jam priority needed to be. Because if you looked at the jams, particularly once the Blackbird was down, the Widow still had his jams almost entirely on DPS, despite the fact he is DPS primary. Those jams aren't actually helping him at all. All they're doing is kind of making him kind of this taunt, which was nice, but what they really needed was to try and get some ships off field on the other side in order to keep that Widow alive, because the Widow is going to be primary either way. And so, unfortunately, because they were unable to get those jams on other things, it just made the match all that much harder. I have another answer as well. Like, if they're going to have a jamming ship in the Widow, use your Navy Org to stop their apocalypse from face-hugging you. Yeah, the Draugr has now dropped. The Rediva has actually taken a little bit of damage, but he oh, should be pretty that. fine as the Aug Navy, which is only the really thing left shooting him, is dead, leaving just the Pontifex alive for Polaris. Someone ring the gong, that's another ship down. <laughs> and the Pontifex, I believe, is uh, going for the edge of glory. Uh, is he? No, yeah, he might be trying to be cheeky. Ah, ah, well. Uh, he is determined to make this match last just a little bit longer. I don't think he's burning out of the arena because he's got, yeah, he's got an angle to him. Yeah, he's trying but to show He is how just going to waste everyone's wide. time. <laughs> he's showing up quick so he can get Oh, no, he messed up. <laughs> Explode. What? Beautiful. So Goodbye. Absolute clean match for esports, and we're going to head back to the studio and see what they think. And welcome back. Uh, Esports of Tokyo taking the win there. Uh, ECM getting a bit of a dunk uh, for once. Um, Mazer, any opening comments for um, kind of a normal match, I'd say? Well, like uh, one point I really want to make about this is like when you're bringing an ECM setup, you're sacrificing uh, either damage or control, or sometimes you both you know, to bring these ECM. So you need to use the ECM to. Uh, uh, as a replacement for, for the things you uh, sacrificed. In this case, the blue team didn't really have that much screening. And on the other hand, the red team had a lot of ships that could just burn in and uh, do stuff. So when they, they lost the uh, Blackbird, just like, so much stuff rushing in and they failed to uh, save the Blackbird by using the Widow to jam it off. And, and then as uh, the commentators were mentioning, uh, once the Blackbird went down, we still saw the Widow jamming uh, DPS chips on top of it. So they need to be really good at uh, knowing how to use the ECM to uh, to control the field, because if you don't, then it's not worth that much. And the chat was like talking about like uh, ECM being boring to see, and uh, this is a case where you're seeing that people fail to really utilize ECM. It's, it's actually not a, a brain dead thing to use. It, takes the right target calling, and uh, I think they, they messed up a bit here by not utilizing DCM to compensate for the lack of their screening. Uh, that's a very good point you raise there. ECM not being you know, just a brain dead tactic, you can just you know assign it to your high slots and go F1 to F8 and then go. Uh, I think it does involve a bit more skill behind it in the sense of not just knowing your own ship, but knowing every ship on grid, what's a threat, listening to where the threats are coming, listening to who's tackled, where it needs to apply, and also managing the cycles. Because um, I know uh, from experience, one of the good things to do is actually take your jammers on order cycle uh, off so that you manually have to start them again. Because one thing you hate to do in an ECM ship is jam something and then jam it again for no reason, and now you have two jams stuck there. Um, Jujak, do you got any comments there? 
my first question is I'm not sure why you take a guardian if you don't have to take a guardian. None of the armor logistics ships were banned, and although it has good abilities in terms of rep power, it is sacrificing so much by only having two mids and being a little bit difficult to deal with cap-wise that I guess I just don't understand that choice in particular. Not that it would really change the match much, but can either of you explain this to me? I'm not too sure. Um, it's probably just a pattern preference skill, uh, maybe thinking they need to uh, reapply those reps or over, who knows, maybe they thought they were going to take use of that energy transfer bonus. Um, but we won't be lingering too much on this right now as we do have a short break coming up here soon. Um, but I do want to ask Mazir, with a Hyperion band, um, why would you, they, a team, be looking to take an APOC over an Abaddon? I love the APOC. I, I think that it's a very underrated ship. And the the one answer to that question is obviously projection. If you don't think that you're going to lose your battleship because of the lack of tank bonus, the APOC does do less paper damage than in the Baden, but it has a range bonus and a tracking bonus. And that team was definitely set up to kill smaller ships the ability to tackle something have the apoc anywhere between 20 and 70 kilometers off and still be able to do a respectable amount of damage and then just quickly mazir um any comments from you before we head over to our break and uh, not that i can really think of like uh, maybe that stratus was a little bit out of a choice uh, having a drone ship and then fitting guns on it anyways and just going with it. It did turn out to work, but I think like maybe I would have brought another uh, armor, uh, pilot armor cruiser instead of that. But in the end, so, it did uh, work out for them. So, so kudos to them. So some fantastic input from our panel here from Mazir and Jujek. We'll be probably seeing them later throughout the day again. Uh, but with that, we are halfway through our first day here at the Fifth Angry Games. Uh, we're going to be taking a short break. We'll be returning uh, for the game nine of Snuffed Out versus Fancy Pants later. That match should be kicking off at 10 past. Um, but stream will likely be starting a few minutes again before that, and we'll be back here with us in the studio. So until then, everyone, go get yourselves drinks and be ready for some action-packed arena fun here soon again.
And welcome back, everyone, after that short break. Um, we're right here in the thick of it as uh, Twitch is able to vote on the hot topic of cats versus dogs, myself being a cat man. Um, but next match, we're actually going to be seeing uh, Snuffed Out versus Fancy Pants. Snuffed Out has actually been a late entry into the team, uh, into a late entry into the tournament, uh, with Waffles having to unfortunately drop out, taking their spot. So hopefully Snuffed Out have managed to get some uh, practice in there. But I'm joined here in the studio right now by DTM135 and Radicos the Datacos. Um, DTM, how, do you have any experience with tournaments yourself? I mean, I've ran a lot of tournaments, and I've flown in, I want to say, one of the EVNT tournaments last year or the year before. Uh, my primary experience, though, being running them, and this has been quite a joy to be a part of. Like, just to take a moment, I do this almost every tournament. I'm never going to stop doing it. Thank you so much to the guys on the back end who are running this stuff. Thank you so much, Soth, Dirk, Rain, everybody who's, you know, taking time out of their day, who isn't up here on camera getting the glorious lights. Um, you guys, you guys literally make this stuff function and we love you for it. Absolutely. Some fantastic shout outs to the people who do deserve it. Um, and to anyone we didn't mention, we're sorry, but we, we love you all. Uh, Radicos, something we haven't seen at all, well, at least I haven't seen yet, but I'm wondering what, if there's opinion on it is bombers. Um, do you think bombers still actually have a place here right now? Uh, yeah, in certain comps, they definitely can. Um, you know, in the AT, it's a little better because you can have like, you know, eight or nine other pilots and sneak in a couple bombers in there, which, are, you know, equate to a lot of DPS. Um, so and they're pretty effective with some E-War as well. Um, you know, they can put a guidance disruptor or tracking disruptor on it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, you know, uh, points to do it there but here it's it's harder because you have less ships and so one ship difference can really make the difference so and teams to really have to capitalize on those slots so um uh, that's always something to take into account you got um ships uh, you got restrictions on how many ships you can take you got restrictions on points but then you also confined by how many and trying to fill the slots up in the most efficient way to cover all your bases of damage logistics e-war tackle um there's a lot of things and some teams having to forsake them as we've seen the no logic comps actually suffering for it with the limited slots available to them um not able to capitalize too much as mentioned by, by commentators before same amount of logistics less amount of dps um we do actually have the teams taking the arena right now we're going to be seeing again snuffed out one of our late entries into the tournament versus fancy pants and we will actually be heading over to the uh, commentator pair here of moderator and fear to the arena now Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the arena after the break. My name is Finnick, or sorry, Fear. Sorry, using my other caster name. Uh, Fear Vina, joined by Moderator. And on the red side, we have Snuffed Out. They've taken a Tempest Fleet issue, a Zarm, an Ikatursa, an ANI, a Draugr, a Vengeance, and a Mauler. Ma? Hey, we see that Fancy on? Pants has chosen to bring a Zarm, a Sentinel, Draugr, Magus, Vexer, Devoter, and a Lashak going for the uh, triangle-heavy um, battleship. Yep, two Zarms, two battleships. This time around, a little bit more DPS on the side of Fancy Pants Thunderdome. But you got Nikatursa. That's a fun one to see. A lot more spool time uh, than something like a Vedmac, but at the same time has... Uh, more overall DPS there, so you're trading DPS from the high end into the mid range of the comp. Rat to start this off, what are your thoughts? Um, I like the choice of Fancy Pants bringing the Magus for the Lynx, notably not really seeing um, a whole lot of... Um, well, we do have the Draugr for the Lynx on uh, the snuffed out side, rather, but immediately um, seeing a horde of uh, warriors being deployed by um, Fancy Pants getting sent after um the vengeance getting sent after the drugger trying to affect those link ships uh, we see snuff choosing to burn in a bit and um fancy pants just holding back for now yeah dps on nuke michael right now don't know if that's necessarily coming from the lashak though as he uh is quite a bit away nuke michael actually trying to 
burn away from this Lushak at the moment. Uh, the Battle of Battleships, the one that takes the lead, uh, is the Lushak eventually. I've not seen if this is an AC or an Artie Zach, maybe, or Artie uh, TFI moderator. Uh, were you able to glean that information? Yeah, we have um, definitely uh, 800 auto cannons, and that Lushak is spooling all of its damage onto Nuke Michael. Um, Nuke now choosing to um, start to engage in close range on the Lushak, wanting to really get in range of hail. Um, the Sentinel doing um, an, just an annoying job of harassing with those tracking disruptors, getting um, some warriors chasing after it and getting nuded out at the moment, just putting pressure onto the Zarn. Sentinel's a speedy boy, though, and he's only got two warriors. As a cloud of uh, medium armor maintenance spots move over towards the Sentinel uh, to keep him alive. Meanwhile, this Vengeance taking a little bit of damage as the battleships have just started to duke it out. Uh, Nuke, though, has not quite gone for uh, Katarina at the moment, still trying to kite away from this Lashak, keep him in maze on range. But Leroy in the Sentinel gets dropped down very low, and he's our first blood. Yeah, we didn't see that there was any sort of, um, you know, jams onto the Zarm that the just Sentinel was just too far away. Um, the Zarm, too far away as well, and, you know, you will eventually go down to Warriors. That's going to be major for Snuff, not having that new pressure, not having that tracking disruption pressure. Um, and we see that Fancy Pants has been doing generally a better job of applying their, um, you know, um, tackle and some of the range control, but just being way out of position with the Sentinel. Yeah, this Draugr also caught by the Vengeance. Now, he will be able to kill the Vengeance first, but there's even more coming up on top of him. The other Draugr, uh, this one of Matt Riley, now on top of Zarthal, and I don't think Zarthal was long for the world either. Uh, snuffed out? I mean, they were knocked out originally in the qualifiers, but now look to be winning their first match of the main event. Yeah, we see that the dra that the Snuff Draugr and the Mauler were sitting on top of the uh, Hostile Draugr. Um, Matt, Nuke Michael, and the Lashak just trading um, blows in the center of the arena with that E-War, and now Snuff's going on to the Vexer. I'm just really liking Snuff's target calling much better than Fancy Pants's. Yeah, getting this low end off the table. I mean, you have a Draugr, you have an ANI, uh, you've got Vengeance, who is uh, kind of uh tanky as well uh doing as much as they can they are onto this vexer as mentioned the zarm pulling range on him maybe looking for another target as the molar burns and meanwhile the little shack now right on top of the tempest fleet issue of nuke michael but with these arm reps it's actually really freaking hard for the little shack to actually break him as they finally lose uh another ship that one being the vexer yeah so we do see the vexer drop and um that was a full new vexer so that's going to be a lot of um you know, E-War pressure that really gets off of the um, Snuff uh, front line and the tackle ships. We can see that Snuff is just really stabilized uh, with their vengeance, was getting low, but uh, Nuke Michael taking was taking some chip damage. We see that Infinitas X has now lost all of his shield and is taking damage from the spooled up uh, Lashak. But, I mean, the Zarm is going to be able to kite away from that Lashak spool, and it will eventually break. Uh, we see that Snuff choosing to go after the Magus, which catches no reps, gets instantly alphaed. Um, just Snuff really just out playing out target calling right now. Yeah, this Zarm currently, though, uh, scrams by the Devoter. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, seeing a Hick in the tournament play. We did see Hicks, obviously, throughout Alliance Open a little bit uh, in Alliance Tournament. But this time around, going for the Devoter, getting this long range scrammed on the Zarm. But he's now being chased by this Muller Vengeance and ANI. Yeah, unfortunately for uh, Fancy Pants, scramming a Zarm that has an afterburner does really um, essentially nothing for you. Um, they're putting some, you know, hostile combat drones on top of the Zarm, but the Zarm is perfectly happy to just completely burn out of range of this Lashak that is spooling at maximum range. Um, meanwhile, the Tempest Fleet issue is just sitting on top of that Lashak with the web and the grappler, and it's going nowhere quickly. Yeah, just keeping him down as the DPS still onto this Devoter. Now, it is a Hick. It has very, very tiny SIG, especially if he's got a, a dual prop on it, which I wouldn't be surprised considering it's a Devoter. But at the same time, eventually you're going to get this trig damage on top of you. Uh, the Draugr, if I can take a look as to where he is on the map, uh, is in fact on top of him right now as well. So this Devoter, not long for the world, though he has some Zarm reps on him. So this actually might be a little bit longer uh, as rear entry still. Uh, actually, the Draugr's on rear entry. This Zarmast is tackled uh, by this Vengeance of Draugr now. 
That is not something you want to see. Trig damage onto rear entry. They're going to go for the Logi trade between Infinitas and rear entry, but there isn't a whole lot left on the table uh, for Fancy Pants Thunderdome. Yeah, so what eventually happened for Fancy Pants is you only have three real ships left. Um, and eventually you're going to get caught by the, the Vengeance, the Draugr. Um, Vengeance, Draugr, not exactly the fastest ships, but they're considerably faster than a Logi. And um, given what we see on grid, um, even if Infinitas X does break first to the Lishak damage, um, it probably won't matter much. Rear Entry will die shortly thereafter. And with uh, the Katursa, Tempest Fleet issue, Augur Navy issue, and a Draugr, um, you're going to be able to outtrade a Devoter and a Lashak with no real difficulty. Indeed. In fact, Infinitas, I mean, he's staying alive still. Uh, this Lashak has been just grappled down this entire time. Uh, looks like he might actually be out of maze on range now. So uh, Infinitas actually should stay alive because he's only got a Devoter on him at the moment. And Devoter, uh, I mean, it does some damage. It is a hick after all but uh, not nearly enough without this Lashak spooling up. Rear entry dipping into structure now. He will fall, and it looks like Snuffed are about to get ready for a 100-0 victory. Yeah, I mean, I thought that Infinitas X might have uh, died, but it looks like um, the Mauler did a very good job of screening the Devoter um, off of the Zarm. The Zarm was eventually able to just afterburner out of um, range, and Infinitas X is going to live to win. As we see, he has um, one flight of heavy and one flight of medium rep bots that was keeping him alive that entire time. Um, just for Snuff, that team that got knocked out in the feeders um, due to, I would say, a lot of poor execution and some target calling, they're doing much, much better uh, in the main event. Indeed, they are. And now they're finally on to this Lashak. Uh, and the Lashak has decided, oh, I'm going to get some damage on this Draugr. Uh, that might have actually been Smart Bomb damage. Yeah, it is Smart Bomb damage on the Draugr, so it doesn't really do a whole lot more. Infinitas going to stay alive through this, and with all this damage on the Lashak, I mean, you've got a uh, AC Tempest Fleet issue, plus an Ekaterisa, plus an ANI, plus a Draugr. There is not a whole lot you can do on that Lashak. Yeah, I mean, uh, we see that um, not a ton of teams have been bringing have been bringing Tempest Fleet issues, but it definitely does bring those two utility uh, highs to bear. It's got a lot of low slots. They are um, still very, very tanky with those um, faction, um, you know, stats to their overall HP. Um, they're fairly bricky. We don't see them a lot, but Snuff has been able to kind of make use of what is sort of slightly an off-meta pick and really make it work in this round. Down goes the Lashak. And now all eyes are on to the Devoter. Uh, still under five minutes remaining in the match. Actually, under two minutes remaining in the match. They should be able to take him down and make it a 100-0 victory. Either way, pretty much flawless uh, from the side of Snuffed Out. Yeah, um, not a whole lot more to say there other than that um, Snuff um, side did a very good job initially of harassing the uh, support wing and that Sentinel of Reroy just got 100 kilometers away from your Lodgy, and uh, once that tracking disruption, once that new pressure really got off of the uh, Snuff support wing, they were able to really um, press the advantage and carry that. I'm sure the desk will have plenty to say about that, so for myself and Fear, we'll send it back to them. And we're back here. Um, Snuff showing an absolutely fantastic performance there, being the late entry that they were. So uh, likely just experience putting them through there, because I'm not sure how much practice time they actually had on such short notice. Uh, but DTM, well, I don't think we really saw it in the fray uh, much there, right up to the end. I really feel the unsung hero in that match was just what the TFI was doing that entire match. Any comments on that? Yeah, the Tempest Fleet issue is definitely a really strong ship. I think our commentators were talking about it. Lots of utility coming from that ship, as well as damage. It's also worth mentioning that a lot of snuff pilots themselves have a boatload of experience on these two Mimitar faction battleships. It was it was really nice seeing experienced pilots in these ships doing things that experienced pilots would do. Being able to get in there, keep the Lashak locked down so it can't get on top of stuff and apply. Meanwhile, you have that Icky going around, you have that A&I going around doing a lot of damage damage absolutely pulling off exactly what it needs to in order to you know actually have this sort of flawless victory we saw come out of snuff 
fantastic there. And Ithaca, um, now that you're here back with us, right at the start of the match, uh, we saw a Sentinel. Um, so first off, why would someone be looking to take a Sentinel over something like the Crucifier, the T1 Frigate version? Um, and what would that uh, Sentinel actually be looking to do during that match? Sentinel's actually a really good um, <clears throat> sneaky little ship to get up on top of a logistics cruiser and apply a lot of, a surprising amount of new pressure. You might think, hey, it's just a frigate, but it really can screw up a logistics cruiser um, if it gets on top of one um, almost unabated. And it is very fast, so it can do that. Uh, worth shouting out in that last match, Matt Riley uh, in Snuff, uh, he was piloting the Draugr. He basically um, hunted down the Sentinel. Uh, so obviously his team came in, they saw that, they recognized that threat, uh, and Matt was able to um, scoot around the outside of the arena and catch up to that Sentinel himself, which is a bit of a mistake from a Sentinel pilot. Uh, and of course, Draugr on top of a Sentinel uh, is not going to be a good day for the Sentinel pilot, and thus it wasn't, and he died pretty quickly. But um, Sentinel, as well as the Newt, obviously it does have um, some pretty strong uh, tracking slash guidance disruptors, uh, but most people would pick it because of the Newt's. Yeah, uh, very good that you actually pointed out there about the Draugr pilot, and I think that's a good example of... Um... Uh, how not just clicking approach, but actually, you know, double clicking in space and manually controlling your ship allows you to properly intercept and chase a target. Because normally you end up in quite an arc which slows you down if you just click approach. But the Draugr doing a fantastic job chasing down the Sentinel. Also made the Sentinel had to keep at full speed the entire time while his own Repbots are chasing him. So those Repbots would every now and then lag behind and huge delay on getting those reps out there uh but otherwise as well here dtm uh i don't think we've seen a hick yet so as uh, uh, the the voters showing up um what are teams actually looking to do with a devo with once again the bubble's not really being in play there so what use is it bringing i mean these are really incredibly tanky ships at the end of the day depending on which model you bring it's also going to do a fair bit of dps i've seen a devoter used as a solo ship before on tq and we're kind of seeing how that plays into this sort of setting i would argue though um one of the the benefits that you might not know i don't know specifically about the rules in this tournament but focus disruption scripts and focus scrambling scripts do give you a lot more range on a scram than you would get out of a normal t2 scram all of that though is to go back to these are still incredibly tanky ships they still are able to do some dps so bringing it as a front line might you might you might be sacking you know sacrificing a little bit of uh dps compared to a sack but you do end up in a situation where you do have an incredibly tanky cruiser on the grid some fantastic input there from DTM and Ithaca. Uh, we do have the teams ready in the arena here for game 10. We're going to be seeing Spectre Fleet versus Rusty Hyena's team. And if that, we'll actually be heading back to the arena, back with Moderator and Fear. Thank you very much. My name is Fear, joined by Moderator. And on the red side of the arena, we have Spectre Fleet with Lashak, Curse, Ashamu, Vedmak, Draugr, Thalia, and Deacon. Uh, moderator is still muted. I see that we have a pair of Paladins, Pontifex, Thalia, Deacon, Vengeance, Skybreaker, for the Rusty Hyenas team. Um, talk me through kind of the, these Paladins and what they really bring for their points. Uh, I mean, same like any other uh, Abaddon or something of that nature. It is uh, lots of damage and uh, quite a bit of projection on the lasers. We are off the start of the match, though, and this Vengeance moving back. Paladin's moving forward as the Ash move Vedmak and Draugr continue to move in. We might actually just see a flat-out brawl between this dual battleship versus single battleship comp. Yeah, we see that the Ashimu is trying to go for the back line immediately. I would not be surprised if we see um, webs get onto the... Deacon and Thalia in short order, um, trying to hold down those Logi frigs and try to kill them immediately. We do see um, the Deacon now getting primary webs onto the Deacon, um, neutralization onto the Deacon, Draugr um, just diving the back line. So we're probably going to see a Deacon die pretty quickly. Meanwhile, um, the Paladin taking a good amount of uh, damage as we see Newt onto the Lashak and the Vedmak, um, just all out brawl, like you were saying. Yeah, I mean, it, it is what it is. You see two Paladins and a Lashak. The two Paladins will out-damage the Lashak uh, eventually, but at the same time, we're talking about Logi Frigs and who actually has the better job at trading these Logi Frigs out. We see this Draugr on the Milton doing a lot of damage, although he is uh, taking a bit of damage himself. The Milton is falling, and Stray is not even in the armor yet. 
Yeah, I mean, that's going just to be an Ashimu on your back line is going to do that. Once, yeah, you know, we have one Deacon down, so, you know, the kind of the old adage is once you have your first Lodgy Frig, the other one is going to be in short order. We see Zed's motorcycle and his Thalia already dropping into about um, half armor. He's going to die in another 10 seconds or so here. Um, so the Paladins are really going to have to break something quickly, and we see that right now. Uh, the curse is primary as the Thalia drops. Yeah, and something we didn't really mention is Curse Ashimu has a lot of newt power, and these paladins don't have any newt resistance because they can't bring the Bastion module, which means that uh, they're going to be capping for dear life. Curse Ashimu, very effective uh, neutralization ships, especially for cruisers. They are getting a bit of damage onto them, but they still have their Logi frigates alive, and they will keep him alive for the time being, as it looks like this Draugr is moving on to more of the low end, uh, might be moving towards this Pontifex now. Yeah, we're seeing that um, one of the Thalias uh, is going to be the primary, but um, despite Webb's on top of uh, Ned, he's still going 300 right now, and, and we see the curse drop surprisingly um, quickly. Yeah, I mean, still, dual paladins, I got a couple of good shots on you. Uh, it's not like laser tracking isn't good. Uh, or isn't great if it's pulses, right? But at the same time, they're going to lose their pawn effects. The links down is going to be pretty important for these paladins, especially as they are breaking to the Slashak with no Logi frigates available uh, to them. Yeah, we see the pawn effects of Tylo into Hull, and um, in about a minute or so, once those links fall off, it's going to be really bad for the paladin of uh, Scorch Selet, who is just kind of holding on with about a quarter of his armor remaining. Yeah, and obviously you have the rep bonus on the Paladin, which is nice to have, but at the same time, you're not going to outrun a Lashak, outrun a Lashak unless you have a Bastion module and some uh, A-type reppers on there. And uh, with, or sorry, X-type reppers, they're battleships. Uh, with that, though, they're going to try to trade onto this Vedmac. He's down into about a third armor right now, but he's going to try to get out of the way of these higher projection uh, laser ships. Yeah, and Scorch is going to drop here in a second. Virian is fully spooled on top of him. Um, Nisa is switching off to the Vednak, but now that he's lost his Paladin buddy, I don't think they're going to break them, and it should be pretty clean from here on out for Spectre Fleet. Uh, one Paladin, a um, lot of points, a lot of damage, but not enough to really break um, against a Valley and a Deacon supporting them. Uh, it's also just a lot of points to put towards two battleships. I feel like Dual Abaddon does almost the same amount of DPS for a whole lot less and is still very tanky. Um, so Rusty Hyenas, I mean, they're known for bringing kind of off-the-wall comps that we don't necessarily see as meta uh, throughout the opens and, and throughout the uh, play-in stage. This time around, didn't quite work up against the Slashak comp uh, from Spectre Fleet, and it looks like they're going to take this with only losing the single ship. Yeah, and just my uh, partner here is alluding to, um, you bring 66 points and you just don't really have a lot left. Uh, we saw that Spectre Fleet used to choose to bring, you know, a Lashak and really a Rogger, a Shimu Curse, a lot more neutralization, was able to get those newts, was able to pressure out um, those Logi Frigs who had no support in their backline, immediately got ran down, beaten up, taken all their lunch money, and um, Nasat now down into Hull, um, continuing to keep gaming Kyler in about half armor. But um, now that Nasat's dead, it's going to be pretty clean as the Skybreaker is dropping now and uh, only a vengeance remains. Yeah, it's unfortunate for Rusty High and his team, but they have another shot. This is double elimination after all. And Spectre Fleet move on through the upper bracket. This vengeance, the last member of his team alive. Uh, is already tackled down, and he will accept his fate with grace. That's all for this match, and that's all for me for today. So we're going to send this back to the desk and see what they have to say about Rusty Hyenas versus Spectre Fleet. Oh, and welcome back, everyone. Uh, DTM isn't with us right now, but uh, while Ithaca is sorting out uh, your lovely channel points that you've hopefully been earning right now, uh, personally, myself, I was excited to just see two paladins show up here right now, but unfortunately, being a bit underperformed, I think the combination of just all those newts uh, and the curse... Um, there as well was just absolutely shutting them down. Um, Ithaca, as your uh, 
Cat Companion is hogging the spotlight there. Any comments on the double paladins? Uh, you're muted as well. Um, uh, joining the moderator crew. Oh god, I, I'm joining <laughs> mods. I'm sorry, it's a catching. I think the commentator said it really well. Um, it's a lot of points. It's 66 points uh, in two ships, uh, whereas the Abaddons can probably do it slightly better uh, in terms of point efficiency. Uh, the Paladin, obviously, a very strong ship. I think maybe they were hoping to see uh, a logistics cruiser, which they could uh, apply damage to from across the field with those Paladins. But uh, imagine as soon as they saw those logistics frigates, they were just like, oh, crap, this is not going to go well. I, I think also, as um, uh, Mazira is pointing out in our chat as well, not really having the tools to deal with it. Uh, nothing like, uh, ironically, being called uh, Rasi Ahinas, but not having something like a Hyena. Um, and I think this might come back to just the Angry Games format, where you have to be a lot more concise and dedicated on what your comp's going to do, being able to cover more ground with a lot less uh, slots to put that in. Uh, DTM, I'm not sure if you actually had eyes on that match, but what do you feel of the combination of the Ashimu and the Curse uh, on the Spectre Fleet side? I think the Shimu is one of those ships that brings a boatload of utility. That being said, it is a very weak ship because it tries to do too many things at once and it doesn't have the big, strong, like, base of a ship that the Balgorn does. And it's not fighting in frigates like a, um, like the, I can't remember what the frigate Blood Raider is. But that being said, the core, it, it, and it's not fighting in a frigate size like a core is. So, in a Shimu, in a 1v1 situation, can be very dangerous. I think that in a, in a format like this, I'd much rather see two curses, um, uh, the, 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 or, or two Ashimas. I'd rather bring two of the same ship. It's easier when they're operating sort of at the same speed in the same space. Um, Unfortunately, really teams do have, have to webs. pay a premium for bringing duplicates of the same ship, yeah. though. Yeah. Uh, but you are now speaking, um, just DTM there again, on the doing, trying to do too much at the same time. Um, but the curse is kind of doing the same, isn't it? It's almost doing three to four rolls at once. It, it depends. It, that's spread out um, a little better with its slot layout, I would argue. Um, especially if you're going into an armor tank comp or something like that. If you're doing a shield tank comp, you essentially only can newt with the curse. Um, so I think in that regard, it's a, it's a little better. It, it also newts at a much further range than the Ashimu does. So, and let, like I said, unless you really need the webs from the Ashimu, I'm not a huge fan of it. And if guys speaking now about it being armor comps, we're actually a skybreaker there. Um, having the ridiculous shield bonus to resistance, but actually being present in an armor comp, I think this is one of the few times we've seen the Eden comp ships actually featuring. What are teams looking to actually gain from fielding something like a skybreaker? Uh, it's a really good little tanky tackle ship. Um, it saw a lot of use during the Alliance Open because it was that was a tournament sponsored by Eden comp, so they were just one point. Um, but if you look at something like the Punisher, which is four points in this tournament, uh, because it's quite useful, a Skybreaker is kind of like a cheaper version of the Punisher. Like you can, you, you don't really care about the the Zappy Edencom gun. Uh, you, you care about the fact that it can get in about things. It's fast, and then when it gets on there, it's hard to remove. So that's why a team might be likely to use them. Mm -hmm. um, very true. Also, like still just uh, having a fantastic slot there on being super fast. Um, but also, uh, Ithaca, how, how does exactly do the Vorton projector weapons work? That the Eden uh, They work building? through wizardry and witchcraft. Uh, essentially, you target uh, someone that you don't like, and you turn on the uh, Vorton projector, and then it sends a beam of uh, energy to that ship, which then bounces around, uh, and it hits anything nearby. Uh, so really good for clearing drones, potentially. Uh, you can shoot one drone in a rep cloud, and it goes ping to all of them. Um, it doesn't do the most DPS because that is split across all those things, but you can slowly whittle down, uh, uh, say, drones, for example, or a small fleet and really make it hard uh, for the, the logistics to catch up. Oh, fantastic there. Um, it just exp uh, All these weapon systems, varied weapon systems, I think we've now seen all these systems, except for bombs. We haven't seen bombs yet. Uh, DTM, is there a reason teams might not actually be making use of bombs besides not bringing bombers? I, I I mean bombs just 
it's it's got to be <laughs> i've done a lot of solo bombing in my life and i've killed a lot of hecates that have run towards me with their micro on but you just can't expect pilots in this sort of situation to not know how to like hit f2 and shut off their micro uh, it, it's just really the truth when it comes down to it these guys are practicing and someone's gonna call that the bomb going out so you're really just hoping that you're really just hoping that someone gets caught with their pants down and, you know, ends up taking a whole lot of damage. Other than that, the only, like, decent, the only decent sort of, you know, target on the grid is the battleship for the bombs. Um, another way that you might be able to do it is maybe going for drones, but that goes back to a whole thing of, like, are bombers worth the points at the end of the day? And Especially I Especially mean, now if they eat in common the grid, on the grid as well. A absolutely. A, a Skybreaker can do a lot of... I mean, uh, you know, Ithaca said it earlier. I don't know if he was talking about his cat or his ship, but, you know, some things, you know, they just latch on and they're really hard to get rid of. It's really just sort of about situationally what sort of fight you're going into and what are the rule sets you're going into, you know? Anger Games has a little bit of a different rule set than other tournaments. So it's it's you're going to see a little bit of different decisions made. I know um, when we were practicing for the even T tournament, we were doing I think it was the open. We were doing a lot of bombers. We constantly had bombers on grid, but that's just not what we're seeing in this tournament because it's what the FCs and theory crafters have decided isn't worth it. And uh, speaking now about the rules, um, chat, you are more than welcome to use the chat commands of exclamation point rules or ex uh, to get a copy of the rules that the pilots are actually fighting under or exclamation point brackets or one word to just see uh, when the teams will be placing, when they'll be fighting, the times they're being on the brackets as well. And also speaking about the teams, um, so the prizes that the teams are fighting for right now is the teams would have paid a plex entry, which goes into a pool. Uh, CCP are also contributing an uh, amount of plex. I'm not sure if we've determined that amount yet, uh, but they'll also be putting forth victory skins that we saw present from the last AT. So while there won't be any special prize ships to fight for here, teams will still be able to get those sweet, sweet victory skins and hopefully a boatload amount of plex to the top uh, uh, players. Um, so for game 11, which will be happening soon, we're going to be seeing Nasty Story versus Paid Actors. So... If we're just going to go over the bands here again, I'm seeing something interesting coming here from Nasty Story, which I haven't seen other teams do yet, Ithaca. Um, Nasty Story has actually banned the Slepner. Um, Why are we seeing this command ship banned now here for the first time, maybe? Um, it's a very powerful tournament ship, very powerful link ship as well. Um, I think the Slepner is the one that gets the bonus to link power, not link range. Um, so it's pretty much the strongest boost you can get on the field in this format. It's also just a really, really good ship. It's really uh, versatile. It can be artillery as part of maybe like a, a fly killer. Uh, it can be AC and just do an absolute buttload of DPS. Um, and obviously, uh, in, a t in, a, in any tournament format, links are actually surprisingly important. Sometimes we see teams, maybe they have a little bit less experience. They don't bring links. So they don't bring a, 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 a battle cruiser. They bring something else and then they go oh maybe do we need a stork to bring links no actually we'll bring something for more dps and they just forget how important uh link ships can be so by banning out the slepnir you're actually making a lot of comps slightly compromised you might force them to bring say a claymore instead if you know they happen to fly a comp that they use the slepnir in and by bringing the claymore the links might have a longer range but they're less powerful yeah links also like coming back to those slots again when we're talking about the you know, having to cover all your bases, damage, E-War, Tackle, um, Logi, um, and then, uh, as you say, as well, Links, another thing being added. But we do have the teams actually present in the arena now. So we'll be going to Game 11 with a nasty story uh, versus paid actors with our commentator pair of Jujek and Alec. This is going to be a bloody battle. We have a lot of damage, a lot of projection, a lot of application on each one of these teams. Paid actors having brought a Bargus to double Orthrus, Cerberus, Bifrost, and a pair of Largy Frigates. Meanwhile, a nasty story has brought a Claymore, Scimitar, also a pair of Orthruses, a Stork, and a pair of Jackdaws. Very interesting, somewhat similar comps here. I think paid actors going for a little bit more projection, whereas it looks like uh, a nasty story maybe aiming for that low end. 
Yeah, I think that uh, paid actors are going to maybe try for an Orthrus here. Maybe the Scimitar. Like, the Bargus wants to get some use out of its higher damage, but worse application weapons, if it can. Yeah, it'll really want to try to get that Scimitar tackled somehow before it starts putting its clip into the Simi. If it's not tackled, I think the Simi can kite it out. But here we go. We see paid actors diving in. Meanwhile... Uh, Nasty started taking a more measured approach. They're kind of fanning out a little bit. The Bargus can go in because it's not going to be able to... They're going for the Scimitar. The oh, Scimitar yeah, is in half shields. He's painted. He's not hard tackled yet, but his tank is failing. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, and He's they're going to trade him for a Kirin. Like, even if the Kirin dies, like, this is such a great start for paid actors. You You could not ask for a better start. They had a very clear game plan. They committed 100% diving their team in, and they're reaping the benefits now with another ship down. That Jackdaw is toast, probably very lightly tanked, uh, more of a tackle roll, I would imagine. And yeah, now the, the second Jackdaw is going down. Uh, the Jackdaws in these comps also bring some of the utility. They'll probably have paints on them to help with some of the application otherwise. Um, and they're the going to lose all of that. Meanwhile, the Kirin of Rezalau is dropping, but they're even if they, to your point earlier, even if they lose this Kirin here, it's just not going to be enough. They've lost almost half their team already. Yeah, I, I like, even if they lose the Scalpel here, who has nobody to rep them, it, they're going to trade it for another Orthrus. The, the Bargus is going to be reloading his clip, and that clip will be suitable to kill at least two ships with. Absolutely. And if they lose both the Orthruses, the Claymore... Not exactly known for its high DPS output. The Claymore I mean, has changed can, a lot it. as a ship as well in the you, recent times. You you can configure it for damage, but you know, in the great pantheon of Eve ships, would I pick a Claymore to carry my team to victory by itself? Not really. That Stork is going to contribute something, but not tons. And now we see this Orthrus dipping into armor, dipping into structure, and he's down. The second one already being worked on. Yeah, this is a cleanup lap now. A lot, all of the ships here are fast, so like if somebody tries to run away, they will just get chased down. I think a nasty story. Of their their comp is a little strange. Uh, you know, looking at it compared to paid actors, you almost kind of wonder where all their points went. I think stacking so many ships together is just not a a good economic use of points. The desk touched on this earlier. You have to pay a premium to bring two Orthrus, pay a premium to bring two Jackdaws. And it may and have been just the edge that paid actors needed. In a situation where you are, um, where you already are this fast, and you are, like, a, a Scimitar is going to die to the missiles, but so is an Osprey. So some of the ship, the comps that we've seen earlier today have gone for cheaper large sheet setups because if your opponent is trying to kill you with the blasters they're just not going to regardless of how many points you've paid for it and um the repping power isn't that different it's, it's significant but a lot of the point in flying extremely application heavy missile setups is killing the tackle before you get to them and then running away but now this Stork of Indway, I'm going to go with, is standing by himself against a pretty fearsome team. His DPS, if he even has any missiles fitted, which is not guaranteed, is not going to be enough to break through the tank in this Orthrus. He is continuing to burst just to apply those links to himself. He's chasing, or excuse me, he's kiting away from these drones, which are chasing him, as are the other cruisers. He's taking some damage, but with six minutes left, you have to feel like it's only a matter of time before his brave efforts come to nothing. In the old days of uh, tournaments actually happening on TQ instead of tournament realms, the paid actors would not be killing the stork. They would be looting the field, hope hoping for some sort of hidden treasure in these wrecks, especially in the era of flagships. Now you just kill people when you can. No point in waiting. Great job, paid actors. Sending it back to the desk.
And we're back uh, with a nasty story taking uh, the win. Uh, I'm here with Ithaca and uh, Murray. Um, Murray, if you're here with us now, um, we've seen a quite a nasty missile versus missile setup. Well, it was looked like a bloody trade. I still think it was quite a um, dominant victory. But what is kind of the flaw of running face first into missiles? Yeah, so, I mean, and you saw this a lot in the last tournament, too, where there were a lot of these kite versus kite setups. And with missiles, because of the delay on damage application, you are looking to kind of bounce around and get the other guy to come in first or find a target of opportunity that gives you the advantage. And Nasty Story just kind of ran straight at them, particularly with their scimitar, which is the exact opposite of that, which means the volleys from the missiles get stacked closer together. You have no way to kite out some of them to mitigate enough damage to keep you alive, and their scimitar just got instantly deleted. Even if they eventually trade Lodgy, at that point, you've lost way too many points, and it's doomed. No, it's very good. You're pretty much just reducing that flight time between each missile volley to zero and just packing them all up on top of you. Um, Ithaca, I know you alluded before when I had your question of the scimitar being quite good at um, evading, um, but I, I think it's probably touching on the same uh, subject uh, question I gave Murray there. Uh, why do you think that scimitar just disappeared so quickly? Uh, I mean, a Bargast serve two or thruces um, is basically set up to headshot things really quickly, uh, specifically logistics cruisers like a scimitar. Uh, that's a lot of front-loaded DPS, assuming they're all rapid heavies and lights. Uh, you're just going to overheat, you're going to turn on your clips, and um, the scimitar is almost certainly not going to be able to get out of range. Um, he can do if he's very quick and flies right out to the edge of the arena and, and really runs away. Um, unfortunately, he chose not to do that. Uh, as I already mentioned, he chose to dive straight in towards them. Probably a missed click. Uh, it's sometimes easy in a tournament si situation to forget to maybe spin the camera in the right direction and kind of panic click and then not realize that you've lost your situational awareness and you're just approaching the enemy, um, which is exactly not what you want to do in a scimitar in this situation. So all that high burst DPS got slightly higher and it just absolutely clapped Papa Benedict in that scimitar. Yeah. Oh. Um, there's a game being clapped. I, I think it did have the opportunity to actually, if it ran in the opposite direction, like you mentioned, like to actually um, outrun or at least the very least delay all those missile volleys coming, maybe making use of an XLASB to just, you know, buy some time at the very least. But um, just getting clapped like that, it, it's waste of points, waste of a slot, just, yeah, um, didn't even burn that much of their clips, unfortunately. Uh, but Murray, um, we saw the Frig Lodgy on the other side here. So it was a T2 Cruiser Lodgy versus the Frig Lodgy. Um, uh, those Frig Lodgy, while they did disappear, they did quite a good job of kind around and mitigating some damage. But when these people are fitting out their Frig Lodgy, uh, what kind of mobility are they looking at? Um, MWDs, ABs, how are these Frig Lodgies actually looking to maneuver themselves around the arena? I, it depends on the matchup, right? So in a lot of control comps, you'll see it be a one MN afterburner so that they can spend more fitting room on tank, more fitting room on reps, because those frigates don't really need to keep up with anybody. You'll see MWD Lodgy frigs a lot of the time in certain kite comps or in certain uh, rush setups where they need to be close by very quickly and they don't expect to live very long. And then we even saw a couple of instances of oversized afterburners on Lodgy Frigs last tournament when missile comps were particularly dominant. Tenement Lodgy Frigates are very good at taking almost no damage from most missiles. And so you saw a few situations where people would take out these Lodgy Frigates and use them as essentially kind of a counter pick if they suspected their opponents were going to bring certain things. That's true. Um... It probably also just comes down to the skill, especially the overprop uh, mods, as you mentioned. Um, something not a lot of people would consider, but uh, definitely giving a bonus. But uh, you have to have a lot more foresight in how your ship's maneuvers around, maneuvers around sorry, um, because of the complete added mass that you get in you. So you become a chunky boy, um, slow to slow down, which is a benefit and a curse at that same time. Um, but now... I think another um, thing that's changed over the recent years here with the tournament setup in general has been how we've been handling bans. Um, I'm not sure if you're uh, aware of how the banning format has actually changed over the years and what we're on now. 
Yeah, so um, in terms of um, the tournaments in general, Alliance tournament used to be uh, A bands, B bands, B bands, A bands, and it used to come up as part of the in-game interface. Uh, you'd be sitting there relaxing in your station, ready to play in a cool tournament, and bam, this drop-down list of every single ship in the game, and all literally them, every single ship, every yeah. single one of them, and then a gigantic red timer counting down from um, one minute. You have to find the ship and ban. You could ban literally anything, even if it wasn't legal. Um, then we went to uh, a three uh, ship ban and then we in alliance open and alliance tournament 17 we had blind banning which is what we've got here so um, we have teams submitting uh, three bands blind they don't see the other team's bands and then if there's any duplicate bands so let's say both teams ban a gila a sletnir and then um, the third one was different then both teams would get a two extra bands uh, so you have a potential for six bands in a single match. Uh, nine bands, sorry. The duplicates plus three each. Duplicate bands. And, and teams are actually made aware of the bands after that first initial three bands round. So they, uh, if duplicates do happen, they do at least know what the duplicate is. Um, uh, but after that, that's it. Uh, no more duplicates on duplicates. Uh, but as the teams will be approaching soon, let's actually take a chance to uh, look at the bands here now, Murray, as we're going to be looking at game 12, which is going to be a rival versus tournament team. Really vague names these people come up with. Um, but we're seeing a actually a double ECM ban on the cruiser side here. And that's something I was actually wondering before here, Murray, is why people might be uh, looking to invest in a Rook for so much more points as it's a recon when almost a Blackbird can do the same job at the further range. So the Rook has a couple of advantages. Um... The most important of them is the tank on the ship. The Rook does benefit from T2 resistances, so while it doesn't necessarily have all that much more buffer, it reacts much better to being wrecked than a Blackbird does. Um, I believe it also has some edges in jam strength as well, although I am not 110% on that. Yeah, I do believe it comes in as a stronger jam, uh, but the Blackbird being able to be further away. So uh, in the past, definitely, uh, I think the you, you, we've seen it before where the Rook can definitely tank even on the low structure. But once again, just being a bit more of a point cost investment here. Um, but Ithaca, we see now an Oracle ban. I'm not sure if the other teams have banned these battle cruisers before, but what is kind of unique about that kind of class of battle cruiser? Uh, it can fit battleship sized guns. So it is a battle cruiser that is considered basically a glass cannon. It does a lot of DPS, um, but it doesn't have very much tank. Uh, of course, they're battleship sized guns, so they don't necessarily apply as well as um, uh, regular sized guns for the ship class. But if you have, say, a couple of oracles, they're not very many points, uh, and they can really uh, wreck larger ships, battleships, and maybe a logistics cruiser if it is webbed or painted. Just a fantastic way to squeeze in that damage with, once again, as we mentioned, uh, beating that dead horse of just the limited amount of slots that these teams have. But speaking about the teams, they are actually uh, present in the arena now. So we will be switching over to our commentator pair here of Dujek and Alec. Welcome back. We are here at the Killing Fields for what is definitely going to be a very, very bloody battle. Both teams warping in at relatively close range. We have tournament team here with a Drekovec, a Neros, Harb Navy, Double Vedmac, Vexer, Heretic, very brawly. And Double Varger. We haven't seen a lot of Vargers. They're backed up by an Osprey, a Moa, a Manticore, a Merlin, and Bifrost. So they have a lot of damage and quite a bit of durability to go with that. Yeah, the Varger, in my opinion, one of the stronger uh, of, of the, you know, compared to the Paladin, which is the other one we see, I think the Paladin has many more weaknesses than the Varger. Varger, one of the strongest overall Marauders you can get. Obviously, they don't have their trademark Bastion module here in the tournament, because that would just break everything, but they are still formidable and very well-rounded battleships, very newt-proof, Good projection, good tracking, and that uh, Vedmac of Liam and Curus is feeling that tracking right now. Yeah, the heretic of uh, Charlie the Chair has uh, put down a wobble as well to kind of slow everyone in the middle of the arena, but uh, the Vargars are just sitting completely still and doing all the damage they can muster. 
I love the use of the Wubble just as a thing, but yeah, the Vargers don't need to go anywhere. They're going to be able to hit every ship on the field here. Meanwhile, the uh, the tournament team are definitely going to need to keep their speed up. I don't know what's going to help. Captain James Sparrow drops that Vebmac getting shredded. Uh, Leah must have been a little too difficult for them to bring down, so they transitioned over and made short work of him. Yeah, the... Um... The arrival team is uh, hoping to keep their Osprey alive for a while longer while they just shred the DPS of um, of their opponents. And uh, Liam is uh, taking damage, getting reps, and uh, hoping that he can actually spool up for a while before he dies. A critical difference between the teams, uh, it seems tournament team has elected to bring Logi drones. There's a big cloud of armor maintenance bots following that Vedmac around. Well, meanwhile... Uh, Arrival has elected to go primarily damage drones with very few light shield maintenance bots on the field. Shield maintenance bots are not that popular, and a lot of those uh, ships don't have the largest drone base either to go with them. Several of the ships being uh, Kaldari ships, and uh, obviously nothing from the Manticore or uh, Merlin either. And well, there's going to be a crucial trade here. here. Yeah, Avery Lewis is Harbinger. He's dropping fast, but meanwhile, Howling Wind, the Lodgy for Arrival, is also dropping. If that Harb can hang on and they can trade it for this Lodgy, that might work out. No, he does drop first. The Osprey's still alive. He's still receiving enough damage that it looks like yeah, he's still going to die. is definitely going to die. Yeah, it looks like his ASB, I, I think he may have had an ASB, it's just run out. He is not repping anything right now. It's just slowly dropping. And there he goes. However, it looks I like guess... they're to trade that for a Vedmac of Liam and Curus is now back under fire, taking an extreme amount of damage, and now they are minus one Harbinger's worth of logistics drones. Yeah, the tournament team can't really do anything about this Manticore either, who's just continuously pounding everyone with damage. As I say that, he is starting to take some shield damage, probably from a few drones, if I had to guess, plus whatever can reach out to him that far. Yeah, we I did say at the start that they're brawly, but it's also important to know the Harb Navy, the Drekovac, they're both combat battle cruisers with a built-in range bonus and pretty good tracking. They probably could have removed that Manticore a lot earlier if they'd wanted to, and now they're starting to work through the low end as the Merlin for arrival also drops. But is it too little too late? Yeah, I mean, tournament team is just going to have to hope that they can keep stuff alive and grind it out now. Like, that Oneros is sitting pretty, and um, as soon as the trig ships get to spool up, they might conceivably just do enough damage to deal with these Vargers slowly. Although I'm a little bit surprised that we're seeing some damage go on to both of them. Yeah, I think that's an odd choice to split damage between the two, especially with Bacardi Desire dipping into very low shields here. Uh, he's starting to pull that back now, but he's definitely under distress. Not yeah, pulling it back majorly. Hair, it could and have been not... a big tank. Yeah, definitely. And don't um, underestimate the damage that Heretic could have added. They do about 300 DPS with rockets. So I think this very is... concerningly the Vexer is also dropping after the Heretic. The Anira is not applying the reps like it should be. Well, either that or the, the uh, Vargers are just putting out so much damage they're cutting right through it. But that Vexer is about to drop and that's going to be a huge loss. And that's presumably a lot of their new power and a big chunk of damage. It's going to be a little bit hard to actually do much with the newts here. The Vargers most certainly do have um, cap boosters, and their guns don't use caps, so... I'm a little bit unsure. I don't think that they'd uh, present enough pressure there, but the Vedmac is slowly dying. Bacardi Desire is slowly undying, as it were. Uh, not so slowly. He just recovered a massive chunk of shields. I yeah. I don't know if they're going to be able to punch through his local reps. Their their uh, one chance would be if he runs out of charges or or you know had hardeners turn off or something. But they can't do the latter now. So they're really banking on him running out of charges, either uh, ancillary shield or cap booster. But it's not going to be a very big window for them to punch through. And even if they do, they have Hansy Babes waiting in the wings. 
also with his own ton of damage, probably enough to get through the Vedmac, who is dropping in perilously low, bleeding structure now. Oh, and the Vedmac yeah. goes down. That Dracovac has not been touched, but now he has lost all his shields in a single shot, and he just does not have the damage to kill these Vargers. And even if the Vargers uh, were Ansulfit and ran out of charges, they probably have set auto reload off in that case so that they can just continue to rep with their cap for as long as it lasts. They have nothing else to spend it on, really. No, and at the rate this Drekovac is dropping, I mean, he might not even be able to get through a damage controlled structure of a battleship like that. And he is dropping quite fast. This Aeneros doing everything he can, but. Between the jams and the, the DPS coming out of this MOA double Varger core, it's just too much. It, it's overwhelming his reps, and the Drekovac, which is a pretty tanky ship in its own right, is just slowly falling. It's going to be a matter of time, but he will die. Uh, and ooh, maybe not so much of a matter of time. I believe he just boundaried. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we call and it the Edge of Glory for him. a reason. There he goes. Bye, guys. <laughs> Good effort from tournament team electing to uh, die on the their own glory. Terms. Yes. <laughs> With that spectacular finish, we hand it back over to the desk. And we're back with Rival taking that wonderful victory. Um, find it interesting, just as we were talking about bombers, uh, I think the uh, Manticore are actually doing quite a bit of work there at the beginning. Murray, I'm not too sure if you feel that the Manticore is actually a valued addition to that team of Rivals. So I actually want to take the conversation in a different direction, a little bit more to the overall day, because this was the first time we've seen a super top-heavy comp win. We've seen a bunch of them so far. We've seen Paladins, we've seen Widows, we've seen other things kind of with this like heavy stack towards battleships, and they've all pretty much been wiped. And this was the first time where we saw the double Varger really actually pull it out and take a win. And so it was interesting to see that the style that hadn't done very well overall uh, actually pulled out a win here. Well, then touching on to that point, um, Ithaca, um, do you feel like the Osprey was actually being a value addition? Because we saw how tanky those Vargas were just on their own there. Uh, would they, Was the Osprey actually buying time maybe a bit of a bait? Or would they have been better off just maybe investing in some more damage to even push that win a bit faster with the Vargas still being able to have a ridiculous self-tank? Uh, I mean, every single rep that lands from the Osprey uh, is worth it, basically. Uh, the the Varger gets a, quite a decent um, resist bonus, so it's easy for it to tank longer uh, with its own local tank combined with the Osprey. Plus, when the, if the damage drops off a little bit, then the Osprey can take over fully. The Varger can maybe reload some sort of XLASB or uh, his cap booster if he's boosting on um, just an XL shield booster instead. Um, the Osprey obviously isn't as good as a Basilisk, but Howling Wind flew it really well. Uh, it's not easy, uh, as Mizir pointed out in uh, our chat, not easy to keep one of those ships alive, especially against a couple of Edmax. Um, but he was able to move around position and basically draw fire for quite a while and allow the, those two Vargas to just do work on the tournament team there. Uh, that's a very good point with the piloting actually coming in, uh, in play there uh, being a very important aspect because I think... Um, a big part of them having that Osprey there is it's putting this big target saying, if you don't shoot me, I'm going to be keeping the rest of the time alive. And at least, you know, like it's one place they're going to be focusing damage. He can focus on kiting, buying as much time as possible, which he did spectacularly. Whereas maybe if they went no Lodgy, um, then tournament team could just kind of shoot whatever they wanted to get the target party where they wanted to. But this way, a rival could kind of put it in their court to say like, you need to shoot this or you can shoot nothing else, pretty much. Um, but I am also interested here, uh, 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 whew, excuse me, uh, Murray, with that MOA that we saw flying around, it's actually a blaster boat, but it's a Kaldari T1 cruiser. What would they be been looking to do with that? With those Vargas, you really just, you are starved for points in terms of filling out your low end. Uh, one of the nice things about the MOA is that it is relatively durable. If you choose to fit it that way, especially if you go undersized on blasters, you can get a lot of tank on it. And so even if it's not necessarily the most impactful ship in and of its own right, it can buy a lot of time for those Vargers to do work. And that seemed to be the general you know, idea behind the comp 
as a whole. And so I think it fit very well into that design philosophy. Yeah, I think just uh, making excellent uh, choices there on how to fill up the slots with those right amount of points. Um, I did see some uh, more interesting jo drone choices there um, coming here from the rival team. So uh, normally teams would uh, look to maybe have a bit more focus on maybe the rep bots lately. We've seen all well, those rep cards going around keeping things up. I saw we think believe we saw a game or much earlier before uh, where it was cat ears where they caught that Rodiva and just a rep card just delaying the inevitable death but buying so much time it uh, gave them the win over the cat ears uh but here i think there was more dps spots featured from the arrival side uh ithaca what are teams maybe considering on what to put in their drone bay when they go into these matches um i mean it depends on the size of the drone bay depends on what your comp is like if you are a drone dps comp then obviously you're gonna bring dps drones because every time you put uh, rep bots you're losing dps uh, a lot of teams will err on the side of rep bots, though, when uh, you're not bonused to DPS. Um, it doesn't really make that much difference. Like the, the drones coming from some ships may only add like 40, 50 DPS. You don't really care about that. But um, if you have a set of rep bots, then you can stick them all on your uh, logi ship. This is really important because um, you can only fit remote reps to one ship in your in your fleet, basically, which will be your logistics ship. So it cannot receive reps from anybody else. The only way it can get reps is either local reps or rep bots. So usually what will happen is everyone brings rep bots, the match starts, everyone launches their rep bots and immediately assigns them onto uh, their logistics cruiser. And then if need be, they can move them around during the match. But the first thing you do is stick them on that logistics cruiser. A very good point, especially with that moving them around. And um, it does unfortunately add another layer of multitasking to teams. Um, and also uh, teams do have a limited amount of ships they can actually lock. So this means um, some teams do have to juggle a locking to make sure you have even your allies locked and ready to switch over and make sure you don't tackle or accidentally paint your friends. Um, but for the upcoming match now here, Murray, we're going to be seeing uh, Ramrod versus Turbo Feed. And I'm seeing an interesting ban here coming from Ramrod where they have banned the Rattlesnake. Uh, I think this might be one of the first pirate cruises beside the Vindicate. I'm not actually sure if the Vindicator got a ban, but what makes a rattlesnake so terrifying that they might be banning it? Hard to say, because we haven't really seen one yet. The rattlesnake as a ship, especially in EVE overall, is known as a ship that has a lot of damage and a lot of tank and not much else. That's what it's there for. And so... Well, those are two great attributes. What kind? Yes, but in an AT setting, it's often hard to build a comp around that because you usually need a little bit more of a stylistic plan or aim to win the game besides Gronk Smash because Gronk Smash often doesn't end up doing very well. Um, but speaking now about these Garista ships, uh, we're going to be having an interesting match. Finally, uh, what I think a lot of people will be waiting to see if it lives up to the hype. Uh, but we will be going to game 13 now, which is going to be Ram Rod Reloaded versus Turbo Feed or Glory. And we'll be heading to the arena with Murray and DTM. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Thunderdome. On blue side, we have the masters of this space and wormhole space, Turbo Feed and Glory. On red side, we have Ramrod reloaded. Reloaded. Who knows? I'm very excited for this match. Murray, how you feeling, man? What's going on? It's Gila's all the way down, baby. Nobody cares about that stuff, about extra points for extra ships. They're going to bring three Gilas each, a scimitar mirror, with the only difference being the choice of command ship at the top end and a little bit of a mix-up at the bottom end with one team going for the pocket sand kitsune and the other team going for application with the hyena. You know, it leaves me thinking of an age-old question. Is it in Rust we trust? Or... Is money the true king? We have about 15 seconds till this match starts. I'm so excited. Such an interesting mirror match. We're going to see pilot skill really come into play here. Three, two, one, and we're off, ladies and gentlemen. The match has started. Yeah, and it looks like we've got a move in 
from FED. Uh, the Sletnir is diving, as are the rest of them. The medium drones are coming out on both sides as they look to get those nimble and very damaging drones onto some targets and get the killing started. Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing the worm dive down just a little bit. Looks like he's trying to cut off the malice as he turns away from it. No, the hurricane still trying to dive in, looking to get webs or scrams on something. The worm trying to go back and grab a gila, maybe, or get back to those logistics frigates so that they can hold them down. Worm taking a little bit of damage right now. Meanwhile, Chris in the slip is starting to get punched. Yep, the medium drones are all on the slip near now. Meanwhile, the drones on the other side are taking shots at the Gila of Spite for Ramrod. The Sletner will most likely have an XLASB, so he'll have some extra tank beyond that buffer, but those Gila drones are doing a lot of damage, and he's dying significantly faster than Spite. He's gonna have to manage his charges. This is a skill that you need. You have to be able to micromanage your modules. There's the XLASP, but he's only going to have so many of those. So he has to start making decisions on where he wants to be when he actually finishes using those charges. Because I wouldn't want to be anywhere near these Gila drones. Yeah, and it looks like there's some big indecision on the side of Turbo Feed on what they want to shoot. They've got damage on three different targets, but they've the side of Ramrod, they've caught the Kitsune and it's gone. The Kitsune is gone. There's some jams no longer on grid. It's looking like Chris is still taking a lot of damage, a little bit of damage going on to Chris of Red Side as well in the Hyena. Those webs and points, uh, those webs and TPs actually do do a lot when we're talking about the application. Sometimes, depending on whether or not your ship is fast enough, those medium drones have to micro to catch back up to you, so they only get one shot off, so you want to make sure every single one counts. Um, Right now, we're seeing Spite actually get a lot of reps. These semis doing a particularly good job. Meanwhile, Taro is actually starting to take a bit of DPS now. Huge boom into him. It does look like he has yeah, the, the worm on top of him. The, the hyena grabbed him, and the worm came in for secondary. And a semi without speed is a semi that is dead, as we are seeing here. It is dropping. It has an XLASB. It won't matter, because it's going to get deleted by those Gila drones. Deleted before it can even get through all of its charges. Suddenly, Turbo Feed or Glory is in a lot of trouble right now. They just lost their rep ship. It looks like Tank Blast is actually doing a fantastic job staying out of the way. He's getting the reps from the Scimitar. And while Blue Side Turbo Feed is managing to stay a little bit ahead of the DPS curve, it's just taking time for those drones to get there. We're watching right now as Kaneko does end up taking a lot of damage by the time those drones get there. It really does hurt, and he's going to end up going down if he doesn't do something immediately. Yeah, Turbo Feed are desperately trying to catch this scimitar, and it looks like they may have a chance here as Tank Blast, his speed has dropped, but it looks like he's able to get his speed back up again, and he might be barely able to slide past the Sleipnir and get back to the rest of his team. Absolutely a critical moment of piloting there, staying just outside of scram range. Meanwhile, Jezza and the Malice is taking a little bit of damage, managing to keep their Simi alive even through a close call with the Slep. Hyena still taking damage, still not going down. Meanwhile, Jezza in the Malice it's going to end up going down because there's nothing to rep him. Yeah, eventually he'll die, but more importantly, the Gila of Drac is dropping. And with that ship down, there are only two DPS ships left for Turbo Feed against the full composition of Ramrod, who are able to just keep things going, keep their semi alive, keep their damage output, and are able to look to clean up this match. Absolutely. Finally, a little bit of more damage onto the slep. It looks like it slowed down just a little bit. Oh, absolutely wrong. It hasn't slowed down at all. He is making the, the statement I say every tournament, every match. Logi pilots are worth their weight in gold. He's come very, very close to getting caught multiple times, but it keeps coming out ahead. And we're seeing how Ramrod is absolutely dismantling Turbo Feed right now, one ship at a time. Yeah, and credit to the Hyena choice, right? That ship's ability to get them to tackle on the Scimitar, that ship's ability to hold down targets for those Gila drones, that ship is so impactful in this fight, and especially when it's, you know, comparison in the mirror matchup, they chose to bring the Kitsune instead. Those are the same amount of points. They could have brought either one. 
and that Kitsune against the Gilodrones just didn't have the utility they needed and it immediately got popped. And suddenly that hyena is the big difference maker in what is otherwise basically a complete mirror in terms of ships. Yes, I completely agree. They brought the jam ship and Ramrod looked at him and said, listen, the only kind of jams we like is Huckleberry jams. Get that thing out of here. Instantly blapping it off the grid. We see the slep goes down. Jezza all alone. One man abandoned by his friends against the whole world of pain. I'm hoping we get to see one more explosion here. It looks like the worm will have him held down, so he will die. No boundary for him. And Turbo Feed are going to find themselves knocked down. Hopefully their CSM candidate for wormholes can do a little bit better than their battlefield prowess, because it looks like they are going to get clean wiped here on the battlefield. GFs go out in local as the match wraps up, and we'll look to send it back over to the desk here. And we're back. Um, wonderful match there. We've actually seen the Gila's putting some uh, good action here on the grid. Um, Gosh, I was actually really excited here. Uh, but uh, we are joined here now by uh, Alec and Wingnut. Wingnut, you are actually part of the Ramrod team, is that correct? Absolutely. And we saw some wonderful piloting by that semi-pilot on your side, I believe, as well. Yeah, throughout all the scrims we've had, all the practices, and even that match there, Tank is a god-tier logi pilot. He does so damn well. Occasionally, of course, he gets caught, but he gets caught trying his damnedest to keep everyone alive. He was chasing the Gila who's being attacked and just constantly repping and staying perfectly in range. It's just, it was so beautiful. I, I love the bits. Tank, you're a legend, brother. Oh, man, but it, it was exciting. But uh, Alec, we're finally actually seeing Gila's. Do they live up to the threat they have been posing from what we've seen from the bands? Uh, they, they absolutely do. They've been one of the most formidable ships in the scrimming like, across multiple teams. Their ability to project damage at range, the amount of damage they do, their tankiness, even if they do get into trouble, and the projection onto cruiser and smaller targets, that combination, it's very difficult to deal with in this small ship format where there's you know, kind of a premium on damage and the low ends are extremely important. Uh, as we've seen, some of the higher end comps not doing consistently well. And that would kind of be the thing you'd want to, to maybe leverage against Gila's, but with them being banned out, it kind of opens up the meta a little bit. Um, but really, I think the hero of this match was that Worm Pilot. What a phenomenal job on tackle. Playing well, I, I the think back line. The, the, I almost want to say all the, the light ships on um, Ramrod's side were just seemed excellent to me. I had eyes on Chris Nahina. He was constantly just trying to get those Gila drones off of him. Um, but then again, both the Worm and Hyena were able to do such an excellent job themselves due to that wonderful logistics happening as well. Um, but now I think, uh, Wingnut, the commentators were alluding a bit to how a Slipner has to manage his shields. We saw it uh, getting some uh, damage there in the beginning, dipping low, but then getting these huge boosts. So if you're in a Slipner's position, you have um, pretty much a battleship-sized module for shield boosters, um, but not that much hit points, what are you actually looking to manage? What are the mistakes that can be going into that? Keeping your XLA speed too early is the main one. It's, you need to time it just right. And then also if you can get away so you can reload it, don't reload it the worst times. It's it's very much just playing around your XLA speed. Some of them are fitted differently, but that's the general standard fit. I don't, some of them also fit uh, adaptives, of course, as well to you know increase your resistance, but same situation, just manage your heat. Every single SKSB cycle is always overheated, so that's the most basic level thing that everyone knows to do, but you'd be amazed how many times people screw that up. It, it, it is surprising how often you forget to overheat the SKSB. Yeah, and it's just you need to be familiar with your ship, because you could be sitting at a half HP, do a heated thing, just like, oh, that's enough, and then overboost, and it's like, wow, I could have actually boosted when I was 20%. But then you could be sitting at 20%, take a big chunk from a battleship, and go pop. So a lot of skill that can go into it. Luckily, uh, versus Gila's, it's a lot more smooth DPS curve you're going to, and you're not seeing huge chunks at a big time, so uh, you get a lot more gap to play with well, there. Uh, like, there's one big chunk when they first get to you. And we see that a lot of people <laughs> are not quite ready for that drone blob to hit at once. It just 
wham, like 20 drones hit you, oh, sorry, ten, 5 drones, 10 drones hit you, and it's like being hit by a train, so you have to be careful for that, but beyond that, yeah, it's a very smooth DPS curve. And that's also something um, with uh, how you have the local modules, stuff like ADCs, and also how the pies are flying around there. Um, so, Alec, Alagi isn't just there by himself putting modules. What kind of communication is he actually looking to have with his team? Well, the, the key for the logistics in something like this is kind of anticipation. You need to anticipate what the enemy is going to do and make sure you're not where they want you to be and where your team is going to need you to be 10, 15, 20 seconds down the line. So uh, getting information like if uh, a certain target is getting blocked up or if drones have been switched from one target to another can allow that logistics pilot to get crucial seconds to reposition, pre-lock target, uh, maybe manage their overheat if they're expecting, like Wingnut said, that, that big train to be hitting one of their key ships, they can get that overheat in ahead of time and get an extra cycle out of that. Um, That's actually excellent points you raised there as well. Um, you know, just because uh, a dead giveaway with a drone comp is you're going to be seeing a bunch of yellow boxes of drones flying at you. And at that point, you need to communicate to your logic like, guys, I think I'm about to be primary. Also, normally paints are a good giveaway. If you're painted and webbed, there's a very good chance either some missile turrets or something's going to smack you in the face soon. And like you say as well, just preempting that strike coming in just so people can manage. There's likely, um, unfortunately, we don't really see it, but these teams are, uh, their comms, are, some teams might just be a chaotic mess. A lot of cross communication happening. People saying, I have this tackled, I'm being primary, I burnt this out, I'm moving here, I go to this MJD, we're shooting this, I have drones here, I got ECM on me. I need a smart. Well, I might need a new demanding capacitor. There's a lot of crosstalk happening, at least from my experience as well. But these teams do an absolutely fantastic job of filtering out and listening to what they need to hear. Um, so communication, unfortunately, we can't really show that to you guys, but a really lovely part of the AT and that what makes some of these teams stand out. Um, Wingnut, um, I'm just wondering now, uh, do you feel that the uh, missile bonus on Aguila is still worth it or... Is it absolutely. kind of just a wasted bonus? Okay. Absolutely. It's absolutely worth it in every single way. It's so much more extra DPS that you can apply to anything because it's, it's generally just rapid light. So just like an Orthrus, you can just shoot whatever the hell you want. Some people don't do it. Some people want to play like drone kite games that might fit the drone links in the uh, in the highs. But generally, you fit rapid lights. There's no reason not to. It gives well, you so the much one. The Gila, unfortunately, doesn't have a range bonus like most missile ship shows. So these do end up being rather close range rapids that you're dealing with, though. But very critically, it, it, it just brings that extra layer of defense against any enemy tackle coming in. Not only do you have your incredible drone power, but then you just layer rapid lights on top of that. It creates a very thick sphere of protection around your Gila and any other ships of yours that are within that envelope. Makes it extremely uh, dangerous and deadly for tackle to try to come in and pin down anything that has two or three Gilas surrounding it. Chances of survival are extremely low even if it has full Lodgy support. All it can take right. is one lucky drone hit, which drones can do. One wrecking shot, and you lose half your tank or more in just one shot. And the pressure from the rapid lights makes it even more likely. Well, we do actually have uh, Game 14 coming up, which is going to be Del Vitrix versus uh, Pergelo Capital Supremacy. And if I'm seeing this correctly... Once again, we're not seeing a Gila ban. For the feeders, we saw the Gila ban entirely for all the matches. Um, not sure if teams were just too scared of it or trying to hide their tactics, but um, maybe we're going to be seeing uh, some Gila supremacy again, but the teams are ready, so we will be heading to Game 14 in the arena with our commentating duo of Murray and DTM. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the arena once again. My name's DTM135, joined by a man who goes by many names, Murray. How's it going? Uh, not as good. I was kind of hoping we get something else neat, but apparently we get more Gilas. Yes, definitely double Gilas. I am seeing a Drake. I'm glad the FC brought uh, let them, you know, bring that to the fleet. Any words before, uh, any any thoughts or opinions, any predictions before the match starts here in about 10 seconds? Just a quick heads up for people watching. So red side's going to be a drone kite comp. They have a shield EOS with them. The other side's a little more missile focused with two DNIs. 
So we're going to see the blue team dip in. They're trying to get on top of that drone kite team. The drone kite is running away because that's what drone kite do. Mm -hmm. Lots of drones as they're dropping them. We're waiting to see where the drones go first, what their first primary is going to be. This is going to be a critical moment for the drone comp because it takes them a little bit more time to switch their DPS. Yes, missiles do have travel time, but drones have a, they're much slower than missiles at the end of the day. We are seeing a couple drakes cut in a little bit there, trying to get ahead of them as they turn. We are seeing the Merlin go down. It looks like they're going to be going for a Jackdaw first, potentially, as we're seeing Eva Eva in the Jackdaw take a lot of DPS. Already in half shield as she's grabbing reps. Yeah. Prop mod overheated though for sure and pulling back towards the Osprey. I want to make note the Osprey here is being very careful. Gila's don't have the best drone control range. So if this Osprey stays out of drone control range of those Gila's, that is its only hope of staying alive. Because as soon as that ball gets on top of it, it's dead. Now on the other side, they're looking to go for the smaller stuff first. They put some damage on the Merlin. The Merlin looks like it's going to drop. But they've also managed to get a bit of damage on the Simi. And taking down the Simi here is absolutely critical. Did I just see an armor rep on the Merlin? Or am I crazy? I might be crazy. That being said, some information we just got handed is that River Geist on the red team is a mainline FC pilot who has zero kills on their Z kill, but is in fact supposedly a very talented um, Logi pilot. I'm very excited to see what happens here. We actually are seeing the semi break out ahead of the group a little bit. Um, not managed to get tackled or anything. Nothing dying on either side. This is one of those moments where, okay, the first couple seconds of the fight, nothing's really happened, but what we're looking for next is to find the weak point in the enemy that we can start exploiting so we can pull a win out. We are seeing Lilu take a little bit of damage right now in the Jackdaw. Yeah, that Jackdaw needs to be very careful. It doesn't have a lot of buffer to work with. But the XLASB that's likely keeping up that scimitar, eventually it'll run out. And I think it has, because that semi is now dipping into armor. Yeah, the semi is about to go down. Boom goes the dynamite. We're looking right now as Azure potentially no longer having reps on him might spell the end of his existence on this grid as he is taking a little bit of damage. We see it go straight through armor and hull as he absolutely is getting eviscerated. We're seeing the power of missiles and how much quicker they can apply, how much quicker they can adapt. They don't have to wait for drones to travel um, yeah. as well as just the, I'm really surprised this Osprey is still alive in some regards, uh, being a little bit of a weaker rep ship, not a strong tank. It has been webbed. And they are actually starting to apply to it just now. Yeah, they realize with their semi down, they have to get the Logi trade or they have absolutely zero chance of winning this match. So they've just chosen to dive straight through the enemy team, go for that Osprey. The Osprey is not fast, so it can't really get away and it will go down. But the question is, is that too little too late? Because even if they get this Osprey down, if they're down one DPS ship with a Gila gone in return as Lord Jackson drops into low shields, then they're really going to struggle to actually win the ensuing DPS race. Absolutely, and we are seeing the Osprey go down into low armor right now. It's gonna be a DPS race, but the Gila does go down first, followed shortly by the Osprey. This was the situation you were literally just talking about. They're down a DPS ship. They still have to kill two Jackdaws, two Gilas, and two Drake Navy issues. It's just a, a, a really hard situation to find your way out of, and we're watching right now as Blue Team absolutely lays into Gila's applying really well and applying a lot of damage very quickly. Yeah, Verhola Capital Supremacy, they're looking to be in a pretty comfortable spot here as they take down the Gila of Elgin. Ololosha is taking some damage. He's at about half shields, but he's just not dying fast enough. And maybe if they were against a control comp, these drone ships could kite it out, use MJD beacons, and eventually win. But these missile ships have enough projection, and in the Gila versus Gila, it's all the same there right? These ships can't get far enough away in order to take advantage of their technically superior range with their drone control range, and eventually they're going to go down. A huge thing to mention here is the fact that because they're drone kite, they're all using micros, which is blooming their sig radius. So as long as those missiles can catch them, they're going to be applying a lot of DPS. Meanwhile, microing against drones means you can get out ahead of them. So maybe they get a volley on some of your small stuff, but then they pull away from the drones. Yeah, and this is one of those things where 
you need to have a good read on what people are bringing, right? The Gila is open in this match, and the Gila fits, as we've seen before, so well into these missile-based projection comps where the drones help out with the DPS. And a drone kite comp, this is one of its worst nightmares in terms of matchups. This is this thing that it wants to avoid more than almost anything else in the tournament. And so when you're coming into these matches, you need to set yourself up for success before you even hit the grid. And here it feels like goons just weren't prepared. They didn't have the right things and they weren't ready to go. It's just one of those situations. It comes down to how often are you practicing? How often are you, you know, out there flying, thinking about ships? How long are you spending theory crafting? You know, I, the some of these teams, and I don't know how much the goon team practices and they were comping out, but some of these teams that get really competitive literally comp for hours and hours, and they practice, you know, two, three, four times a week. And this might just be a situation where blood, sweat, and tears pulled them slightly ahead. Yep, and we see the EOS has jumped out of the arena. It doesn't want to waste anybody's time. There's GFs in local, and with that, we will send it back to the studio. And we're back with uh, Pajolo Capital Supremacy taking the victory over there. Um, so, uh, Alec... I think, okay, we saw when the commentary said we had more of a drone kiting setup here with the EOS and the Scimitar, um, and we did see the kiting happening, but what else was happening uh, during that kiting? What was Delve actually buying with that time? And I think you've joined the moderator club of muting your mic. Darn it, I'm infected too. <laughs> I was healthy when I got here. Um... It was very interesting. That Scimitar did its job. It, it bought a ton of time for his team, managed his tank as well as could be expected. But there's a ticking clock on that, because if you're using the Ancillary Shield Booster, which you basically have to do for the amount of DPS that it can rep and the fact that it's not using your capacitor, it really is the go-to choice for shield ships in that situation. But when it runs out of charges that's it. And if you have to keep using those charges, you're kind of stuck and you're never going to get far enough away from those drones to have an opportunity to reload. Critically, the Delve team did not bring any shield maintenance bots to help support that scimitar and buy him a little extra time not needing to pop those charges. And so in exchange, even if they had popped one or two damage ships on the enemy team, it just would have been a matter of time before that scimitar fell. But Wignut, I mean, why why does an Osprey live longer than a Scimitar then? Because they didn't shoot it. <laughs> At the very start, they had a good chance there. So they've got three Gealers and an Eos worth of drones. That Osprey would have lasted, what, maybe 20, 30 seconds? Even, even I mean, we, we saw when they eventually shot it, it just went poof. Exactly. So they spent so much time. I think the drones were chasing a Jackdaw, which, sure, I get it, but... You should have gone for the Osprey and just deleted that, and that way your DPS is so much more amplified. Because again, you've got three Gilas plus an Eos worth of damage. Even if you're drone kiting, that's the way you do it. And at that I mean, point, if they'd done that, they could have taken out the Jackdaws fast before their Gilas went down, or before their Scimitar went down, and then started chewing on one of the other Gilas. But they just, it, I don't know, they just took so long to finally admit that, yeah, we need to go kill the Osprey. It's the possible they the Osprey was out of range, but again, it's, it's a question of priority. You need to make that happen. Dive in a little bit, get your drones on target, then if you want to pull back, you I can. Mean, the Osprey if anything, is slow. At that point, I mean, you know that tension's happening on your scimitar. Your scimitar is buying at time for you. Go in, because worst that's going to happen is they're going to shoot a gila that gets closer. Oh no, now the semi is not getting shot. You know, that's, that's almost like a win-win. You can either get closer or you're not taking pressure off the semi. So, uh, but I think our commentator team uh, before, sorry, in our Discord was alluding to... Um, Alec, if you can maybe get comment on this, like where you die versus a drone comp and where the rest of your team is at that moment is actually a ready part of actually countering a drone comp. And that, can you maybe explain what they kind of mean by this? Sure. And, and I'll caveat that it's not a hard counter for anyone out there who's aspiring to be a tournament FC. Don't feel like this is the golden bullet to dealing with the Gila. But just like missiles, drones have a significant travel time before they arrive on their target. And unlike missiles, where it always starts at the point of your ship, they're going to start at the point of the target you were shooting at. 
So if the target you're shooting at is 50 kilometers over here and the target that you want to shoot at is 100 kilometers over there, it's going to be a long time after you call that target before the damage actually lands and you start to see the fruits of your labor there. In that intervening time, the enemy team can start getting some initiative back, perhaps. So one strategy is to spread your fleet out so that once you, one of the targets on your team dies, the drones have to go as long as possible a time to the next target before they actually start doing something useful. But the other end of that strategy is you have to make use of that gap. If you just sit there and let them go over there, then all you're doing is delaying the inevitable. It creates opportunities for counterplay rather than being the solution in itself. That's actually very well put there as well. Um, but now we're also talking about moving around, traveling, kiting. Uh, Wingnut, do you feel that EOS was actually uh, a valid addition to this kiting setup they were having? I feel like they kind of, kind of like meted themselves into a corner where we want a shield drone ship that gives me links. What does that give me? Uh, 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 and it's, there's nothing. You've got the only shield, like shield uh, command ships. Claymore and Nighthawk, as it's been suggested to me, but it's like they were trying to go for a drone comp. So we go, you have to bring the, you have to bring something, right? Or oh, bring in the EOS. I, I, I'm not the biggest fan, but it is kind of funny. I'm not gonna lie. Well, it's I got skirmish links, like right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like they might have meted themselves into a bit of a hole there. They were trying to chase this idea. To well, the very what end. would you have put it instead there then? I mean, me, I'd still bring the EOS because it's fucking funny, but... Um... <laughs> so, so you give them crap for it, but then it's like, oh, I'm, I'd bring it anyway. I mean, uh, Alec, I'd what, what, what would me, you have brought instead then, not. Alec? It'd probably be Nighthawk, to be honest. Alec? It'd have to be. Um, yeah, the Nighthawk would be my pick, or potentially... A little hard to say in the tournament format, but an artillery Slefner to maybe take a pot shot at some of the enemy low end and try to clear it quick could be something. She's very right really that. doing a coin flip as to whether or not you're going to have the um, extra alpha strike. There, I, I, it's I would just one ship. love to see. I'd love to, like. I I just love that feeling when people can track properly with turrets and actually alpha stuff because missile comps and drone comps kind of uh, let the pilots get easy off where they can just push F1 or F and just focus on their piloting. Where your turret comps really they have to focus on their transversal, the tracking, and make sure that you're not only hitting. But you're not getting uh, just scratching shots or so. You're actually getting proper, full-on hits, penetrating shots, the, the the big boy damage. And just watching Taris disappear is always the best. But we'll quickly touch on game 15 that is coming up. We're going to see uh, Vault B versus Paper Numbers. Um, so we're seeing, luckily, the Gila's banned again. So we're seeing some more diversity being applied here. Um, but I think here, Wingnut, if you're looking at here with me, um, we're seeing teams get scared of the curse once more. Why would that be? A well-flown curse is a terrifying opponent. Tracking disruption plus newts plus a good drone bay. If you've got a good pilot in it, it's probably one of the worst ships you could see. If you've got a less than good pilot in it, eh, whatever. So it's, well, what, what it, kind of skill it, actually comes into it? Because it's it's just e war. How much skill can come into e war, right? Picking your time and place for sure. Picking which e war you're bringing, who you're using it on, when you're using it on them. Obviously, controlling your drones as well, controlling your range at the same time. It's you're doing like four or five different things at once or more, and it's like everyone else is doing the same thing, but you've got a few more extra layers on it. So you have to think for yourself, kind of in the middle of a fight, which not many people can do. <laughs> as a curse uh, main, it's it's essentially you're running two different types of e war. Plus, you're kind of a damage ship, and you're also relatively fragile for as important as you are to your comp. So you, you kind of have to pilot almost like a logistic ship as well, in terms of, of positioning and, and monitoring your own safety. So there's a lot going on there. I, I've flown a curse on TQ. I've flown a curse in a tournament setting. It's extremely demanding in both. And the armor curse with light logistic support, which is what you have in the tournament settings like this, Oh man, you are you are living on the razor's edge, and you're just micromanaging. You have to be hyper focused. If you let that focus slip in either your newts or your tracking disruptors or your damage or your positioning or your logic calls, you are gonna be. I mean, you can go from safe to dead so fast in that ship. It's ridiculous. 
And it's not just about so, your end, it's also about what Sorry, Wingman, you we, we do actually have the teams ready here. So we will be seeing the Curse's little brother featuring here uh, with uh, game 15 of Vault B and versus Paper Numbers. And we'll be heading to the arena with Ithaca Hawk and Chair. Good afternoon, space friends. It is I, Ithaca Hawk, here for a nice relaxing match. Join me as I pull up a chair and we cast this match of Vault B versus Paper Numbers. Chair, take me through what Paper Numbers have brought. Uh, a Balgorn, a Neros, Oracle, Augur Navy, Draugr, a Blackbird, and a Sentinel. The little brother to the curse. It is the little brother to the curse, and Volt B bringing Lashak Drekovac, which is the little brother of the Lashak, the Yoniros, the Vexer, the Mauler, a Heretic, and a Kruer. The countdown is up in local, uh, and I mean, I'm excited to see what happens with this match. The teams have positioned themselves almost directly across from each other, no one choosing to warp in at zero, but the Volt B team coming in at 30, the closest. They're ready, probably, to apply some damage. I think I'm going to put my money right away. On the Lashak, I think the Balgorn's not going to be able to keep up in the DPS department. And I just see a, a better comp on the uh, Volt B side. Yeah, Link first go up as the match is underway and we see what happens with the team. So immediately, paper numbers, I can see them starting to burn forward and damage. Oh, onto Covert 1 in that crewer applied immediately. They want to get rid of the utility from that ship. It doesn't do the most DPS, but it has good webs and does do newts as well. But Repbot 9000, AK Reload, applying the reps, no problem whatsoever keeping his buddies alive. Yep, and now you just see the Volt B going in for... You know, they have to do their damage. They have to deal with this Blackbird that's probably jamming out most of everything. I don't know how well it's dealing with the Oneros, but I'm sure that the gems are on it. Yeah, you can see the damage that can be put out from an Og Navy, an Oracle. I presume that's a Gunval and the Draugr, because each of these ships uh, on the Volt B team is getting chunked into armor almost straight away, uh, causing Repbot 9000 to have to fly around and rep everybody. Mira Chief in that Mauler, zero guns though, so that is a full Newt Mauler bringing utility. He will be able to potentially get on top of that Aeneas of Park Bank and shut him down, or maybe the Augur Navy if he can't catch up with the Oneiros, who is currently 84 kilometers away uh, from the center of the arena. He's being chased off fully right now. I think he's trying to go control the Balgorn so he can The Volt B team has a way to move around the, the arena, but the Mauler's taking so much damage. and He's usually known as a very tanky cruiser. Yeah, but there's only so much you can do against the, the damage coming from an Oracle and Og Navy and a Balgorn. If they can get this Og Navy down, the reps coming in from uh, Reload in the Aeneas might be able to stabilize Mira. He is repping up a little bit now as the Og Navy is dropping a little bit faster, so it's going to be super close. A Mauler, as you say, very tanky ship, but is it going to be enough tank against the sheer DPS? I think it will, because there's definitely split DPS coming from paper numbers, as I'm seeing Control Freak and the Drekovac also take damage. A key issue with... Uh... Paper Numbers team right now is that most of their damage is EM Therm with the Oracle, Og Navy, and the Balgorn. So it's if on most armor ships, there's reactive. So after a certain point of time, if they tank, they're just going to tank forever because the resistance to EM Therm is so high. Yeah, it might have been a little bit of good piloting by uh, Reload and that nearest to save Mira, but he is now quite far away and he's got that Balgorn tackled down 60 kilometers from everything else uh, as the Augur Navy goes down. So this is good. Uh, right now for the Volt B team. Uh, Balgorn pretty much locked down. They haven't been able to remove that Mauler. So that Balgorn's not really going anywhere quickly now. And now they're going after the Blackbird, which has probably been a thorn in their side for a while. I, I like how the Oracle's piloting. It's being very smart, um, applying its damage from far away, and not trying to get in and brawl that Lashak. Yeah, I mean, that's the way to do it. The Oracle should basically be flown like a gigantic slicer. Just fly around, don't get tackled, and do DPS to things that you don't like. Um, unfortunately, if you do get tackled, that's pretty much game over for you. You know, GG, no re, head off home. Uh, Zhao and the Vex are taking a bit of damage. That's probably another utility ship. Uh, I imagine it's got a bunch of rip bots out, perhaps, and probably fit with uh, full newts as well in order to really just bring the utility to this Vault B team. Um yeah, the, I mean, they're just, they're not quite at cleanup stage, but once this black girl, Blackbird goes down and they stabilize Zhao and the Vexer, um, then it should be relatively uh, straightforward for them to finish off this match. But never say never, Park Bank, we saw him in the feeders, very good logistics pilot. I, if anyone can save uh, Captain Shinkin here, it would be Park Bank. I think the Lashak is starting to spool up to a point that the Neros can't do anything, and the Kur is starting to make a move towards 
the Anero, so that's making him hard for him to pilot too. Some multitasking really strained here. Yeah, and you can see the damage uh, from paper numbers being uh, swapped onto different uh, ships in the Volt B team as they try and find a weak spot. They try and catch out Retbot 9000 um, and find out if they can break someone. But the damage coming from this team, they've lost that Augur and Navy issue, which is obviously is a significant amount of DPS. It's really just that Oracle and the guns on the Balagorn left to do damage, and they're just not able to break these heavily tanked armor ships uh, in the Volt B side. The Redbot 9000, though, is taking a chunk of damage right now. He has got quite close. Um, he came in up probably to rip his buddies, uh, and now he has got uh, a Draugr almost on top of him. So that's not going to be good for him. Yep, and the Black uh, Bird from Paper Numbers is down. So that's a lot of their damage mitigation off the field, and you just see those Neros uh, of Park Mink being taken alive. Yeah, it could be an Aneros trade here um, if that Draugr of Jouthi stays alive long enough and the Sentinel is able to apply pressure to Redbot 9000. But you can see he's just about managing to hold on. Going to start bleeding Hull now. In fact, he might go down before Park Bank. Uh, if not, it's going to be super close between them. Um, I don't think this actually hurts Volt B as much as we think at this point because it's really, it is just that Balgar and the Draugr doing DPS and the Oracle, of course. So, I mean, that being said... That's a lot of DPS still on the field, and now Volt B doesn't have any reps, so could it could start to swing a little bit. There's no DPS coming from that Moller or that Vexer. Yeah, the the Drek and the Moshak, though, are a lot to chew through, and there's still rep bots on the field. Um, and I'm pretty sure the Balgorn is just being kept in one place by the Moller still. Yeah, and there you go. There's the Draugr down as well. So the DPS now is just the Oracle and the Balgorn with very little application help. Uh, and that Oracle just got chunked pretty quickly. Panny Gardet turned his evil eye onto that Oracle and turned on his disintegrator and starts to wave goodbye to the CEO's CEO in this instance. I, I, the Kur is such a cool little ship. You don't get to see it flowing enough, but I'm really happy you got the shine of it here. As yeah, it's a bit, of a, niche, a bit of a niche ship. It gets a bonus to web range and uh, to uh, Newton, Newton Nost Nost. amount, I think. Um, and obviously it gets a 100% bonus to the small turrets as well. So it's quite a powerful little ship, but usually not the most point efficient ship. Uh, in this case, we'll be choosing to bring basically as much newt pressure without bringing dedicated newt bonus ships almost as possible. Uh, the Sentinel now uh, about to go down as well. And then it is just uh, going to be the remains of Volt B uh, clapping this Balgorn after Reload fed his Oneros. It was a tactical feed. You know, he it was placed a him out of, out of position, baited him, outsmarted him. Yeah, plus if you don't lose at least one ship, then the kill mail doesn't look as good because then you don't have a good battle report. So uh, Reload helping his team out there to get a balanced battle report. Unfortunately, he forgot this was on Thunderdome, uh, so his sacrifice was for naught. Is there any um, NFTs for Anger Games? I don't believe there is, is there? Uh, there's a team. Um, I can't remember the full name, but their initials are NFT. That's about as close um, as we can get. Nano Fiber Tokens, I believe. There you go. So there is NFTs in the Anger Game, sponsored by Gamestorm Federation. Uh, <laughs> Balgorn uh, now slowly, slowly going down. Um, Balgorn's, of course, not known for being paper thin, unlike Oracle's. This could take a little bit of time. He's probably going to kill Ed Reynolds and the Heretic at this point. Ed trying to burn away uh, and, and live to win, frantically trying to burn away from this Balgorn. Maybe turn sideways a bit and yeah, get the transversal up there, Ed. It's generally not recommended when you're trying to dodge as he goes down. Poor old Ed. There you go. So uh, Ralph Ralph Eisen gets another kill on his Balgorn. Um, I think oh, the Lashak, the Direct, and the three Newt ships probably are enough to finish him off pretty quickly. Oh, the Kerr is still just keeping his uh, distance from the Balgorn, which is probably smart if you don't want to die. Um, bonus uh, long uh, webs, you know, do not spell well for frigates. Yeah, and then with that, there we are. Paper numbers dropping this one as Volt B take the dub, going 1-0 and uh, in the Anger Games here today. And we'll hand it back to the desk, and I'm sure they'll have some interesting things to say about that. And welcome back to the most interesting comments in the world. Uh, but um, I'm joined here now by Mazir and Wingnut. Um, so... 
Wingnut, <laughs> interesting pick there with Maller. Um, we still were kind of just uh, not sure if it was a bait. We're going to say it was a bait, just give them the credit here. Um, but I think that Maller was actually doing quite a bit of work. What, what did we see it doing during the match there? It was a super hard tank mauler. I think it had at least one or two nosses as well as a full rack of the rest of the nukes and just max tank, which is what the mauler does one of the best for its size. And it is one of the best tackle ship once you get a target held down, at least for its cost, because armor resistance bonus plus uh, what is it, three nukes, two nosses, you'd probably say, at a guesstimate. And yeah, he was perma holding that Balgorn pretty much the entire time. The Balgorn couldn't even nude him off. You've got a nuding ship you can't nude you off, plus the Sentinel was trying to, and still couldn't nude him off. That I've been there before. That is one of the most painful feelings. Like, just let go of the scram! But we are well played there with the use of that Mallory. Taking a, a smaller uh, smaller ship, less cost to just negate that bigger, more fancy boy. Uh, Mazero, uh, overall, your thoughts for this match? Uh, any topics you'd like to touch on? I think, like, the biggest brain move uh, Walter did here was that they took all their best pilots and put them on the B team so they could... Uh, like trick everyone into focusing on their A team and then the B team going to sweep through the brackets and claim the prize. So that's like a bigger move uh, for the, the Volta Alliance uh, to, to do something big like this. Uh, so GG. And secondly, it's like a, we were seeing two control setups uh, get up against each other. And I personally love control setups and they're doing a really good job on the Volt B team where absolutely stellar at uh, executing it. Like that Mauler is sitting on the bargain for the entire match. And once that, uh, I believe it was the Organ Navy, once that went down, the Vault B uh, core ships just went around the bargain. They didn't care about that uh, big, expensive pirate battleship. They just went in and then murdered the back line. Like we did see the uh, Onivas of uh, Rilo to get a little bit too close on the uh, draw of, uh, the, of the other team trying to get in and... Uh, Actually, did manage to to get a frag on him, uh, despite the crew were trying to peel him off. So there's actually some really good piloting for both sides. But in the end, the uh, the Vault B team just sucked a little bit more uh, capacitor, and then took the victory. Uh, well put there on those points to raise as well. Um, but speaking now about the Belgorn that we've been touching on, that's being cancelled out here and stuff, uh, Wingnut. Um, what are teams actually looking to fit on these? Because we've seen get-ins before. We've seen get-ins of missile systems. We've seen full new get-ins. We saw a gun bell now. It, was that the most efficient use of a Balgorn and its high slots? Balgorn's well, more well-known for being the old uh, uh, flagships for the old uh, tournaments. They're pretty good for having, well, when they're blinged, great control, as well as a pretty good amount of DPS for their size. The problem is we're in 7v7 here. The damage you're getting out of it is not really worth it. And for the price you're paying for the Bal, you could just get a Geddon and do 90% of the work. So it's... They, they, their days in the sun are kind of a bit behind them now because they're a great control ship, but they're so expensive, it just tends not to be worth it because you don't get anything but control and nothing else. That's true. Um, but Mazir, I'm not too sure how you feel about the, the whole Geddon versus Bal versus the high slots guns. Uh, it's a complicated thing. I like, guess... Uh... The Gedon has the range bonus on the newt, so it can deny a much bigger area. So it's more about area denial and uh, effective against cruisers and smaller stuff. In the meantime, the Bargon got the newt power, so it's much more capable of newting out the battle shift and stuff. But as we're seeing here, the lack of range can hurt it a lot. You can't fit those uh, shiny uh, dead space neutralizers on it, so it got short range on the neutralizers. And if it's screened, then it can't really do much about it. Oh, that's also like well put there. Some real intricacies coming in how these uh, teams decide to fit up their ships. So it's not only what the ships are choosing to put on their team, but actually the modules, the individual little things that add up to those little victories. Uh, but we do have the teams here in the arena now. Uh, for game 16, we're going to be seeing Stay Frosty versus Nowhere Dot. And we will actually be heading to the arena as they sort out their final moments with Ithaca and Chair. How's it going, everyone? Uh, this is Chair, and I'm joined by the lovely Ithaca Hawk. Um, this is our last match of the day, and I'm excited to see what's going on. We have a very, very spicy comps on both sides, so it should be a good little slugfest. Um, could you tell me, Ithaca, what uh, Noir has brought? 
So Noir um, have gone for what looks like maybe three rapid heavy missile ships here. Praxis, Typhoon, Armageddon, uh, along with Navy Augur, Magus, and two Inquisitors. So on the Frigate Lodge, stacking up on the battleships and the Navy Augur for DPS. They are going for the dunk. And then we got an almost all triangle comp with some complementary deacons on the other side as they go straight for the Lashak. Yeah, I mean, the DPS choice. coming from this comp is going to be heavily front-loaded. If they can just burst through this Lashak, heat your DPS, get right on top of him, smash him in the face until he explodes, then that could be GG for this match. But they are going to feed their Magus incredibly quickly uh, in this reps land, which they're starting to do now. Uh, that Lashak, though, is, he's hurting, but he's not hurting very quickly. With two Deacons on the field, they're going to hit a point where this Lashak starts tanking, honestly. They should have gone for smaller stuff, in my opinion. Maybe they break yeah. the little shack, but I don't think they do. I don't think they do before they hit reload, and as soon as they hit reload, that's it. Um, the, the the deacons will just be able to rip him up while they wait. Meanwhile, they've of course brought um three battleships, so they've had to downgrade from deacons to inquisitors, the tech one equivalent. Uh, so they don't have anywhere as much rep power. That being said, that Lashak is very low. I I think the heat has probably been turned off on the deacons and the Lashak's local tank. If they can finish him off, though, this could be massive. They might. Very, very close. If they spread their missile damage enough, it will stop the reactive from being able to tank most of it. And it, the Lashak might go down. They probably oh, have like so two close. or three more missiles. They must be really at the end of their um, their clips, though. If they hit reload before this thing dies, then he's going to start repping back up. He is still dropping, though. He is into under a third structure. Can they finish him off? It's 20% structure. Oh, my God, it's going to be so close. They have to have every bit of heat on this right now. The Deacons have to be putting every bit of heat on this right now to save this Lashak. You save this Lashak, you probably win. They don't do it. The Lashak is down. Now they have a... But the battleships have probably clipped now, so if the team of... I've forgotten their name. I am awful. It's Frosty and Noir, and uh, that is a big loss for the Frosty team right now. The three DPS ships, the Praxis, the Typhoon, the Armageddon, probably now reloading those clips. You won't see much DPS being applied. The Og Navy will still do some work, but you will see what looks all, like almost nothing for about 20 seconds until they all start applying again on something. Um, and yeah, losing that Lashak, big, big blow for the State Frosty team right now. I, I feel like the State Frosty should have gone for just killing the Inquisitors as fast as they could and just yeah, you're going to lose the shack, but you can just kite around the battleships as much as you really want, honestly. And they spent so much time on the Augur Navy that's now just in being wrapped up in armor. You know, yeah, I wonder if that the shack had heated uh, his tank from the start or not. I, f I think if he had heated it from the start, maybe that few extra cycles it would have taken, maybe would have saved him because it sounds like um, the Geddon wasn't even shooting at the end. He'd run out of his clip and it was just drones coming from the Geddon. So those battleships were right on the ends of their clips. It literally was like one bit missile volley more and if he tanked that they maybe would have won this match the og navy uh right now on noir has been sort of bleeding into armor for a while now he's got a single inquisitor to try and keep him alive uh, but the dps has really kind of dropped off from the stay frosty team with the loss of that lashak uh, that being said that bed mac kind of ripping up a bit right now i mean they're definitely they have the edge on the lodge it's just the overwhelming dps now from noir with a basic uh a kingslayer comp with a very weird addition of the Armageddon, uh, Armageddon. It has bonuses towards drones, not missiles, but it has missile hardpoints. So it's a very odd choice to bring. Yeah, I think they just didn't want to suffer the uh, plus one point penalty, so they could bring um, basically what they've brought here in terms of the support ships, the two Inquisitors, the Magus, and the Navy Augur. If they'd brought, say, two Typhoons, then it would have been extra points in order to do that. Uh, they, it looks like they're going to lose their Augur and Navy now, but they still have those three big, chunky battleships to apply DPS. However, it is only 35 points to 21. All they've managed to kill thus far is the Lashak. They're probably going to be able to finish off this Vedmac, but they've been really taking their time with it, and now they're starting to take some damage on the Praxis. And the, the battleships will never be able to kill the two Deacons if they're piloted correctly. Um, yeah, exactly. They just apply. They're pin them in more than likely, and it's just not going to happen. So I, an... I think Noir might be starting to get a little bit concerned. Uh, that Deacon of Verdus, though, uh, needs to make sure he does not die. He needs to get his... Uh, well, Transversal makes no difference against Rapid uh, Heavy Speed. If he's got an AB, he needs to just be motoring around, trying to mitigate as much damage as possible. Uh, and his Deacon buddy needs to keep as much reps on him as possible. Um, 
I don't know. I, I think Noir might be a little bit concerned now. They're struggling to apply. They can't. They haven't killed this Vedmac. They can't kill this Deacon. They are losing their own Inquisitor, which means they're going to lose any ability to regenerate any of their armor. And there's still five minutes to go, and two Vedmax put out a lot of DPS, as does a Draugr and an Ergol. Virtus is fully tackled, by the way, and he's not moving, so he's tanking under all of that. Which yeah, is amazing is... in itself. Oh, I don't know. This is starting to go back towards Stay Frosty right now. They're pulling this out of the bag. They lost their Lashak relatively early on, but look where they are now. Deacon down. That is not good for, the, for Stay Frosty. They have now got one single Deacon left. Again, against three battleships. He should be able to stay alive if he plays it smart. They need to kill off one of these battleships really quickly. Oh, the Draugr's going down. They can just piece through everything now. Like, they... Virtus being tackled was just a nail in the coffin for it. Yeah, now that's the gonna problem. Part everything. That is the problem with those logistics frigates. You have to get super close to things to be able to rep them. Your range is very, very limited. And, of course, when you move in to do that, you put yourself in tackle range. I imagine things like the Praxis... And the Geddon probably had grapplers on them, so they were able to really slow it down. Um, they are chewing through Link on now, who's probably similarly tackled. And uh, without a rep buddy to keep them alive, he is going to die as well. And I think it was close. They started to come back. There was some really good piloting from the Stay Frosty guys, but it's just losing that Lashak meant that they just couldn't kill off things fast enough. Very, very cool match. I was very surprised that the Lashak died at the beginning. And there's still a chance that this Praxis dies. With the, you know the three spool ships, they do spool up quite a bit of damage, but the Vedmax it's just taking so much damage, and it has no way to mitigate any of it, and no reps. Yeah, if they kept those uh, two logistics frigates alive, then I think in this situation right now, plus two deacons, then they win. Obviously, losing them is not so good. Uh, they, 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 you're right, the practice will die, um, but I don't think they can burn through the typhoon and the Ged, and, and there's just so much points in that that even if um, they kill one of them, they have to kill another to to win on points. And just to double check, I did make sure that is a missile Armageddon. It does have some newts, I believe, or some smart bombs, but it does have missiles on the side of it. Yeah. Oh, man, if that... Oh, I just can't get over how close that Lashak was to not dying. I genuinely think there might have been a clip in that, at, at best, that, uh, that went either way. It was so close. And that was the, the key moment in that match there. Uh, the Nurgle now of Lafax is getting uh, chunked on as well. Probably Praxis is going to die. Um, he might take the Nurgle down with him. And then Rix Javix, the uh, CEO of Stay Frosty and the Band Apart, is left to try and uh, show us all how good his solo PvP skills are as he tries to take on three battleships in a single Icky Tursa. One Icky Tursa versus the world. Oh, the Praxis is down. Now he has just a Typhoon and Armageddon to chew through. That's, you know, no small task. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that Geddon, as you say, uh, does have those utility newts. Uh, he is applying them to that Icky So The Icky obviously has the assault damage control, so he can push a button and then sort of decline to die for 20 seconds. But once that's done, um, he has to obviously reload that, and that takes time. Time Rex Javix does not unfortunately have as he goes down and Noir take that 100 to 50 in what was actually way closer than that scoreline makes it out to be. That was a really exciting match. Oh, what uh, a great match to end the day on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's uh, Speaking of ending the day, let's throw it back to Zoo in the studio and uh, let's see what they have to say. And we're back. Such an exciting match there, as uh, the commentator pair of Ithka and Chair uh, definitely said there. Um, it felt so tight there, uh, Wing, that like I was busy watching the Armageddon, and that the Shack was in structure with a tiny bit of armor still getting back there. And I, I saw the Geddon stop shooting. I'm like, is this it? Is it going to live? And then I'm not too sure whether it was the drones or clips coming out from somewhere else, but they just managed to push it over the edge. Um, how did you feel? Are you, were you excited to see the triple battleship show up again? That's I've been I was talking about it earlier with the guys and triple battleship is the one I want to see, especially if you go they bring the Geddon. I have been talking about it before. I love the Geddon. Come on, but I think it was a mix of like the drones and maybe like one or two volleys left from the Typhoon, the Praxis. I didn't see that, but it was very very likely. But it, they I think they had just enough, just enough to get it to the point where it, they couldn't bring it back in time. I think I those believe... heavy drones coming through, doing their work there, totally committing to that damage. And a quick mention as well is they went full on DPS drones. They, they brought maybe one set of light rep drones. Everything was DPS there. 
they, they might have had some in the bays, but they brought full DPS for that situation, which is perfect. Cool. We've got the Good DPS in mind. End it. So, Mazer, I, I think you had some comments before that I saw in the chat just about how the, the Giren was actually helping, um, uh, you know, put Frosty down there. And I think maybe that game of attrition that the Geren plays long overall, also kind of working with his reloads, where it kind of softens up a target for the next time you're ready with that clip. Um, so w what other comments do you have on the key points during that match? I mean, first of all, I want to mention that it's like, like massive balls to actually try and uh, Kingslay uh, Leshek. Uh, I, when this went for it, I was like shaking my head and thinking, oh, no, this is not going to succeed. And it did succeed. And as Wing not mentioned the drones, I think the drones were what did the final uh, difference because both the Praxis and the Gedan has a drone damage bonus. And Typhoon has a large drone bay on top of that. But as the match started to drag on and they were struggling to break these deacons, the, the heavy nudes on these ships were starting to pay off. Uh, like both the, the, the Praxis and the Typhoon have one uh, utility high slot and the uh, Gedan has two, even if it feel a uh, full rank of uh, rapid heavies. So these uh, the heavy neutralizers, even though there's only four of them in total, they're starting to cap out these ball ships and they're starting to struggle to, to really do things and have the cap they need. So that was what allowed them to break the first Deacon and uh, like they take this match home because as we are seeing, like we saw the Frosty team trying slowly to claw back, but once they lost the Deacon, it was a uh, game over for them. Actually, uh, Mazir again here. Now, speaking about the Deacons, um, we've seen the teams previously kind of shake it up where they're taking uh, Deacon, um, Thalia, or Inquisitor Navitas. But this time, both teams elected to go for uh, the double on their logistics frigates. Um, do you think there's a reason they would go with that, spending more points? I mean, the MR ones have uh, more low stats, so generally more tanky, and they can uh, like spec tank uh, the um, ECM. But aside from that, uh, no, there's not really that much of a reason. And uh, if you're like, really short on points, you should consider like, uh, taking uh, one of each. Can't really remember the exact math of it, uh, but uh, it's it's a good way to just free up uh, like, uh, one or two points that could have been used for something else. Like if they could upgrade the uh, Typhoon to uh, a Typhoon Navy issue, it would be much stronger with the uh, rapid uh, heavy missiles and it would have an extra a high slot, so I, I don't think it would be enough points in this situation, but something they could uh, consider. So actually speaking now about the choices that they had in the battleships here, Wingnut, um, just before we're closing off here for the day, I think this is the first time we've seen the Praxis, and well, it is a special edition ship, which is banned. It is not actually part of the list which forms up our specific ban list. So teams are allowed to feel the special edition ship. Um, what bonuses does a Praxis actually bring? Uh, in short, everything. It has a bit of everything to it. It's very much a ship that you can bend it to your will. If you... <coughs> Oops, sorry. If you've flown a Gnosis, same idea. You can fit whatever you want with it. The one thing they get, as far as I'm aware, that's the best, is they get a cavernous uh, cargo bay. Like, truly absurd size cargo bays for their size. And I believe they're also like one of the best slot layouts as well. So you can make it however you want. So they're, yeah. yeah. They're just everything. They're everything. Generally, but but I think most of the times we do see them uh, filling missiles. <laughs> um, okay, but um, Mazir, do you have any like closing thoughts for the day? Maybe any favorite matches that you like to see? Uh, it's a really big question. Okay, there's been a lot of really good matches. I actually think uh, the Vault B uh, match was a really good match because they were showcasing uh, great piloting in their uh, control setups. And I love the uh, control setups, uh, so that might actually be the one that uh, I, uh, my favorite of the matches. Uh, but there's been a lot of good matches uh, and some upsets as well. Uh, I don't think we expected the uh, the Volta A team to go into the uh, lower bracket. Uh, for myself, it was actually I enjoyed watching some of the Gila matchups. Actually, able to see the Gila, and I think the particular one that I liked was the Ramrod versus Turbo Feed match. Uh, we've seen some really good skill being featured there. Target application, free pilots doing their best that they could do. Um, Logi showing the best uh, as well. Such a great exhibit of just uh, good piloting skill and just how formidable the Gila can be. So, uh, Wingnut, it is your team, but what is your favorite match, maybe? Last match, because as the egotist that I am, I like being proven right. And I was saying Triple Battleship has a very good potential if you bring the right battleships. They did. And they didn't do it the way I would have done it. They did it better. So 
I, I'm very, very proud of it. I'm very happy to see. But also, yes, go Ramrod. You guys are sexy. And I'm also just being informed there that, uh, unfortunately, while the Praxis was the target that they decided to go for, it did end up having three plates on it. So it ended up being a big, chunky boy there. Uh, but we will be wrapping up for the day. Just for uh, aware of prizes, um, the teams that have won game so far um, should be... Uh, so far be awarded seven skins obviously the prize will come later but throughout the tournament any win that the teams get will be seeing them get more skins as they go along so even those that have gone to the loser brackets now being able to have more matches does mean the potential for more skins um but before we close up today we just very much like to say uh thank the ccp crew for all their effort uh we are also here on the main ccp channel and obviously this is their game this is their server uh so thanks to ccp zealous uh everyone else in the background that's uh, being part of the tournament team um putting out the channel for us putting out the dev blocks we thank the support that we get and we hope to uh, see all that support carry through later on throughout these weekends that'll be coming up um and also all our moderators on twitch that are being helping us maintain uh the channel isds as well um, but with that, we will be closing for the day. We will be raiding uh, one of the other fellow community members, so please feel to stay around as we support our community. And catch us here tomorrow again, same time, for some more Anger Games.